My friend Monica has been babysitting for this family for the past two years. She has been taking care of these two girls, both at the age of two. Nothing out of the ordinary has happened in the past, but recently there have been some strange events taking place. One normal day, Monica was just doing her thing, putting the babies to sleep in their own separate rooms, all cribbed up for nap time. After making sure that the girls were asleep, she left the room at about 1.30. A couple of hours later, at 3 in the afternoon, she went to check on the girls. What she found in one of the girls' rooms was very unsettling. The room was a mess. Ripped up diapers and napkins were strewn everywhere. The kiddo was fast asleep as if nothing had ever happened. Above one of the shelves in the room, across from the girl's crib, hung a cross in a sealed box that the family had gotten from the Vatican. They were very specific in telling her to never open the box or touch the crucifix. She immediately noticed that the box was open and the crucifix was on the floor. Mind you, the crucifix had been hung three meters off the ground, much too high for the baby to reach. She also found some angel deck cards on the ground, each attributed to a different saint or angel. She quickly woke up the child and made sure she was all right and unharmed. Then comes the strangest part of the story. After waking her up, she took her into the other room for playtime. Then, playing pretend restaurant, the little girl approached Monica, holding a piece of paper in her hand, which Monica assumed was the pretend menu for the restaurant. But when Monica took it out of her hand, she noticed that it was a pamphlet to do with the Wiccan religion and basic instructions for how to practice witchcraft. Monica, now obviously on edge, asked the little girl where she'd gotten it from. The girl pointed toward a book laid open on one of the stairs, which was unusual because she knows not to play with the books from the bookshelf and is normally very well behaved. The book was Wicca, A Guide for the Solitary Practitioner by Scott Cunningham. Ever since then, Monica has been a little on edge, and she said that she's been having very strange and abnormal dreams. Some other important information to note is that the family is Catholic, and they live across the street from Eastern State Penitentiary, an old suspected haunted former prison that closed in 1971. If you have any ideas, speculations, or know anything that has to do with Wicca or the book mentioned, Please let me know. Monica wants to know the best ways to keep herself and the baby safe from whatever energy is in the house, because regardless of anything else, she feels that they are definitely not friendly. In the home that I live in, there are multiple floors. And when I sleep in my normal bedroom, beneath the floor under the attic, I don't care if my door is open or closed, but I hate when I have to go to sleep with the door to the staircase up to the next floor open. I just don't want it that way. It feels wrong. There's also a bedroom where the floorboards creak every night. I'm always first with going to sleep, so there's plenty of light and relatives passing by. What kind of feels like a safe haven? Well, one time I was renovating my room, and I had to sleep on the floor beneath the attic. Basically, the stairs go up to a large room, from where every other room can be accessed. You always need to go through this room to get to it. This room is also the entrance to the attic. I never liked leaving a lit room after dark, when I'm on my own. I even heavily dislike entering the house when nobody's on the ground floor. Luckily, you can just activate a time switch on the staircase that switches off the light located there, 10 minutes, and use this light to get to the room where I had to sleep in. I would activate the light switch there and close the door. So I was in there, and when I wanted to go to sleep, I would leave the door open a bit. I have a cat, and he often comes in at night to sleep on my bed. That's the reason that the door to the staircase has to stay open. I opened the door, switched off the light, 
put the cover in front of my window, which my mom told me to do, and went to sleep. The room was pitch black with that cover on. I'm lying in bed, just like normal, and suddenly I felt terrified. There was no real reason for it. I was just thinking about some random stuff that didn't scare me at all. And then I just froze like I couldn't move anymore. And that's when I heard breathing. At the same rhythm of mine, but coming from a corner. I held my breath, but the other breathing continued. I jumped up and felt my way to the door with my eyes closed. I switched the light on and closed the door. And I just sat there. Asking for another bedroom wasn't an option, so after about a half an hour, I decided to try again with the door closed, while repeating in my head that it was just the wind. I didn't hear the breathing sound again, though the wind sounded very similar. At the third night, I forgot the covers, and the window started creaking, like something heavy was on the wood around it. Eventually it stopped and I could sleep like usual but I had a really bad feeling every time that I turned those switches off and hurried to bed, and I would take any other bedroom as long as it wasn't on that floor. It's like the closer I sleep to the attic, the worse I feel. This is a story that happened to me years ago that I have never really talked much about. I thought it might be interesting to tell, though. When I was a teenager, I made money by babysitting. On this particular night, I was working at a house a few minutes away from my home, so I had been able to work later than usual. The family had two little girls that I was watching, around four and seven years old. To give a bit of background on what the home looked like, the house had two floors and two staircases that led to the upstairs. One set was off the kitchen, and the other was in the foyer. This home had an alarm system that would beep three times when any door was opened, although it was not the type that would say which door. I was sitting in the kitchen at around 11 p.m. and just coloring to pass the time at the kids' table. The parents had said that they would be home between 11.30 and 12. I was starting to get antsy to go home. It was nearing midnight when I heard the alarm for the door, and I got up, expecting to see the parents coming in. When they didn't, I just went back to what I was doing. About 15 minutes later, it went off again. This time, I felt a little creeped out, so I went around checking all the doors which I found to be shut tight and locked. I had sat back down, figuring that there must be some kind of glitch with the system. Within about a minute, the door alarm went off twice, as if two doors had been opened in quick succession. And as I stood up, I heard a little girl screaming bloody murder. I raced up the stairs into the girl's shared room and found them both sleeping soundly. I checked all the nooks and crannies of their room, and I remember feeling that the only thing that seemed different was that the book that I had read them was on the floor instead of in the bookshelf. I ended up checking the stairs and the other rooms, as I felt pretty unsure of the girl's safety, but I found nothing, and all the doors were still locked. I ended up sitting back down in the kitchen, feeling stupid, and not long after, the alarm beeped once, really loudly, which I had not heard before, and the panel did not seem to give an explanation for that. After that, everything stopped, and the parents came home not long after. I managed to convince myself at the time that I had just imagined things, but after all this time, I can still remember the fearful scream really clearly. Nothing too exciting, I guess. Just something that I have never been able to forget.
My family owns a large piece of land in Missouri. It's near the highlands, but partially on the plains. It includes a lovely little chapel, a one-room schoolhouse, stables, and the plantation home. My family has owned the land for years. I grew up spending school breaks there. It was always enjoyable, regardless of the hard work I had to put in. Every Halloween, my family would do a local hayride and barbecue. It was great fun and everyone loved it. We decorated the entire property. The schoolhouse had all the original desks and materials left in it. So we tried to utilize it the most and the plantation home secondly. It wasn't super structurally sound, so we kept everybody on the first floor. Only family was allowed on the upper floors. Us cousins loved to set up and clean for the big night. The stables were a working area, so we left that to the adults. Nobody went inside the chapel because we wanted to make sure that it stayed in its original good condition. So we'd put up a fake little graveyard and that was about it. The school was abandoned and the house was a walkthrough. When I was 16, I was helping set up the walkthrough. It was cheesy, but fun. I was cleaning the ornate mirrors on the first floor when I heard laughter above me. Figuring it was my cousins, I kept working. I would hear the footsteps of them moving and their laughter for a while. When I got done, I called up that I was going to go help outside and I heard, all right, see you later, and more laughter. I walked out smiling because I found it cute that they were so immersed in the home. Imagine my confusion then, when I walked into all four cousins at the main house. I asked them how they had beaten me back, and they looked at me like I'd finally lost it. They told me that they'd been working on the chapel graveyard, and they'd been nowhere near the walkthrough. I told them it wasn't nice to try to trick me. We left it at that and continued on for the day. I only realized we weren't alone when I got a call from my youngest cousin asking why I was running around upstairs in the plantation home. I got deathly quiet. When she asked me again, I could only say, I'm not even on the property. I'm in town. To this day, we've never figured out who exactly lives upstairs. They don't cause harm, but they do enjoy their mischief. Anymore, we keep in constant contact when we're visiting, just to be sure we know who we're dealing with. Or what. I'm a 30-year-old man, blonde, blue-eyed, and a work ethic like boxer from Animal Farm. I work at a BJ's wholesale club from 8 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon, pushing carts, filling propane tanks, and helping out where they need me. In the mornings, I usually walk around the parking lot while listening to a queue of music and podcasts that I line up for myself the day before, all of it going in through one earbud while I have the other ear open paying attention to my surroundings. Also, I'm not really prone to unusual or paranormal happenings in my life, so needless to say, the following event really caught me by surprise. To set the stage, it was between 8 and 9 in the morning. The sun was out, and I'd already gotten the propane filling station set for the day and I pushed all the shopping carts left in the parking lot and stalls overnight back to where they needed to be near the store entrance. I'm about to do what I call my morning perimeter walk. This walk involves walking the outer edge of the parking lot and behind the store to make sure that nothing is out of place and that nobody has taken it upon themselves to tag the back of the store, leaving me to photograph it and show the store management at the most opportune moment. I've just started my perimeter walk, and I'm just about into an episode of the Rooster Teeth podcast, always open on Spotify. I'm minding my own business, tunnel visioning out, and suddenly I hear a woman's voice humming in my left ear. Thinking back, 
It reminded me a little bit of the lullaby hummed by the Huntress in the game Dead by Daylight. This snapped me out of my routine. I paused the podcast, and I took the earbud out of my right ear. I listened carefully to get an idea of where the humming was coming from for about a minute and a half, but it had completely stopped. All I heard was the usual background noise. It was too close for it to be any car audio from a car pulling out from behind me. I would have heard the engine and the sound of the tires against the pavement and veered out of the way for them to pass. I want to make it clear that nobody is walking around the parking lot aside from me. Everyone else is either filling up at the gas station or in the store. There's a manager who comes out and sits in their truck at the end of the parking lot where this happened, but he wasn't anywhere to be seen when this took place. After coming to grips with the fact that I'm nearing my two-year anniversary working at this store and that there's no way it was anything that wanted to hurt me, I just shrugged it off and continued onward to tackle the rest of the day. I had never had an auditory experience like that before in the nearly two years that I've worked there, and I didn't experience anything like that for the rest of that weekend. I don't know if anybody else has had an experience like that, but if you have, let me know. I'd honestly like to share in the experience. I live in England in a two-story flat. I've always believed in the paranormal, but my dad doesn't believe in any type of ghost or anything paranormal. I never thought that this flat was haunted originally. However, as I got older, I started to feel uncomfortable by myself. I started to see shadows downstairs out of the corner of my eye. Now, there's an attic directly above our second floor but there's no way for us to enter it, as you don't have any access from this flat. The only way to access this attic is by having a specific key that can open the attic. It's Council Flats, which is above all my neighbor's house. However, the attic above my flat is the only one which is blocked off, and there's no way to enter it. I have the last flat on the end of these 18 council flats. There are no neighbors above us, just the attic, which no one can access without that key, and they would still not be able to get above our flat. One night, about two years ago, all of the family was in bed, and it was about three o'clock in the morning. All of a sudden, I heard something crash above me. It was so loud that it woke up the entire family, and we all got up and just stood on the landing together. After that bang, we heard three loud footsteps and the sound of something being dragged behind those footsteps. It was so scary, especially knowing that nobody could physically be up there. It's physically impossible. My dad was not convinced that it was a ghost. He thought that somebody, somehow, had gotten up into the attic, so he went outside to check if the communal attic door was open. I followed him outside and it was completely padlocked shut, with heavy chains all around the lock. I tried to explain my logic to him. How could anyone be up in our part of the attic when it's blocked off and literally impossible to get to? We came back into the house and we were all quite shaken up. My brother was quite young and was able to get back to sleep, but I was awake all night and found it very difficult to sleep. After this experience, I started to smell old cigarettes every time I would enter the bathroom. It smelled so old. After that event, my brother and my mom and I were going away on holiday whilst my dad had to stay here and work. He told me that he slept with his headphones on every night, as even he felt uncomfortable by himself. As a family, we still have no idea what those noises were, and since then we've continued to hear strange noises from the impossible to reach attic.
Before I begin, let me give you some background. I was about 13 at the time, not under the influence of any narcotics or medications, nor have I taken any mind-altering substances since then. I had just come back from a class trip to Washington, D.C. It was late, maybe around 7 or 8 at night. My father picked me up at the airport, and we began driving home on the highway. And that's when I saw it. It was an unknown distance away, and looked close and far at the same time. It was a gray steel color, and had... Well, it was honestly very stereotypical for the most part. It was in the shape of, like, ravioli. It was a round, perfectly circular, ravioli shape with a bulge on both sides of the middle, and a ring of lights around it. The lights were all large, and gave off a light that was very hard to describe. They were blue, yellow, and white, all at the same time. And yet they didn't give off any kind of flare or beam. And when the craft moved, they didn't give a typical trail that you would get when looking at a light moving out of a car window. Now, the craft moved so perfectly, it looked as if it wasn't moving at all. It matched the exact speed of our car, which, if you've ever driven down I-95, is really quite an impressive task. I tried to get my father's attention because I needed some confirmation that I was indeed seeing what I was seeing. In those days, things were a bit strained between us due to some issues at home. So he grumpily brushed me off and kept driving. It felt like this went on for a while, but after the event, I realized it couldn't have been more than a few minutes due to the time on the dashboard clock. Things got very odd very quickly. The craft, while keeping perfectly matched with our car, started moving on its side, where it was nearly impossible to see except for the bulges. It then did something that I will truly never forget. It split in half, but in a way that was so mechanically perfect I knew right then it wasn't man-made. The way it split was as it was moving and there was no jittering or stalling or any evidence of anything mechanical that could have allowed it to separate, let alone be held together in the first place. After it split for a few moments, it kept pace with the car. Then each half, while still on its side, shot across the sky at blinding speeds in separate directions. And that's the story. Make of it what you will, but I swear by this sighting. It was an amazing experience that showed me we truly understand nothing about our universe. Our next story was posted to r slash paranormal by accomplished row 520. She tells the tale of what happened when she met a strange mourner at her great aunt's funeral. Here's the story. Years ago, when my great aunt passed, at her funeral there was this old man. He was wearing a suit and he had a neck tattoo of an octopus. He had long hair and a ponytail. He kind of looked a little bit like Jack Welker from Breaking Bad. He started talking to me about my grandma and told me to take care of her and grandpa for a few minutes, then gave me a dollar and asked me nicely to go to the vending machine and get him a water, because he came to pay his respects and he had to keep going. He even knew my name, but I had never met him before and I hadn't given it to him. When I came back to give him the water bottle, I couldn't find him. I looked everywhere and I even asked my grandparents if they had seen an older man around anywhere and I described what he looked like. When we got home, my grandparents came over and they were looking at family photo albums and they saw the man that I described, the one that asked for a water, in the pictures. They yelled at me to come downstairs and showed me the picture and pointed to him. They asked if it was the man I had seen, and I said it was. He looked exactly the same. They told me that it was my great-aunt's ex-husband, 
Robert, who had been dead for 20 years. That's how he knew my name. He had died well before I was born, and like I said, I wasn't that close with my great aunt, so I hadn't ever really heard about him. Either way, Robert had been dead for over 20 years. I didn't sleep for at least a week, maybe more. God, the faces they made still send shivers down my spine. It was like they were watching somebody get killed in front of them when they heard about what happened to me and realized who it had been. They told me he was a good person, and he and my great aunt regularly attended church and were just overall good people. I would say that I'm kind of religious, but I don't know. So more than likely, he wasn't up to anything evil, I guess. I suppose he asked for the water so I would go away and he could disappear. He really loved his wife. I guess when he said he had to move on, it's because he had to take her to the next life or something. They asked me if I spent the dollar, and I said I did. I kind of wonder what would have happened if I had kept it, or what happened to whoever wound up with it. Either way, it was a very unsettling and strange experience, if not kind of sweet. Five years ago, I went on a trip with my church to this place on the outskirts of Pittsburgh. I think it was called New Kensington. I was excited to be with my friends, and I never expected anything out of the ordinary to happen. Before this trip, I was not a believer in ghosts. I thought the idea was cool, but I thought it was unrealistic. We stayed in this old church building that was odd looking and gave off bad vibes from the start. I'm not 100% sure what the name of the church was, but it was torn up and the bathrooms were gross. On the first night we stayed over, my three friends and I got our own room. Usually, you don't get your own room if you're under 18. We were about 15 or 16 at the time, with no leader in the room. So we stayed up late and broke the rules, as most kids would do. And on the first night, we left the window open because it was hot and we saw something weird. There was someone looking up at us from the outside of the parking lot. Keep in mind, this was like 2 a.m. We looked down and began speaking to this thing, but we received no response and it didn't move. So my friends grabbed their iPhones and shined the flashlight, and that's when we discovered something. This thing had no face. I thought I was dreaming. As soon as we flashed the light, it disappeared. We were confused and began talking to people the next day. Apparently, there was a legend of a ghost named Molly. We all thought it was a joke and dismissed it. We concluded that it was all in our heads and that made us feel better. So we forgot about it for a few days. My friends said that they heard weird noises two days later in the morning, but never really described it. I left before they had heard it. And then something happened. We all stayed up late again that night. Our door was sealed and locked when it randomly swung open with force. And my friend, let's call him T, jokingly said, wow, Molly's a real B word because he thought the story was a lie and that we were getting messed with by someone. Five seconds later, the door slammed shut and it was loud. We freaked out as it began to open again and we ran out of the room. The hallway lights were on, and we saw nobody else outside. There was literally nobody there who could have done this. We sprinted downstairs and literally ran into this lady. She woke up because she sensed something, and we found out that apparently this lady did exorcisms. We put a Bible underneath our door and did something else that I forgot, which was supposed to keep us safe, which was what she advised. It's a night I'll never forget. And other people saw stuff too, so we didn't feel as alone or crazy. To this day, I'm not 100% sure what we saw or what we were dealing with, but it creeps me out even today.
Over the course of two years, I've had weird dreams about a very specific creature lurking in the attic. It always felt malevolent. Now I don't know if it's an actual thing or my subconscious messing with me, but it deeply unsettled me in ways that my dreams almost never do. As somebody who is always aware that they're dreaming, even dreams where I'm being hunted down don't scare me, but this does. There have been so many dreams about it, but a few stick in my head. The least threatening one was a dream where I'm playing video games in my room. I glance out of my bedroom door and I see an arm dangling from the open attic. The hand moves like it's beckoning me to come closer. I don't because obviously, but I watch it. It never leaves the attic, but it keeps trying to get me to go to it. Another dream, I'm in a house I've never been in. My sister and nieces are in this house with me, and I get the impression that this thing is threatening my family. I'm angry, so I get vocally aggressive. I get my family out of there and go back to confront the thing. I see it for the first time in all the dreams that I've had. It was a woman with light purple skin and dreadlocks. I don't remember how this dream ended, but there were more dreams after, never including my family again, just me. The most intense encounter I had was a dream where the attic was right above the bed I was sleeping in. I was lying there, very aware that it was watching me. I figured if I ignored it, it would go away. Wrong. It slowly pulled the covers off of me. After a few minutes of lying there, cold, trying to decide if it was safe to pull the blanket back up. It grabs me by the throat and lifts me up about a foot off the bed and starts choking me. I felt like my lungs were going to burst when it let go and let me fall back onto the bed, gasping for breath. I don't know how many dreams I've had since this one, but I know it's been at least a year since I dreamt about it. I'm very uneasy around addicts now, and I always expect to look up and see it again when I pass underneath one, awake or not. Even right now, I keep throwing glances at the attic door right outside my bedroom. Nothing's there, of course, but it's still on my mind. If this thing is not my subconscious and it's an actual entity, I have no idea what it could be. In my limited experience with the paranormal, I've never encountered anything that felt malevolent before. Just this. My hope is that either my brain just decided it wanted to be terrified of addicts, or that this thing got bored with me and left me forever. Back in 2019, my girlfriend and I went on a vacation to an island in Italy. Everything went well, except that the last day it did rain a little bit. It didn't rain a lot though. The streets were dry, but the sky was gray, and we came back to our little house at about 5 p.m. because of the weather. We got bored pretty quickly, and we had to wait at least three or four hours before going to eat at a restaurant so I decided to visit the only part of the island I hadn't seen. We got on the motorbike and went to Calafante, which I found out was totally abandoned due to a collapse that had happened in 2017. The whole neighborhood was as neglected and deserted as the beach and the restaurant were. And I swear we passed through every house, road, or parking lot, and it was just deserted. Nobody lived there, not even a tourist or a car. I think that the collapse of the beach made that spot a little bit less interesting. Anyway, I kept driving in that neighborhood until I ended up at a dead-end street near a football field. But there were two kids playing football on the end of the street, and people noticed that every house nearby was shut close. Not a single sign of a human being for kilometers, so where did these two kids come from? We got close, and my girlfriend and I were already a little bit freaked out. 
But I wanted to talk to them, because if I remember correctly, I was looking for a place that I couldn't find, and I thought perhaps they would know where it was. We approached them. They were no more than six or seven years old, dirty as hell, like just came out of a coal mine dirty. One kid had a white, more like a gray, dirty and torn t-shirt, and the other only had his rag-like pants on. Both of them were without shoes and with their hair completely shaved. The shirtless kid had a circular wound, more like a hole right in the middle of his pectorals. It was red, bloody, and new, like he had just been shot in the middle of the chest. I asked them this thing and they answered me, but I couldn't understand a thing. It wasn't like the local dialect or any Italian dialect at all. It was completely incomprehensible. They kept talking and pointing at my bike. We couldn't understand a thing, so we just said goodbye and made a U-turn. I could see them staring at us from my mirrors. We were so freaked out. They looked pretty injured, but they were acting super casual. I don't know why, but my girlfriend and I are pretty sure they were some kind of ghost. Like maybe kids that died in the World War or something like that. I don't know if it's a proper paranormal encounter, but it's the only story that I still can't explain. About 15 years ago, my old high school group decided that we were going to attempt to contact my friend Ben's biological dad. He had recently died before he got to know him. Now, Ben was absolutely wild. He wasn't scared easily. My high school sweetheart was with us and he was absolutely terrified. I owned a necklace that had items placed on it for protection from spirits. To help ease his anxiety, I placed the necklace around his neck. We partook in the devil's lettuce and started our session giggling. I was no believer in Ouija boards. It didn't bother me one bit that we decided to do this in an abandoned church deep in the woods either. Only my boyfriend was terrified, which caused our friends to tease him mercilessly. The board was set up and we got serious. We had no idea, however, just how serious this was about to become. As the planchette moved to spell his father's name, I smiled, thinking that this was his closure. He was clearly doing it because he had refused to share the name beforehand. It had to be him. But looking into his eyes, I saw something I had never seen etched into his face. It was fear. I can't remember how it all went down, but suddenly the board was spinning and it had spelled out murder. I was starting to feel cold, even in the heat. That's when it all went to crap. The pews, already broken, were shaking uncontrollably, even toppling over. We were in a back room that was essentially empty, but we ripped open the door to discover the pews falling over. It started a massive panic to get out of the building. As I was running, I realized my boyfriend wasn't with us in the woods. I turned back right as Ben and a few others pulled off in their cars. Once I re-entered the dilapidated church, my boyfriend was stuck, literally stuck to the floor, screaming. The building was still shaking. It was ice cold, and it felt like a sock had been shoved in my mouth. I remember my best friend helping me carry him out of the building. Within an instant, he had his wits about him and refused to talk about what happened. He looked like he'd just been through war. He opted to keep my protection necklace on, citing that the demon may follow one of us. We never really talked about what happened. That was very strange for my very open friend group. We knew it wasn't an earthquake, because we live just about an hour below the Blue Ridge Mountains of Appalachia, and we never get quakes that could move furniture like that. And to be honest, I felt something dark around me, until a cleansing eleven years later after the scariest haunting I'd ever experienced happened. I don't know what we released or have any clue how it could have been a natural event. Something threw those church pews to pieces. 
And, needless to say, we never went back. In southeast Michigan, there's a mountain bike trail called the DTE Foundation Trail, just north of Chelsea, Michigan. For a mountain biker, it has three major sections, more still under development, including connectors to a larger network, but I digress. Green Loop is easy flow. Came is big climbs, big downhills with jumps, super flow technical climbs, intermediate. Wind Loop, long flow with grinding climbs and long downhills, technical features, intermediate. Sugar Loop is fast flow and major speed, but more technical, difficult. The usual flow is you start on the green loop and move on to the big came, then the wind, then the sugar, then back up the loops to the trailhead. There's a Michigan-based blogger named Kai Juno that summed up the creepy part of this forest. This is what Kai Juno wrote. Quote, I know I've made a post about it before, but I can't find it but the most like bone chilling thing you can ever experience is the silence when you're walking in the woods. Like it's the woods, there's always birds and bugs and frogs and stuff, but sometimes it will just go completely dead silent. Sometimes it feels like even the breeze stops, like the animals can sense a predator nearby that's even bigger and scarier than you. So what does this mountain bike trail system have to do with the silence? The west side of the wind loop. Things just happen there. I've been to DTE so many times and the uneasy feeling never goes away on the west side of the wind. I'll pass riders who have taken some bad falls and require a medevac. There's a spot where the forest looks pretty open, but it's quiet. Unless there's a storm moving through the area, you don't hear a thing. This section is about 500 to 600 feet directly south of the intersection of Gilnan Drive and Sugarloaf Lake Road. There used to be a trail that branched off to the left, and after a tree fell over, nobody ever opened it back up. There's always this heavy musk in that area specifically. I know the smell of deer, and it isn't a bat. Something else lives in that area, and it creeps me out. Part of me thinks it's a mountain lion, but those sightings are super rare and have been mostly a little bit more west or in the Upper Peninsula. The most perplexing thing is that this is really close to Sugarloaf Lake, and there are some people living out there, so there shouldn't be a reason for this unease. I'm not the only person that's felt it, but yeah, there's something really not right with the forest there. Many people travel to the old citadel in Charleston, South Carolina, because they've heard that it's haunted. But what happens to somebody who stays there without knowing about its allegedly haunted history? Redditor Daphne is dumb has an answer. I had a work trip in Charleston, so I booked an embassy suites and the old Citadel seemed like a nice property in a convenient location. My fiance found out that it used to be a civil war armory or something like that. And he was loving the history aspect of the hotel too. We had a nice southern dinner in one of the most beautiful cities in the country, in our opinion. And when we went back to the hotel, everything seemed fine. We got ready for bed, watched some Netflix, planned our next day and turned the lights out to go to bed. My fiance passed out instantly and I dozed off, but I felt the weirdest pressure consuming my body. Like I had a ton of bricks on me. I've heard of sleep paralysis before, but I've never had it in my life. I opened my eyes and I saw the darkest looking figure in the corner of our room. 
I was completely frozen, and I couldn't speak. I don't know if I was frozen in fear, or if it was something else. I kept staring at the figure to see if it would move, and it looked like after a few minutes, it just faded away into the corner that it had been standing in. I was still frozen, and once I was able to move, I snuggled up with my fiancé and got my phone and looked up the hotel. That's when I saw that it was named as one of the most haunted hotels in the entire South. After snuggling with my fiancé and mostly being under the covers, I fell asleep. I told my fiancé what happened the next day, and he said that he had had some really dark dreams, which is very strange for him, so something was definitely fishy. We asked the hotel staff at breakfast if the hotel was haunted, and they laughed and said, I'm not going to touch that topic. We had another five days of our stay, and I was so scared to sleep, but it never happened again. Does this seem like a haunting or just sleep paralysis and a weird coincidence that he had scary dreams that same night too? Could it have been anything? I know that city, although beautiful, has a very dark history. I also forgot to mention that this was at like two or three in the morning and the room felt very cold. When I was able to get my phone to do some research, the hotel Wi-Fi, which was typically lightning fast, was painfully slow, up to the point where I had to use regular data just to use the internet. And even that was unusually slow for a bit. I remember thinking, somebody doesn't want me to know whatever I'm about to find out. Okay, so this is a story that took place when I was around eight years old in my neighborhood. I was next door neighbors with my best friend, Alex. We both went to the same school and always hung out every day after school. One day, I was bringing my Nintendo 64 to his house so that we could play together. Once I got into his house, his uncle was there watching the television so we couldn't use it. Today I now know that he wasn't his uncle because my older sibling, who knew Alex's older sibling, told me that his parents rented out rooms to random people from their original hometown. So the uncle was just a random stranger from out of the country. He told us to go into his shed and search for an extra TV. So. We opened the shed and started searching. We found an older television, but we couldn't use it. Then something started moving all the things around. We thought it was a rat, so at first we didn't mind. But then we heard laughter, something so scary that I tried to leave, but Alex told me not to worry. We kept searching around for the laughter and we eventually found this one doll that was around two feet tall. It was torn and battered, so we figured it was just broken. We just sat it down and decided to go hook up the television we'd found in his room. We played for a while until his uncle left the house for food and his parents were at work, so we were home alone. We started hearing noises at the house, but figured it was nothing. But then we heard the laughter the doll was moving around the house carefully, which we saw through the small peak underneath the closed door. The doll was looking for something, which was probably us. We were both freaking out, but we knew we had to get away from the house. We opened the window and jumped out and ran toward my house. Somehow, the doll managed to look at us as we were running away through the window and just laugh. We stayed at my house all afternoon until his parents came home. Ever since that day, I've always had experiences, weird things at my friend's house, like having YouTube videos end abruptly and start playing other random things, like clown videos. I think it's a serial commercial from the 70s. I ignored all of these weird signs for the rest of my childhood, and recently we met up for a while since departing to different high schools. 
Somehow the topic of the weird things was brought up, and I asked if he remembered all those things. He did remember, which now makes me want to share the story, because apparently it wasn't just my imagination. I've had over a week to think about this, and I can't come up with a satisfactory, rational explanation. I live in the north coast of Northern Ireland, not far from the Giant's Causeway, just to give some reference that people might know. Just over a week ago, I was sitting watching television with my wife. I sit by one of the windows sometimes because there's a plug-in for my laptop there. My wife was sitting on the other sofa, so she couldn't see out of this particular window. It was around 8.30 and perfectly dark outside. If I looked out, I could see the lights of our local town, Ballymoney. It's tiny, more of a village, really. Just as at the scene, we're about three miles out, surrounded by farmland. Anyway, I'm watching TV and occasionally glancing out the window, when suddenly I see this bright light just over the fields. It's multicolored, and it kind of blooms, growing larger. At first I thought it was a firework, which would have been bizarre enough in late March, in the middle of the lockdown. Except it's too slow, if that makes sense. It brightened into maybe three different colors. It was hard to judge distances in the dark, but if I had to guess, I'd say that it was two acres or more away, and larger than a family car, hanging maybe 80 to 100 feet up, pretty low. Eventually, it faded and disappeared again, not behaving anything like a firework, and far too large to be a flare. I said at the time that I thought I had seen somebody letting off fireworks. A few minutes later, I glanced out again, and there's a smaller light roving around in the same spot, but it vanished almost the moment I looked at it. This light was maybe a third of the size of the original and was moving left to right. I've thought about it ever since. The annual Ballymoney Town firework display is much further away and we can always hear it from home. Yet this was soundless. Helicopters and drones don't have lights like that. And again, if there had been a chopper out there so low and so close, we'd have heard it. A drone still strikes me as most likely. We wouldn't have heard it inside the house, and I guess it might have been rigged with powerful lights, but they would have had to have been incredibly powerful. So, I don't know. I've never, ever seen or heard a drone over that area in the daytime, and I'm out there all the time. Honestly, I think maybe I saw a UFO. No lights in the sky were reported in local news or on social media, though, and I haven't seen anything since, so who knows? Last year, I was backpacking deep in the mountains in Montana I was near Libby, Montana, about three hours west of Glacier National Park. I was hiking alone, and I expected to encounter bears, moose, etc. I'm experienced, and I know how to handle them, so I wasn't scared. But this time, I was way out in the middle of nowhere, with nobody around for miles. Also, no cell service anywhere, and I didn't have my emergency beacon with me. Usually, I expect to see other hikers on the trail but not here. Nope. I was out there completely alone, and I knew it. Well, it was like nine miles to my camp up at Cedar Lake. About halfway, the trail opened up, and I was in a somewhat clear area and had better visibility of what was around me. There were still trees and green undergrowth covering the ground. A few minutes later, I see something quickly scurry across the trail, maybe 50 feet in front of me. I stopped, froze, and waited. The creature noticed me, and then stood up in the undergrowth, 
but still almost completely covered by the tall grass and shrubs. It was about three feet tall, pitch black, 50 to 60 pounds, and obviously very quick and intelligent. I assumed it was a baby black bear at first, so I didn't move or make a sound, and I got my bear spray ready, fully expecting an angry mama bear to come roaring out of the trees at me. But thankfully, that didn't happen, because I surely would have been attacked or at least bluff charged. All I could see was its face through the tall grass. The creature stared at me invasively for about 30 seconds. I was staring back at it. I didn't move a muscle. Then, suddenly, it huffed loudly at me and then ran through the grass up the side of the hill and I never saw it again. The sound it made was a lot deeper than you would expect from something that small. It was like a bear's growl. You could almost feel it inside your chest. Very unsettling. I stood there silently and waited for another few minutes to see if Mama Bear was nearby and that it was indeed a cub, but nothing came. I gingerly passed through that area on the trail and kept hiking. My research tells me it may have been an otter or a mink, but I've seen them before, and this wasn't like anything I've seen before. It was the way it moved. I only saw it for a second, but it almost slithered on the ground like a reptile, and then stood up on its hind legs and watched me, making me feel really uncomfortable. There was something sinister about it. I checked for tracks, but couldn't find any. I have no idea what that thing was. I wanted to share a few UFO encounters that I've had. The first was when I was about 11. I was riding home with my dad in the car. I looked out the window and saw a ship. It was shaped more like a small city, black with multiple spires. I told my dad and he saw it as well and gunned it home. The odd part was his reaction, which is connected to the next encounter. I asked about the ship and he went ape shit, started screaming about nothing being there and that we never saw anything, even though he described it when I pointed it out. Fast forward to about four years ago, which makes me around 34 years old at the time. I was at work at the hotel and the housekeeper calls me over. It's Veterans Day, so I figure she wants me to check out the parade. Instead, she points out a white sphere in the sky. We stare at it and it moves at an insane speed, then splits into six smaller spheres. I tell her, congratulations on your first UFO sighting. It keeps moving around the parade, and I tell her not to worry. It's probably just observing. The thing is, when I asked her later if any more weird stuff came out, I got the same reaction. Total freak out screaming about not seeing anything and it not being real. It was like the mind couldn't handle the situation and completely melted down. This final one is a bit more interesting. I had let my dogs out at night for a potty break then a head count as they came back inside. Before I went in, I noticed a star bigger than the others. Not being a runner, I stayed put. It got closer and I got a better look. It was a four-pointed star with mini points about the size of a pressure cooker, all pulsating different colors. I decided to try some telepathy. I mean, I didn't do anything fancy like cross my legs and say om. I just thought in my head, like you do when you have a grocery list. I asked it if it meant any harm. Give me red for no and green for yes. I got a red for no. I asked if it came from the stars. It turned green. I asked if it was just here for recon. Again, green. Finally, I thought, okay, you can be on your way and it flew higher and farther. My point on the last one is to try to stay calm. It might scare you, but it's the best way to remember what you saw. I didn't get any missing time or the usual stuff like strange markings. 
It was just an odd encounter. So the area that my grandparents lived in was somewhat known for Bigfoot sightings, and my grandfather had seen some signs of it too, a set of footprints in the snow that strode uninterrupted over a four-foot fence, calls from the forest, etc. They live at the edge of a state park in Ohio. I've seen plenty at this point, but back then I hadn't had any experience with the paranormal, at least as far as I knew. Bigfoot fascinated me because of all the cryptids it seemed the most plausible, and I'd spend some of my week there watching documentaries and discussing it with him. Now, he wasn't much of a prankster, but it had happened enough that when something actually did happen, I just thought it was him. I had just gotten into bed at the end of their trailer. I was there for maybe 20 minutes, insomnia, when I heard this call outside the window, passing by quickly down the hill. Imagine an orangutan hoot, not a loud one, just that idle huffing that they kind of do to each other. Pitch that down a ways and then have it coming from lungs that should belong to a bear or a moose. As I said, my first thought was to rationalize that maybe it's grandpa messing with me. He almost had me too. This thought lasted until I remembered the way that the trailer sits on the hill. The bottom of these big windows is sitting six feet off the ground. The noise had definitely come from above me in bed, near the tops of the window. So whatever made that noise was two or three feet higher, and the old guy didn't own any stilts. I wish I'd gone to look, but the realization that something that massive had decided to make a noise right next to me just struck me with paralyzing fear. I was playing around an abandoned area within sight of the trailer later that same week, jumping around, rotting beams, and poking through whatever was left, when I just stopped. There was a massive, eminent presence behind me all of a sudden. No noise alerted me. I hadn't seen anything move. It was just pressure. Nothing inherently threatening in it, just the sheer weight of the gaze is what got me running. I have felt the presence of ghosts, at least one demon. What I'm pretty sure was eldritch shenanigans, and let me tell you, nothing has ever had the weight of that. The power, it felt more real and present than I think people can be. Anybody else have something like this happen? Not a sighting, but just a sense of something? An impossible noise or an encounter that was just too close? Let me know. When this Redditor was traveling through Valley Forge National Park, they decided to pull over to capture the gorgeous moon. What happened next was an experience they've not yet forgotten. Here's the story. Sometime last year, we experienced a unique lunar event. I believe it was called the Super Blood Moon, but whatever it was called, it was absolutely enormous. It lit up the sky was larger than any moon I had ever seen before, and it was beautiful. During this event, I was traveling through Valley Forge National Park at about nine o'clock at night. Admiring the moon, I decided I wanted to take a picture of it, if I could do so safely. Fortunately, up on my right, I saw a parking area that still had its gate open. I pulled in so as to be safely out of the road, but only so far. I didn't want to go all the way into the lot for some reason. I stopped my car, exited the vehicle, and pulled out my phone. Kneeling down, I began to set up for my shot. The moon in view, I lifted my finger to take the photo and stopped. Every hair on the back of my neck was standing on end. Without warning and seemingly without reason, I felt an intense feeling of dread come over me. 
I felt as though a crowd of people was pressing in on every side, inching ever closer to me, some close enough to reach out and touch me. I closed my eyes for a moment and then turned around. Nothing. Facing the blackness did nothing to calm my nerves, though. In fact, seeing no visible reason for my fear only intensified it. Something in me felt as though I had pinpointed the source. I just couldn't see it. Not wanting to miss my chance to catch a photo of this beautiful moon, though, I turned around to face the camera once more. My hands shook, and I said into the night, I just want to take a picture of the moon, and then I'll be leaving, I promise. After saying this, I felt a slight reprieve in the oppressive feeling, and took two photos. Neither was in focus, though, and at that point I was so terrified that all I could think of was leaving. Cutting my losses on the shot, I took my phone and tripod, my two blurry photos, and scrambled to get back into the car. Throwing the car in reverse, I got out of that area as fast as I could. To this day, I have never stopped there again at night, and I don't intend to. I want to start this off by saying that I live in my mom's basement. Many people have said that they think it's haunted. Weird things have happened, like the washer turning on by itself, and sometimes even clothes appearing folded when they hadn't been folded previously. That's in the back room, though there's a larger main part that I live in. My bed and TV are set up where our pool table used to be placed when I was younger. In the middle of the night, when everyone else in the house was asleep, I used to hear people playing pool, so that area is no stranger to spirits. When I first moved down there around two months ago, I woke up to a dark figure standing a few feet away from me. It didn't seem threatening, it was just a little weird. I've also had other paranormal experiences. I don't know if they're related to the entities in the basement or what, but I guess I'll share them here too. For instance, yesterday, my YouTube showed numerous profile pictures that weren't mine, but only on my Apple TV and only on the top corner icon when I would click on the profile. It would show my normal one, which is just the standard issued one but then on the Apple TV, all these other ones appeared. I just stared at it for a minute, confused, then got up to look at the picture and it had something to do with God. I couldn't really read it because of how small the icon was, but it seemed to be some type of Bible verse. Then before my eyes, the profile picture changed again to what looked like a picture of Jesus. So seeing this, I ran to my computer figuring somebody was on my account and I should probably change my password. But that's when I discovered that the icon on my account there was totally normal. No one knew had logged into my account, and there were only three devices on that account. My computer, my Apple TV, and my Xbox. So I once again looked back at the TV and the icon was now different. This time I could actually read it. It said, the power of Christ compels you. This slightly shook me to my core, and I ran back to my computer to change my password. Eventually, the profile icon went back to normal on its own a few hours later, which was also somehow slightly alarming. Like I said, I don't know if this has anything to do with what's going on in the basement, but my TV's in the basement, so maybe. I hope this made sense. I don't know if anything like this has happened to anyone else, but please let me know if it has. This happened in 2018, in December, just before Christmas. Two of my friends and I, 
we were 17 at the time, and a cousin of mine who was 15, were camping in the woods. It was on the property of one of the friends that had come along. We were there for five days and pretty much did it all by ourselves, except for water. That we would hike back to the house to grab for the day, since it was pretty impractical to get water ourselves for five days. This region was relatively dry, with no water filters or anything like that. We'd lie down pretty early, which felt rather primitive, literally when the sun set. Every night we would hear boar around our tent and steps. Paranoia fueled it a lot, but we had a bow, two axes, and some big knives. One day though, and I think this was either the last night or the second to last, we were just having a chat after dinner, like we would often do, and we hear a scream. It was pretty odd. It didn't sound human, but I have no clue what animal would be doing it either. I know a fair amount of our country's fauna. I've heard a lot of their screams, but this one was just different. The scream sounded like it had a buildup, not like a scream where you immediately hear the loudest part and then it dies off, but like it started low, got really intense, and then stopped. It sounded far enough, say 50 to 70 meters or so, but then it happens again, and again, and again. Now, suddenly, it's coming from almost all sides, and it was getting pretty close. It didn't sound super menacing, even though we were really scared, shooting my air gun with no rounds just to make a sound. It got to the point where the sound seemed like it was coming right to where the campfire couldn't shed light, just outside of what we could see. I remember that we had set up some traps for rabbits down the trail that day. So we gathered all the strength and courage that we could and we went there. The bait was gone, but the traps were unarmed. And that was a stupid idea anyway. Rabbits don't scream like that. We had some pretty strong flashlights, but we couldn't see a thing. All of a sudden, the sounds just stopped with no clear reason. It was the most terrifying experience I've ever had. And anytime somebody asks me for a scary story, I share this one. Also, where I live in Portugal, we don't have any cougars or anything like that that typically screams. Maybe there's no explanation, I don't know. But all I know is that it terrified me, and I still think about it to this day. This story comes to us from Redditor Boulder Beautiful 5804. In it, the author recounts living in an over 100-year-old house, built on top of a cemetery. Here's the story. When I was in university, I lived in an older house that was built beside a church. The house was over 100 years old, but I'm unsure of its actual age. I lived in the basement and had a few housemates. We didn't know at the time that it was built on a cemetery. That was discovered shortly after I moved out. Weird things would happen in the house, but I'm still not sure if it was haunted or just purely coincidental. I would hear footsteps above my room late at night, and when I would ask the next day who was in the kitchen at 2 a.m., my housemates would say that they never came downstairs at all. My one housemate had a cat, and one day we were in the kitchen. The back door opened by itself, and the cat walked in. I did see what I believe was a shadow figure in that house. I had a bookshelf beside my bed, and had a Buddha statue on one of the top shelves. In the middle of the night, there was a huge bang, and when I woke up, I saw a black figure jump from the bookshelf to the floor and run out of the room. The shelf with the Buddha figure had fallen off the bookshelf, and the Buddha had smashed to pieces on the floor. I thought at first maybe it was my housemate's cat that had somehow knocked it off the shelf. But the next morning when I told my housemate what had happened, he said the cat had been locked in their room with them all night. Shortly after that, I moved out. 
The house was owned by the church, and there was a parking lot in the backyard. The church was adding an addition, and had started construction, and had started digging up the parking lot behind the house. During the construction, human remains were found, which obviously halted the construction until it was determined why the remains were there. It was found that before the house existed, a small cemetery had been on that land. At least 30 skeletons were found, and nobody was sure if they were ever able to determine the identities or why they were buried there. For some reason, when the house was built, it was decided to build on top of the cemetery, and the records of the cemetery's existence was either lost or forgotten over time. I'm not sure if the other housemates had experiences there. It was a creepy house, and I remember them mentioning hearing things at night and not liking to stay there alone. Like I said, I don't know if it was haunted or what, but weird things definitely happened there. My hometown is small and remote, and we had a Native American reservation a few minutes outside of town. I was close to a lot of the people that lived there, mostly the teenagers and children, as they shared extracurricular activities through the school, so I grew pretty accustomed to their beliefs. Now, I moved pretty far away right before I started high school, but I visited somewhat frequently, as I still had family there. My grandmother owned a camp on a small lake. It was very quaint and nice to spend time there. However, as soon as it became dark out, things felt very different. On one side, we had neighbors for miles. On the other, it was dense woods. My cousins and I, one a year older and one a year younger, had always found those woods creepy. We visited now and then, but always became very uncomfortable and soon left. One night, I was traveling back home, down south with my cousins and my aunt. These were very remote lake roads, inhabited by very, very few. Dense woods bordered both sides, so, naturally, some nocturnal animals were out. But one that we saw was very different. It wasn't as big as I typically see these creatures described, but it wasn't small either. Maybe the size of a large coyote or a small wolf. And we don't live in wolf country, by the way. But it didn't look like either of those. It was crouched back on its hind legs, just kind of chilling out. As we drove past, it turned its head to look at us. It had a pretty blank face, almost like an owl's, but without the beak, and a bear's muzzle instead. Its body looked like a poor rendition of a human. Like if you asked someone to draw a person, but they had never seen one before. Its legs bent the wrong way, like a horse almost. It had toes like an alpaca. Its arms were very long. And frankly, it was the most human thing about it. It had very patchy, wiry, matted fur. Now, I know it wasn't an animal with mange. I've seen many animals with mange. And yes, it's scary, but it was nothing like this thing. It didn't necessarily chase us, but it trotted behind us for a while. Everybody was freaking out, naturally. But I think deep down, I knew. Can I get any confirmation or information about what this might have been? And if so, are there any precautions I should take to keep this thing away? It happened years ago, but I'm still lost. So I'll never forget this for as long as I live. It was around December 2004 maybe early 2005, near Burlington, Connecticut. My friend and I were driving around ghost hunting 
aka checking out cemeteries and the Green Lady Cemetery at night because we were edgy goth kids. Plus, it was a full moon, so why not? Anyway, we got turned around on some of those back roads and ended up in this weird wooded area. It was winter. There was a little bit of snow on the ground, but not much, maybe a couple of inches or so. We're driving down this really crappy paved road with lots of potholes in our old Honda, going relatively slow. All of a sudden, a deer crosses the road in front of us. My friend, who is driving, brakes. We were only going about 25 to 30 miles per hour. The deer, no joke, stared past our headlights and right at us. And this deer was huge. I don't know how the heck you measure a deer, but I know horses, and I would say that he was about 15 hands at his withers. His antlers were pretty average, nothing too dramatic, but he almost glowed in our headlights. It might have been the moon at that point, but it was still seriously creepy. He stared at us for a solid minute before my friend turned off the headlights. The deer then walked straight at the car, which caused both of us to panic, turn the headlights on and actually drive around the deer, which was still coming at the car. We drive away, now going much faster than 25 to 30 miles an hour, potholes and suspension on the car be damned. I happen to look out the window and no kidding, this deer is pacing us in the woods alongside us. It kept turning its head to look at us. We must have been going at least 40 to 50 miles per hour. We panic, but because of road conditions, we really can't go much faster without crashing or really screwing up the car. Finally, two miles or so down the road, we come up on a brightly lit patch of road with a school and a decent enough intersection that required a stoplight. I see the deer peel off behind our car and run back down the middle of the road. I still don't have any solid theories on what this could have been, but maybe I'm just trying to avoid admitting what I know it was. This is a memory that I have about my family going to the hospital in which I was about to be born. I recently started thinking about this memory again for some reason. It's just something that I cannot find a logical explanation for, considering that I'm a hyper-skeptical guy. The memory is seeing my dad and other family members walking their way out of my grandma's house, where we used to live, to see my mom give birth my birth at the hospital. I can perfectly recall how my dad was dressed that day. For the rest of my family, it's kind of a blurred image. My dad was wearing a black blazer and blue tie with pink diagonal stripes, black jeans, and a lighter blue shirt. I remember even how he was walking while smiling, a pretty detailed and vivid sequence of images. So as expected a couple of years ago, I might have been 20 at the time, I'm 28 now, I was going to tell him about this weird memory. But before that, I decided to ask him first about how he was dressed the day of my birth, to make sure he didn't just go along with the memory to fool me. And yes, you guessed it, it was the exact same way that I remember. He said he perfectly remembers since he planned it beforehand what he was going to wear for the day of my birth. I freaked out so hard. I would ask myself how this is even possible. It just doesn't make any sense. So I started trying to figure this all out, and I came up with a theory. I later dismissed it, but my family used to record my cousins and I all the time in childhood with this old camera and then put them on VHS tapes. So I started thinking that maybe an uncle of mine or someone else had recorded that moment of my family on the way to the hospital. So I decided to go over all the tapes that I had, plus it's fun watching them. But no, 
I didn't find anything even remotely close to that image that I had in my mind. Plus, after re-watching my life series on these tapes, I realized they started recording after I turned one year old. So, yeah, one-year-old me tapes were the oldest tapes made, nothing before that. Another thing that I realized, the way that I remember this scene of my family couldn't be recorded in this weird angle and perspective. It was like I was looking at them, walking, but also being careful to not be seen, kind of hiding a little bit behind a wall. Kind of an odd way to record something, right? So that's my story about this weird yet accurate and vivid memory that I have before I was even born. I'm still trying to make sense out of it. Every time I start thinking about it, I can't stop until I sleep. I'm going to preface this by saying that it isn't my story, but something that happened to my parents. They live in Western New York, upstate, and they're very open to all kinds of supernatural stuff. My dad has reason to believe in aliens, for reasons other than this encounter. That's a story for another day though. It might be a good time to add that my parents do not use substances or alcohol, and they're very sharp as far as memory, cognizance, and intuition goes. I'm just going to copy and paste the text message that my mom sent me about this experience. I thought somebody would find it interesting, or maybe even have an explanation for them. This is what my mom had to say. Last weekend, we were coming back from Jamestown. Dad and I saw a UFO, or something, between Randolph and Steenberg. There was a huge, very bright light blinking off and on in the sky directly in front of us, and it was falling from the sky, except that it was shooting directly downward. I thought it was a falling star at first, but after it blinked repeatedly, I thought, that's not a falling star. I even thought it might be a plane, but it was too bright and too fast and it was plummeting downward with intention. Then all of a sudden, mid sky, it was just gone. I thought, well, it must have gone behind a hill or a mountain or the trees. Right then I said, did you see that? And at the same time, dad said, what the heck was that? He said that he was thinking the same thing I was. And at the same time, we both noticed out loud there are no mountains. And there weren't. No mountains, no hills, no trees. It was just cornfields and open space. And this thing just blinked out of existence. The next thing you know, it was directly behind us, mid-sky. And it shot directly upward, back into the sky. I was looking out of my rear view, and it lit up the whole sky, like an aura all around but the brightness of it was still really bright white. Dad turned around watching it, and it started to follow us. We had that same eerie feeling that we did when we saw that thing that we thought was Bigfoot. All we kept saying was, what the heck is that? All of a sudden, it just disappeared. Isn't that weird? This happened a few months ago, and it's really been bugging me. I was out hiking and rappelling with a friend in the hills area near Tombstone. I want to mention that I have spent quite a bit of time solo hiking and camping. I'm used to hearing noises and brushing it off. Anyway, it's late afternoon, and I'm the first one to rappel down. I got to the bottom, and while my partner was getting ready to follow, we heard this noise that I would describe most like a growl or a snarl. It sounded like it was coming from the ridge above both of us. If facing the cliff, 
it sounded like it was coming from the right side. We both looked around, but didn't see anything. I encouraged him to come down, and I even half-joked that it was probably just a bear or a mountain lion. At that point, I wasn't even feeling that nervous. I figured that once the two of us were together again, we would be pretty intimidating to an animal. While he rappelled down, I heard a loud crash to what seemed to be parallel to me on my left. By this point, I'm starting to get pretty scared because this sound was getting closer and closer. Somehow, it had gone from right to left on an exposed cliff face without either of us seeing it. He successfully rappelled down and we both agreed we needed to get out of there. We still had a steep downhill climb to the car. We packed up the gear as fast as we could. As we get our packs back on, we heard what sounded to me like a howler monkey. The noise was close and we still couldn't see what was making it. Of course, it was from the direction that we needed to go. We hauled butt down that mountain and got in the car. I know that it can be pretty easy to let the mind play tricks, but we have the exact same account of what happened. Both of us are really familiar with what's out there and we've never heard anything like it. Now this is the part that I hesitate to tell because I know it sounds even more insane, but we both heard whispering and giggling like it was right next to us, but we still couldn't see anything. I keep trying to explain to myself that our minds just played a trick. The same trick, but a trick. The first noise I would chalk up to maybe a bear or a mountain lion. Animals are stealthy. They could run in front of us without us noticing, I guess. Something else could have fallen to the right side. What made that monkey noise, though? I don't know. And why do we both say we heard whispering? I don't know. I don't know if anybody else has creepy experiences in Arizona. I want to believe somebody was just pranking us, but there wasn't a single other car in the parking area. My friend believes that we experienced something supernatural. I honestly have no idea what to think. I just had a strange dream the other night, and I can't quite make heads or tails of it. Quick background that pertains to the dream. My dad passed when I was 13 years old, and when I was really struggling with the loss back then, he appeared to me in a dream, keeping this looming darkness at bay and telling me that I would be all right. I later told somebody about that dream, and they told me that sometimes, when a loved one dies, they can come to you in dreams. I didn't believe or disbelieve really, but it felt like a bit of comfort at the time. Now throughout the years I have had a dream here or there about my dad, and I always found a little comfort in thinking, hmm, maybe it's him. Fast forward about 16 years to my dream last night. So in the dream, I was in this boggy, swampy looking area. It was dark, but still lit enough that I could see a road. I was on the road and I knew my destination was the grave of an ancestor, maybe like a great grandfather. And all of a sudden my dad shows up in a suburban. I hop in and we're talking when he almost drives it into a soft shoulder or ditch, which my dad wouldn't do while driving because he drove professionally in his life. We continued down the road and we got to this graveyard where I start asking him questions that he can't answer or is answering wrong. Stuff that he would know. I just got this bad feeling. I just looked at him and said, you're not my dad. He didn't get upset, but he insisted that he was and almost seemed amused. I kept looking for a grave and insisting that he wasn't my father. All the while he kept laughing and saying, of course I am. This horse appears and starts bucking and rearing and really causing a stir until finally my dad went away. The next thing I know, I'm talking to a woman in a place that was just nothing. Like a place that was just void of everything 
but her and me. She said something like, when you let your dad in as a kid, you broke open a grate. And in my dream, I had envisioned like a giant sewer grate. She said it allowed all manner of spirits to come and visit as they pleased and to masquerade as my dad. She didn't seem at all concerned or like it was a bad thing, just like she was telling me something that was a fact. At that point, I woke up. The details are obviously a little fuzzy, but I can't stop thinking about it this morning. I just figured I'd see what anyone else had to say. Maybe it was just a weird dream, but it certainly felt like something else. I live in a three-story, four-bedroom new house. Prior to it being a house, this plot of land was a residential home, and before that, I have no idea. My partner, our young children, and I have lived here since it was built, nearly six years ago. I've never felt anything bad or good in this house, except for the bedroom on the top floor. That bedroom was our youngest child's bedroom. It was her bedroom from about six months old until about two years. She never slept well, ever. She would always wake up during the night, sometimes crying uncontrollably. We just put it down to her being a crappy sleeper. However, sometimes if we couldn't settle her back down, we would bring her into our room, which was directly next to her room. She would just sit and stare into the hallway outside and would refuse to be put down near the doorway and if we tried to carry her out into the hallway to show her nothing was there, she would freak out. She no longer has that room as her bedroom. She shares with her older sisters now. The middle child, a boy, now has that bedroom, and he claims to feel fine in there. However, when it was our youngest daughter's bedroom, she would wake in the night, and my partner would go downstairs to make her a bottle, and I would go in to comfort her. While comforting her with my back to the door, I would always feel like there was something or someone watching me, so much so that I would feel forced to glance back over my shoulder. That's the backstory. During a conversation we were having as a family tonight, myself and my partner were talking to the eldest child, 15 years old, and she just so happened to sleep in her brother's room last night. He was at a sleepover at a friend's house and she wanted to escape the two younger ones. We asked her how she slept. Totally normal question, and we certainly didn't lead her answer in any way. She said, eh, not so great. I felt on edge, like somebody was watching me from the doorway. I wasn't scared, I just felt anxious. How she described her feelings was exactly how I had felt in the past, when I would often be in there comforting our youngest. Neither my partner nor myself have ever spoken to the children about this before so there's no way she was just regurgitating what we've said. I felt a shiver go up my spine when my stepdaughter said this tonight because it was so accurate. My partner immediately looked at me as if to say, wow, that's exactly what we've said. A friend recommended we invest in some selenite to place in and around the room, and we might do that. But I just wanted to share this story and see if anybody else can relate. This happened two years ago, sometime between September and November of 2019. My girlfriend, we'll call her Mary, and I drove up to Berkeley, California for the weekend, my hometown. I now live in Los Angeles. We went there to see some of my old friends. The day we arrived, we went straight to my oldest friend, we'll call him Paul's, dad's house, where my family spent every Christmas and Thanksgiving my whole childhood. His family is quite well off and has a large property at the top of Berkeley Hills with a full panoramic view of the Bay Area, Golden Gate Bridge, San Francisco skyline, etc. It's a pretty breathtaking view. It was probably about three or four in the afternoon as the sun was starting to dip but not yet setting. 
The three of us were sitting on his deck in the backyard, catching up, about to get in the hot tub with this gorgeous view. Now, for the sake of what happens next, I feel like I should describe the seating arrangement. I was sitting on a bench perpendicular to the bay, with Mary sitting to my right. I was facing Paul, who was sitting on a bench perpendicular to mine. We were just telling stories, making jokes, and laughing quite a bit, when out of nowhere, a rapid black rip sped between where Paul and I were sitting, making a loud tearing sound, and vanished from view as quickly as it had appeared. Initially, I thought I had hallucinated it, until realizing that Paul and Mary were equally stunned and shocked by what I had just seen. All of us were like, what the hell was that? And it became immediately clear that it was no hallucination, especially since we all quickly agreed on its description. Whatever it was, was long and black. I had thought for a moment that it was the largest bird I'd ever seen, but its speed was unlike anything I've ever witnessed. It was just rapid. We all looked in the direction that it seemed to be headed, but there was nothing where it should have been, despite being able to see for miles. It was present for what felt like a millisecond. Blink and you'd have missed it. We discussed it, each of us as bewildered as the next, and agreed that maybe it was like a hole in a pair of jeans ripping wide open. We all decided that it felt like a rip had sped between us and closed as soon as it had opened. There was no follow-up or evidence of the phenomenon, except for the certainty that we had all seen it happen. I don't know what this was, and I've never had any similar experiences, but to this day, the three of us all remember it vividly. I don't know if it was a rip in the Matrix or what, but I'd love to hear thoughts of what this could have been. Has anyone else ever had a similar experience? I think I had an experience with a skinwalker or its kin. I wonder how far their territory ranges. I lived in Phoenix for a couple of years at the turn of the century. I had two friends who grew up in Globe, a guy and a girl. She wanted to do a spell to make it rain. We went to a place on the Salt River. I don't know what it was called, but it had a parking lot, a pavilion, a bathroom and the river had concrete steps in it, like man-made rapids. The pavilion had a concrete dais in the middle of it, inlaid with a mosaic of a compass rose. We got there at about 9 p.m. or so, well after dark, only two cars in the parking lot, and they were dusty, no other people. While we were doing our spell, which was minimal, all three of us standing quietly, concentrating around a candle and incense, I heard a noise. It was men and women laughing in unison, then two voices speaking very quickly, but I couldn't understand the words. And then a canine howl. My hair stood on end. We all jerked our heads toward the parking lot and stood stock still for a minute but we didn't see anything or hear anything else. So we went back to concentrating. I didn't think the voices were weird in the moment. I figured the people that owned the cars had come back. I did think the howl was odd coupled with the voices, but I was thinking, cool, I got to hear a coyote. So after we finished the spell, we started wondering where the people were. And as we started talking, we realized that of the three of us, the girl had heard the speaking voices, the guy had heard the laughing, but I was the only one who had heard both, or the howl. When I told them what I'd heard, they both got really pale. Their whole demeanor changed to alarm, and they said, we have to get out of here right now. I said, okay, but I have to pee first. They were very upset by this, but the bathroom was right by us. I went, but they were banging on the door in total panic after I'd been in there 30 seconds. I thought they were being overly dramatic. 
So we made it to the car, and they're acting like we're in a horror movie. We left without further incident. After we got on the road, I asked them why they were so upset. They said that there were things that lived out there that I didn't want to know about. Apparently, people who live in Globe have to deal with this kind of thing a lot, based on more stories the guy told me about living there. He never mentioned the word skinwalker, though. I read about them later, and finally understood why they were so scared that night. Our family has a small cabin up north that we go to when the summers get too hot. Our cabin has four rooms and a loft. There's a kitchen area, a living area, two bedrooms, one bathroom, and the loft. The rooms are tiny and our family is big, so we're always bunking up and sleeping on air mattresses all over the place. This particular weekend was 4th of July and the whole family came up to the cabin. Once everybody got settled in and had lunch, we all wanted to go for a walk in the woods. It was a beautiful day and we all started to venture out. My nephew, who was four at the time, started to get a bit fussy and tired. So I took him back to the cabin with me for a short nap. I set up the air mattress up in the loft and I put him down for a nap. It was almost 1 p.m. and I figured he could nap for 30 or 40 minutes and then be ready to go back out and play afterwards. My nephew then wanted me to lay down next to him, so I did, and we both started to fall asleep. I finally woke up by the motion of the air mattress moving. I figured my nephew had maybe rolled over to the other side or something, but now I was awake and I could feel the sun on my face from the small window above. I glanced over to my nephew and he was fast asleep not facing me. I started to nod off again, but then I was woken up by the same motion of the air mattress moving. It's that sound, you know, the swooshing of the air. It felt like somebody had just sat down on the air mattress at my feet. So I look up and I see nothing. My nephew is still sleeping in the same spot. So then I just lay there, awake, and my eyes were still focused on the lower part of the air mattress, down by my feet, when all of a sudden, an area of the mattress started to depress, you know, like when someone had just sat down on it and made the indentation. I heard that same swooshing sound of a rush of air, and I screamed. My nephew woke up and I grabbed him, and we ran down the stairs and out the door. We waited outside until the rest of my family returned from their walk in the woods. And when I told the story, my sister-in-law told me that her mother had experienced paranormal stuff at the cabin for years. Thanks for letting us know. To this day, I still don't know and can't really explain what it was, but nothing like that has ever happened to me since. I don't know about the rest of the family though. My husband at the time and I had been married about a year when one of his friends told us that they were buying a house. Their rental house would be available and the rent was very reasonable. His wife's parents knew the owner of the house and he was fine with us moving in. We said yes, since we were happy to leave our small apartment. My husband told me that the house was pretty nice. He and his friend's band practiced there all the time. Weird stuff started happening right away. I worked and went to school during the day, while my husband was a working musician, so he was gone until very late. I woke up in bed one night, and I heard the front screen door spring squeak open. Oh, my husband's home, I thought. He put the key in the lock, opened the door, and quietly let the screen door shut. I was still in bed as I heard him walking across the living room, so I called out hello to him 
and told him he doesn't need to be quiet because I'm awake. He didn't answer, so I called out again. The house was quiet. I looked at my cat, who was in bed with me, and she was on high alert, sitting straight up, eyes wide, staring at the bedroom door. I don't know how long we hid out in the bedroom, but some time later the screen opened again, and it was all louder. The door unlocked, and it was my husband this time. These events happened quite a few times, but sometimes it was just footsteps. There were often crashing sounds in the house, like a broom handle hitting the floor. Cabinet doors would be opened, and small appliances would be turned on for no good reason. We started unplugging everything when we weren't using it to avoid this. Guests, and later roommates, also experienced the same things. The house had a reputation with the neighbors, who called it Tragedy House. Once I was sitting at the table in the kitchen, and a tall black thing flew from the wall behind me on my left, through the kitchen, and out the outside wall. It happened in just a second, but I remember thinking it had to hit that wall. But it didn't, it just went straight through it. The house's owner, our landlord, told me that his wife had died while they were on vacation years earlier. She fell down some stairs, leaving him with three small children. He said that she loved this house. He would always say, I can still feel her here when I come in. You and me both, buddy. You and me both. I was never sure whether I should believe in the paranormal or not. Sure, I'd heard strange noises home alone at night, or felt the energy in the house shift to something more sinister in a matter of seconds. But what I experienced in August of 2021 convinced me. It's taken a long time to process what I had experienced. I've mostly tried to pretend that it didn't happen. And to be honest, I really wish it hadn't. For context, last August, I had moved into the guest bedroom in our basement. I'm 15, and having the entire basement to myself for most of the day and all night was awesome. I immediately began to regret my decision, though, as I discovered how unsettling the energy in my basement is. It's really hard to explain, but it just feels off, especially at night. I was literally always on edge whenever I was down there. Sleeping was quite difficult, as I was never really calm. I often felt an overwhelming presence watching over me, and I was really hating my decision. But I knew my mom would be upset if I changed my mind so soon, so I endured the hell I was living in. I quickly need to describe the layout of my basement so you can understand where everything is taking place. Once you enter my basement, there's a large living area. Attached to that is a hallway that leads to where I've been sleeping. So I woke up at around one to two in the morning to the sounds of about four voices in the living area of the basement. I could never actually make out what they were talking about, maybe because I had just woken up but I'm pretty sure they were speaking in another language or maybe very broken English. As I was listening to the voices, I heard quiet footsteps approaching my door. The only way that I was sure they were footsteps was because the floor in our basement, especially in the hallway, is very creaky. I pulled the covers over my head and shut my eyes. I fell asleep almost immediately and nothing else happened that night. I've also felt people touch me in the basement, but usually those experiences are comforting. I usually believe that to be my father who passed away in 2015, as I've only felt those when I'm sad or angry. Still paranormal, but unrelated to the experience I just told you about. Either way, that experience in the basement terrified me. 
and I'm still not sure how to explain it. This isn't my story, but it's something that happened to my parents just a bit ago. They live in western New York, upstate, and are really open to all kinds of supernatural stuff. My dad has reason to believe in aliens for reasons other than this encounter, but that's a story for another day. It might be a good time to add here that my parents do not use drugs or alcohol, and they're very sharp as far as memory, cognizance, and intuition go. I'm going to copy and paste a message that my mom sent me and just read it for you, if that's okay. I just figured I'd put some feelers out there and see if anybody else has experienced something similar or has any sort of explanation. Quote, Last weekend, we were coming back from Jamestown. Dad and I saw a frickin' UFO or something. Between Randolph and Steenberg, there was this huge, really bright light blinking on and off in the sky directly in front of us, and it was falling from the sky, except it was shooting directly downward. I thought it was a falling star at first, but after it blinked repeatedly, I thought, that is not a falling star. And even though I thought that it might have been a plane, I knew that it was too bright and going too fast to be one. Plus, as far as I know, planes don't make a habit of going straight down. Then, all of a sudden, it was gone. Like, mid-sky. And I thought, well, it must have gone behind a hill or a mountain or into the trees. So, right then, I said, did you see that? And Dad goes, what the F was that? He said that he was thinking the same things that I was. And at the same time, we both noticed... There are no hills. There is no mountain. There's nothing for this thing to go behind. It was just cornfields and open space. This thing just disappeared. Next thing you know, it was directly behind us, mid-sky, and it shot directly upward, back up into the sky. I was looking out my rearview mirror, and it lit up the whole sky, like an aura all around but the brightness of it was still really bright white. Dad was turned around watching it, and it started following us. We had that same eerie feeling we had when we saw the Bigfoot that one time, and we were saying, what the F is that? All of a sudden, it just disappeared. They have no idea what it was that they experienced, and yes, they do also have a Bigfoot sighting, but that's a story for another day as well. Either way, they've been trying to figure out what in the world they saw, so I thought I'd share their story and see if anybody else had any ideas. I believe that I have seen gnomes on more than one account. It's been well over a year since I last saw a gnome. I have epilepsy, so I'm never entirely sure if it's just my brain fabricating things, but I have also never hallucinated due to seizures that I know of. That all being said, I once went to a psychic who did Akashic record readings. She told me that I was closely connected to earth spirits. I made no mention to her about seeing gnomes because, well, that makes you sound absolutely bonkers. For a short period of time, my ex and I lived in his belated grandfather's house. The property was teeming with Japanese maples and native plants. He also kept an orchid room. One day, while taking a shower, I heard the bathroom door move, and I saw a drably dressed little old man about a foot and a half tall run through the bathroom and climb out the open window. It scared the absolute crap out of me. I let out a yelp. My ex came running in, and so as not to be taken for even more medical testing than I've already been through, when he asked me what happened, I told him that I had just slipped. 
Another thing I once saw might have been a troll, but I'm unsure. I have no idea what it was. Maybe one of you could enlighten me. I'd been doing a lot of meditating, about three hours or so, and I headed into my bedroom to change for the gym. I opened my closet, and there was a three and a half to four foot naked, wrinkly, elf troll type thing. I gasped and backed up, and it disappeared. Since both sightings mentioned here, I have had more than one CT scan, MRIs, etc. My seizures were a result of head trauma that happened well after what I'll refer to as the troll incident. There are other times that I've seen them, as well as one childhood encounter with my belated noni, and a few encounters with my grandfather who died when I was four. Again, my brain has been scanned a lot in multiple ways, and nothing abnormal has ever been found, other than some white spots from chronic migraine, and those popped up super recently. I have even been evaluated by a neuropsychologist. No one has ever diagnosed me with anything other than seizures related to the head trauma, but, like I said, that happened after I started seeing these things. I'm not really sure what it is I'm seeing, I just thought it was interesting. I want to share a few things that have happened to me since moving to the land down under. I moved to Australia in 2018, built a home with my partner in far north Queensland. The area where we built is part of the Daintree Rainforest. We are surrounded by rainforest and the Coral Sea is about 50 meters through the dense bush. Things were relatively quiet, until about five weeks ago. Now, we are seeing Min Min lights, or spook lights. Little balls of light that are far too big and bright to be glow bugs, moving through the trees and about the property. We hear booms and bangs against the outside walls of our newly built home. We grab a flashlight and go out to see what's going on. The noise is so loud that if it had been a bird or a bat, the poor thing would have broken a neck or at least stunned itself. The property is fenced in, gated, and locked. There are no rocks or clouds of dirt on the concrete, nothing on the sides of our house as if kids were pulling a prank. It literally sounded like hands banging against the walls. We get up to go see, then come back in, get back in bed, and it happens again. It's like it's toying with us, being mischievous, the locals and aboriginals have told me about Yowie, which is similar to the United States version of Bigfoot. They've also told me about Bunyip and other dreamtime creatures that reside in and make the Dane Tree their home. It is one of the oldest rainforests on the planet. We are surrounded by the beauty of nature, and now it's like every night is a new adventure. We don't know what might happen next. Nothing happens inside the home just on the property. I've done research online and at the local library. Can't find anything other than the occasional Yowie sighting. I've gotten in touch with a few ghost hunting teams and asked my questions. I'm waiting for a response to see if they might know anything. My partner's sister said that we may have built our home on a grave site, but I doubt this. Not everything is built on a grave site. It may just be the land itself. I know the Dane Tree is very special to the Aboriginal. It's sacred, in fact. Why is it that when things like this happen, I never have my cell phone in hand? It's like I'm so caught up in the moment, all I can do is experience it. But I'm going to try to capture something on film. I'd really like to know what's going on. I really hesitate to call this a skinwalker encounter, 
but I call it that because I really can't think of another creature that fits the description. So, here we go. A while ago, when I was in early high school, I was left alone at home for some reason. I can't remember the reason, but I was left home alone quite a lot after reaching my teenage years. So a little info on my house is that, although I don't live in a rural area, I certainly wouldn't call the area civilized. There are barns within walking distance of my house. I guess the area is developing because there are also subdivisions around. Also, my house has a sliding glass door that leads to a deck in the back. So I was home alone when I heard a knock at the door. It's common for my parents to sometimes leave the house without their house keys. So sometimes I would have to let them in when they got back. My family has a special knock that we use so whoever's inside knows that it's one of us. This knock didn't sound like one of my family, so I just ignored it because I didn't want to deal with some stranger at the door. Whoever it was knocked again in a more familiar pattern. So reluctantly, I went to the door. When I got there, I didn't notice anyone out front. I figured that whoever it was just left because I took my sweet time getting to the door. Then I guess I heard a sound or something coming from the back sliding glass door. Another thing members of my family do is that if nobody answers the door, they'll try to find another way in, such as the back door. So I went to the back door and didn't notice anyone out there either. I slightly opened the sliding door and I heard a voice. It sounded like my mother, but it was coming from underneath the deck. The only reason I say that is because I definitely heard that voice, but my mother wasn't in view of me. Under the deck is the only place she could have been. I can't remember exactly what the voice said, but it was something like, open the door, and it said my name. Now I'm a super paranoid guy, and I know that my mom wouldn't be hiding if she wanted to come inside. So I shut the door, pulled the blinds over, and went to my room. Hours later, and my mom actually shows up, and I tell her what happened. She confirmed that she was not at the house earlier and did not try to get me to open the door. So for years, I didn't really know what to make of this experience. It was a very minor thing, but it spooked the heck out of me. I say it was probably a skinwalker because I don't know any other paranormal entities that would mimic a person's voice to try to lure you outside your house. But what do you think? This is one of the many things that I have never told to anyone before, because I'm pretty sure that nobody would have believed me, thinking that my imagination was just wild, and sometimes I still doubt that anybody will believe me. But I remember this happening for real, so I wanted to share. This thing happened to me in the past when I was around nine, and I always used to hang out with my oldest cousin, who was seven back then. We were pretty inseparable at the time, before everything changed when he turned 18. I was spending the night at my granny's house, as I used to be her personal dog sitter, and he decided to come hang out with me. He suggested that it was a good idea to go into the nearest forest, which was almost right next to her house. We were living in a medium-sized city, but the forest is almost always near buildings at some parts or areas. Around 10 or 11 p.m., we decided just to walk to the edge of the forest, since it would have been completely foolish to go deep into the forest that late. I told him that that would be a good idea, since we were both kind of bored and feeling adventurous. We headed out and just started to walk toward the edge of the forest, both up for having a small adventure. But that didn't even last a half hour before the weird things started to happen. I remember when I was standing against a big tree and looking just in front of me, my cousin was near my side, like six or seven inches away from me. I was looking in front of me and I felt like I was searching for something. I'm still unclear of what exactly it was, but I was just looking. All of a sudden, I saw red eyes staring at me from out of nowhere, but they were really far from us. 
I turned toward my cousin and asked if he was seeing what I was, but he ignored my question. So I turned back to look at the eyes and they were much closer than before. I blinked a few times, but of course I couldn't see anything around them and they weren't getting closer. I just saw trees. I turned back to him and asked the same question, but he kept ignoring me. So I turned one last time to look at them to see that they were even closer and closer. I just kept watching them, feeling a little bit afraid at this moment. And I swear that they started to come toward me, even when I didn't look away. So I just grabbed his hand and ran as quickly as I could until we saw the street lamps. After that, I've never seen or experienced the same thing ever again. The weirdest thing in hindsight is that I never heard it getting closer. I never heard anything at all. Even if it had been like a wolf or a dog or something like that, I would have heard rustling or branches or something. But there was just nothing. It's been 16 years since this happened, and it has always stayed with me. I'm currently visiting York, Maine for a family reunion. We're renting a house about a mile from the Nubble Lighthouse, if anyone cares to look up the location. This house has a wraparound porch with a front door and a side door right before the porch ends and the stairs lead to the backyard. The side door has a very recognizable sound. It almost sounds like somebody passing gas. We joked about it the first night there. The front door creaks like any other old door and slams on the frame. You can hear the wood, then the rubber liner on the door squeeze shut against the frame. Anyway, the first night we got settled in, we all went up to bed around midnight. It's a three bedroom house with very thin walls. You can hear conversations happening in the kitchen from the upstairs bedrooms and every floorboard creaks with any movement. My mom and dad went up to bed first, followed by my brother, my girlfriend and I followed about 15 minutes later. The other night I'm upstairs in my room waiting for my girlfriend to get out of the bathroom. I hear a creak and a slam from downstairs and the vibration through the house of a door hitting the frame. At first I thought it was my dad coming in from a smoke, but I listened and I could hear him snoring in his bedroom. Once my girlfriend got back, I asked her if she dropped anything. She said that she hadn't, but she thought I had fallen off the bed or something because the noise was so loud and shook the house. Kind of creepy, but I didn't think much of it again until last night. Around 12.30 to one in the morning, the same door creak and slam noise occurred at roughly the same time. And after this second time, keeping me wide awake, I decided to ask the rest of my family if they were up and about in the middle of the night. My parents deny walking around downstairs, and my brother then tells me he's been sleeping with his light on every night, since the very first, because he would hear soft footsteps and feel a presence standing at the back of his room. We're going to have a quieter evening tonight and keep an ear to the downstairs area before bed to see if we hear anything else. I'm also considering laying in my brother's room in the dark to see if I hear or feel anything out of the ordinary. If anybody has any experience with this and may know how to stimulate more action, please let me know. I love paranormal things, but up to this point in my life, this is the closest I've ever been to experiencing any. I wish I had more to the story, but this is what we've been going through so far. I went for a casual night walk in the woods with my friend. We were walking along the path, 
along the river and talking. Then we decided to stop for a while and sit on a bench that was right there next to the path facing the forest. The river was flowing behind us. We were sitting there for quite a while, just talking about random things. I suddenly started to hear a soft tinkling, like a small bell ringing, almost like a bicycle bell or a dog's leash, every now and then. I didn't pay much attention to it at first, but it kept getting closer and more frequent. So I told my friend about it. He confirmed that he could hear it too, so I started to listen a bit more closely. I looked in the direction that it was coming from, expecting to see somebody riding a bicycle or walking a dog at any second. That wouldn't be too unusual, as we used to go there quite often, and even in the middle of the night, we would come across a few people going on a walk with their dog. The moon was shining brightly, so I could see a silhouette if there was a person coming toward us, but I could only hear the ringing, getting closer and more frequent. Out of nowhere, my gut told me that we should leave, so I told my friend and we started to walk away. I walked a little faster than usual, as I was a bit creeped out already, and after a while of not hearing a thing, it suddenly ringed about two meters away from us. We both just started running. We could hear it ring close behind us a few more times, and then it suddenly stopped. We could hear that we were getting away from it. When we got back to the city, we talked about it, and we realized we both heard it from different sides. I had clearly heard it coming from the left, but he heard it coming from the right. So how did we hear it coming from different directions? Only when it got close to us, and we started running, could we hear it coming from the same place. The worst thing about it all is that both of us could hear it, so it couldn't be my imagination. That and I got that weird gut feeling of danger that I've never experienced before or since. My grandma is from Olancho, Honduras. In the old days, the only way to reach her area was through plane because there were no roads and it was very unsafe to travel by car. At the time, my grandma was fighting for my grandfather's love with another woman. Of course, my grandmother won and had four kids and many grandchildren. Remember this. Fast forward and I'm 14 years old staying at my grandmother's apartment. The reason being, we were going to drive to Florida. It was going to be me, my little brother, my mother, my aunt, and her friend. But I was staying at my grandmother's until we left in the morning. I was sleeping in the living room. I had to go to the bathroom, so I put my pants on. With that mission accomplished, I looked for the light switch on the exit door of the apartment. For some reason, I couldn't see it, even though it wasn't dark at all. The living room was just dimly lit. You could see everything in perfect clarity, but for some reason, there was no switch. So I turned my head toward the left, where there was a hallway toward the bathroom. I walked toward the switch, but before I do, I see a black figure. Not a shadow, but a completely black hooded figure, just standing there. I was thinking that my eyes were just adjusting after waking up, so I walked toward the switch, but as soon as I did, the figure walked toward me. I got scared and walked faster toward the switch, and the figure began to walk faster as well. I thought that if I turned on the light, it would go away, so I get to the switch and turn it on. The figure was in my face for a split second after I turned the lights on. I didn't say anything to anybody, because I just knew that nobody would believe me. Fast forward to the next day on the road to Florida. We all played songs and told stories, and one story that my aunt told us revealed everything. Apparently, she met with a palm reader from El Salvador. She said that the palm reader told her her future and something from our family's past. Apparently, when my grandmother was fighting with the other woman to win my grandfather's love, the other woman went to her mother who happened to be a voodoo priestess and put a curse on my family. She went on to repeat what the woman had told her about the curse. 
quote, your family will be haunted by a voodoo god. It is a black figure with no face. It will not harm you, but it will let you know that it's there. I freaked out. I said BS and I told her to tell me she was lying. Then I told them what I had seen the night before. The rest of the drive was pretty quiet after that. A couple of years after this, my brother saw the same figure on my bed. But that's another story for another day. When I was younger, in about the fourth grade, I lived in Germany. My father was in the military, so we lived on the military base, and that is where I met my best friend at the time. Let's just call her MK. MK and I's parents noticed that we would always play together and we would have playdates. Eventually, MK and I brought our families together and we would all hang out. MK had two older sisters and a little brother, while I have an older and a younger brother. MK and her family lived off base in the local part of Germany, so they lived amongst the non-English speaking, well, German people. Of course, the house MK lived in was old, really old. I would stay the night over there all the time. One night, for some reason that I can't remember, MK and I decided to sleep on the floor in the bedroom that she shared with the second oldest sister. Let's call her B. B was in the room with the oldest sister and let MK and I have the other bedroom to ourselves. So anyway, this night, we're sleeping on the floor a few feet away from their beds. I remember waking up in the middle of the night to the only light coming from the hallway. The door was open. My vision was blurry and kind of kept going in and out. I remember looking up at MK's bed and on it, there sat a woman. I knew she was from the older times because she wore all black and she had one of those bulky dresses and a black veil over her face. The way she was sitting, her peripheral vision would have been toward me. She sat up straight, both legs together, hands in her lap, as though she was in church. I guess she felt me look at her because she slowly started turning her head toward me. I remember at that moment that I wasn't scared, but everything felt sad. The energy was sad. Her face looked sad. She already looked as if she was at a funeral. Anyway, as soon as her face got all the way around to look at me, my vision went black, and the next thing I remember is waking up in the morning. I told MK and her sister about it, but I think they didn't want to believe me. I also think, though, that something told them I wasn't joking. I went back over there a few more times because that woman, although creepy, didn't make me feel unsafe. And to this day, I've always wondered what her story was. So my husband and I have been living in this house for 10 months now, and I don't believe this house has anything wrong with it. The previous owners seemed to be of the lazy sort. The house seems fine, but for some odd reason, every so often, the back garage door will find itself flung open, even though it's locked. Given the state of the property when we found it, we thought they just didn't do basic maintenance and we figured it was something we could fix. When the lock was intact, we were truly freaked out because we thought somebody had broken into our house. But upon further inspection, nothing was missing from the garage and the door leading into the house was still locked and intact. Hmm. So over the course of time, this would happen several more times, nothing being tampered with that we could see and no one being found. But ever since tonight, I've been on high alert and kind of paranoid. I recently had major surgery, 
So I had some specific pain meds prescribed to me, which sit beside my bed on a table. I had about 10 left, and I hadn't been taking them the past couple of days. I wanted to get off of them as soon as possible. My husband was about to give me one for pain that night though, but looked at me and asked me if I had been taking them because there were only two left. Today, the back garage door was open again. Now, there's a panel to the attic in my garage and one outside my bedroom. Every time we inspect the back garage door after finding it open, it is always still locked, which you can only do from the inside of course. We literally body check the doors to make sure that it catches and that the wind isn't the culprit behind it flying open. I honestly never find anything out of place, but then again I haven't really been paying attention to things like that since I didn't really have a real reason to suspect anything was tampered with before. It's just my husband and I, and I know he didn't take my meds. I've always joked with my husband that somebody could be up there since we watch a lot of crazy shows about things like that. But now I don't know if I'm being paranoid or if that's a legitimate possibility. We probably would have thought it was potentially something paranormal, but the medication going missing? I mean, what ghost needs pain meds? And how is that garage door still coming open? I've always been so fascinated with the paranormal, but I had never had any experiences. I'm from the Midwest, and one of the only things to do there is just to drive around and see the countryside. My friends and I did this aimlessly, and we had an obsession with cemeteries. We went to every cemetery we came across, and we found some absolute gems. One on a hill in a grassy field, where the stones are not even visible aside from brushing the grass apart beneath your feet, another back in the woods with no markers across an old bridge, just all kinds of spooky and quirky cemeteries. We had looked up local area haunted locations before, but no major sites that we could stomp around at, and we never experienced anything. We later go to college, and we still see each other on the weekends every other week or so. We always wanted to find one specific cemetery that was known to be haunted, but the location was kept a secret. My buddy's friends at college actually found it and went, and it turns out that they have to list the cemetery in county directories. That's how he found it. Anyway, he tells us that he can take us there, so we go. We went at sunset and tried asking questions and recording and so on. This goes on for some time into the night. We take it very unseriously, but we still wanted to encounter something. One of my friends puts his cigarette out on a tombstone to elicit a response. Yes, it was stupid and wildly disrespectful, and we were childish. We asked another question and waited. It was dead silent, and then we hear the leaves crunching, step by step, from the darkness toward us. It sounds like somebody stops right in front of us, but we see nothing. We wait there, silently frozen. And then we heard the most blood curdling scream I have ever heard. We were in a bit of shock. The whole event still seems like I made it up in my mind when I reflect back on it because it was so otherworldly. We slowly began walking and then eventually running as fast as we could toward the car, without a word between us. I still wonder if what we heard was a big cat or something, but where I live, those are pretty much unheard of. I have never heard anything like that scream to this day. We all still remember it, so I know I didn't make it up, and it gives me chills just thinking about it.
off, I'm first off, I'm currently 51 years old, and this still bothers me to this day. I have quite a few stories throughout my life to share, but this is the first. I was living in a new state, which I had never been to before. This was in the era where our parents told us to go out and play and be back at dinner time. I was nine years old in 1979, and we had just moved to Dallas, Texas. I was playing outside by myself, and I was approached by another young girl. She seemed normal and asked to play with me. I was okay with it. She asked if I wanted to see her playroom. I didn't see any reason not to, and I followed her. Mind you, we lived in a townhouse that looked like row houses, so we went into her townhouse, and I never saw anyone in the house, just the two of us. The townhouse looked normal enough. We went upstairs and into a bedroom that looked like a little girl's room. She walked up to the wall and pushed a panel, which opened. She crawled in, and stupid me, I followed. Inside was this amazing room full of toys and a little black kitten she was holding. I was so taken by all that was in front of me, and I was just excited to play. We played for a bit. However, in the secret room, there were no windows or natural lighting. I couldn't tell what time it was. Eventually, I felt uncomfortable, like I needed to get home. So I told her I had to go. Mind you, never once asking for her name or telling her mine. But she turned to me with dark eyes and asked me by name if I really wanted to go because it was fun here in the room. I was creeped out because I know I didn't tell her my name. I crawled out and she followed me. I just kept moving down the stairs to the door, trying to avoid looking back. But once I opened the door, I did look back. And to me, she looked like part girl and part skeleton. So I ran home as it was dusk and I knew I was going to get in trouble. I didn't say anything about it to my mom. I went about my evening and slept like normal. But the next day, I was disturbed by it and I decided to go back and see if she was still there. When I walked down to the town home, it was boarded up like there'd been a fire there. I stood back and looked at it for a while, knowing that I had been in there yesterday and it looked normal. I never saw or heard anything about that little girl again. I wish I had told someone who could have found out if she ever lived there. To this day, I can see that hidden playroom like it was yesterday, and I have no explanation. I live in upstate New York, and my town has a wooded area that's known to be haunted. We have something in there that all the locals call the werewolf. No one knows what it really is, and bigger animals like wolves and bears don't really live in the area. We just have deer and other smaller animals. But a few of my friends and I have experienced it before, and all our experiences have been practically identical. I don't think it's flesh and blood, but it's huge and darker than dark. As in, when it's pitch black outside, you can still see its outline. My last experience with it was two years ago. It was during the summer, and a friend and I decided to take a walk through the woods. We didn't leave early enough though, and by the time the sun had set, we still had about a half a mile walk out of the area. The closer we got to the tree line, noises started picking up. First it was twigs breaking behind us. Then it sounded like a huge branch had been ripped off a tree and thrown. My friend and I stopped and turned around, and we saw what looked to be a massive black shadow move behind a tree. My friend screamed and took off, so of course I followed. After running down the little embankment to the tree line, we stopped to catch our breath, and I turned on my phone flashlight so we could see properly. My friend opened her mouth to say something, but then twigs started snapping around us again. She grabbed my arm, and we both stopped breathing practically, probably out of fear. 
The snapping twig sounds kept getting closer and closer, so I shined the light into the trees. I saw, dead on, a black mass or shadow move to the right out of the beam of light. And then we heard a low, guttural growl just a few feet behind us. We both screamed and started sprinting, finally getting out of the woods. We ran to her car and jumped in, slamming the doors shut, gasping for air. We looked behind us to see if anything had followed, but we didn't see anything, thankfully. That's it, really. But all the stories I know of people who have experienced the werewolf all say practically the same thing. It's a massive shadow that stalks you. You can hear and see it trailing you. It growls and it chases you to the tree line where it then seemingly backs off. Could it be a wolf or a bear? Sure, I guess. But I've lived here my entire life. And in almost three decades, my town has never once sighted a wolf or bear in the area. So, who knows? My dad works for a contracting company in St. Louis, Missouri. The building's interior is exactly the same as it was in the 1960s. All except for the dust and deterioration, the actual date of construction is 1910. It's only a five-story tall building. It's nothing immensely big. It was previously used as a law firm, but when the firm left, they decided not to take anything with them. There were tons of law books, paintings, desks, etc. But the basement. Back in 1960, they started to renovate it, but never finished. So the basement is an extremely dilapidated 1910s, paint falling off, broken glass ridden, rusting freight elevator, deadly tetanus infested nail cesspit. But my dad and I went in there anyway. Keep this in mind. My dad coaches boxing as a hobby, and he's huge, all muscle. He's fought all his life, and even he is scared of that basement. Every time we go down there, something is different. The first time I remember going down there, the plaster on the walls of a hallway had fallen, and I mean all of it. The whole hallway was stripped down to its bare structure. I assumed, of course, it was because of the renovation, but my dad said, What's all this shit? It wasn't here before. So we go down the hallway, and yeah, in and of itself, it's nothing really special. But there was a metal chair in the middle of this dark hallway, and for whatever reason, it just freaked me out. My dad turned on the lights, and they worked for a second, but then they all busted. Some of them just fizzled out, probably because of how old they were. So down the hall, there was a boiler room, it contained this rubberized trench coat, rubberized to avoid stains, and a bowling ball bag. Inside the bowling ball bag was a cleaver with what I assume was a deer bone handle. After that, we left. A few weeks later, we came back down and all the plaster on the floor was gone. We went to the end of the hallway and the boiler room door was closed. Maybe we closed it, but I don't remember doing that at all. It doesn't seem like our priority would have been to close that door when we were getting out of there. By the way, nobody has the key to the building except my dad. He and I are the only ones to enter the building, ever. At the end, there was a T-shaped intersection. On the wall, there were three identical pictures of the same exact priest with a deadpan expression. His eyes were glazed over like he was possessed or couldn't see or something. We came back after a few months, near Christmas. We only made it down the steps and immediately left. There was a Christmas tree, little lights blinking, and a Santa Claus doll with the most indescribably creepy grin I've ever seen in my life. Something was definitely going on in that basement. I'm 
a scout leader in Ireland, and my friend group are all outdoorsy people, so I've done my fair share of outdoor adventures. One time, we were away, camping down on a site in Roscommon. There were about four of us in a dome tent that night, and each one of us heard rustling and moving around outside our tent during the night. We were all scared shitless and didn't mention it to each other until the next morning over breakfast with the others from our group. It wasn't until then that the two others in the other tents spoke up about hearing rustling right outside of their tents as well and something rubbing along their tent wall. Well, we were all convinced that it had to be a wild animal since there were no other people on our site. We had two nights left. It wasn't our first or our last time there. We've stayed there roughly around 15 times, give or take. And while I believe there are wild deer around, I've never seen them in person. Not once. There are always people down there on the site where we stay. So surely, wild animals would stay clear of that area and wouldn't come right up to the tent walls, right? Another time, while wild camping near Glindalo, several of us in a tent woke up several times to the sound of the zipper on our tent door. It wasn't just a small zipper noise. It was as if the exterior door were being fully zipped open or closed. There were two tents, so two groups, but we all decided to kip in together because of how cold it was. So it was nobody from our group joking with us. It could easily have been another group, but while wild camping, the chances of another person or group being close to you are slim. Once we looked around and knew that the door, to our knowledge, hadn't been zipped, and that we weren't in immediate danger, we chose to ignore it. It happened a few times that night. You kind of learn, while camping, to ignore weird noises and movements outdoors. Most nights spent camping, you don't get much sleep, really. You're always conscious of being in the wilderness, and so exposed. It might not be the creepiest of stories, most of our weird camping or hiking experiences have happened abroad, to be fair. But all the same, it still hasn't put us off camping or being outdoors. Even if we can't be sure what's out there. In the fall of August 2013, I was set to begin my first semester at Arizona State University in Tempe, and I had to attend an orientation in the middle of campus. After making the 30-minute drive earlier than anticipated, my grandma pulled into the parking lot of the First United Methodist Church where we exchanged conversation for about 15 minutes to kill time. There was a gardener in front of us tending the flowers, and only one black sedan parked directly next to us that I hadn't noticed earlier when we pulled in. As we unceremoniously prepared to get out of the car, something caught my grandma's eye in her periphery as she reached for her seatbelt button in the direction of my passenger seat. She quickly gasped, placing her right hand on her chest as she chuckled and then quipped, Wow, I thought I saw a ghost. Looking directly at her without turning as she let out another nervous chuckle, I asked her what the hell she was talking about. The parking lot at this point was dead silent, and the gardener was busy tending the flowers in the building opposite the church. Not expecting much, I slowly and nervously turned to my right, where the four-door black sedan was parked to the right of us, only to come in direct eye contact with what appeared to be a woman of Asian heritage, with a bob haircut and a pinstripe suit business attire, staring at us for no discernible reason. 
With the dead stare she was giving us, it could be assumed that she'd been staring for longer than we had noticed her. What made this individual terrifying was the lack of life in her eyes. I only looked for what felt like five seconds, but could feel that glassy, uncanny valley, lights are on but nobody's home kind of corpse appearance. The color of this entity's skin was a pale color that I could only associate with a corpse at the time. Her mouth moved slowly and developed into one of the most unsettling half-smiles I've ever seen as her dead eyes looked at my grandma and I, unwavering. In this deafening silence, my grandma and I turned back to each other, chuckled uncomfortably, and slowly got out of the car, refusing to look at the terrifying entity or the person in the car next to us. While my grandma claims that she forgot about this incident, she believes it probably did happen whenever I tell her about it. If anybody can help me with identifying this type of entity, or if you've seen something similar, I would really be appreciative. I know that certain areas of Tempe are haunted, and the campus as well, but I couldn't find any information on an incident like this. This is a story about a house I lived in a year ago near my IT campus in the west of Ireland, which I believe was haunted. To begin, before living there, I was always pretty skeptical of haunted houses, and for good reason. As a teenager, we would often visit haunted houses in our locality, which never proved to be so, at least while we were present there. A few days after moving into our new college house for our final year of college, my friends and I went out to do some shopping and get food. Upon arriving back, we noticed that someone had left the oven on. We each denied it, but we knew that someone had to have left it on because it was on. Looking back, this was probably the first unexplained incident, as thinking about it, nobody even had food to put in the oven. Over the following few weeks, we started to notice odd things happening. Creaks, groans, and movements from out the corner of our eyes. At this point, two of the housemates were convinced of a haunting. However, myself and another were still not so convinced. It was soon only me that was left unconvinced, as one day while the other non-believer was home doing study, they looked up to see a face peering at them before vanishing. It finally clicked for me when I woke up one night just before Christmas to see a very large man, or what I believed to be a man, staring at me from my wardrobe. Then things started to get really strange. Boot prints started to appear on the ceiling, making tracks across the roof by the year's end. And one of my friend's girlfriends swore she saw him upstairs in the room when he'd been downstairs with me all along. Our shower, for which there are three switches that you need to turn it on, would come on in the middle of the night. And one room off the kitchen would send shivers down our spines any time we went in there. There was one night in particular which really scared me. I always locked my door before going to bed, and I distinctly remember doing this that night. When I awoke in the night, I could see the large man again, this time at the end of my bed. I shut my eyes telling myself it was just a dream, and went back to sleep. The next morning my door was wide open, and so were all the doors in my wardrobe and the guys had told me it sounded like I was dragging my school bag from one end of the room to the other all night. So many other things happened in that house, but this has gone on long enough. I just decided to tell this story after telling a Galway person about living in the estate without saying which house I lived in, and he told me of a creepy haunted house at the back of the estate, which a family he knew had moved out of a few years prior. When I told him what number it was and how I knew, he almost fell out of his chair. At least I know I'm not alone. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting. We all got out of the house unscathed, but it really made believers out of all of us.
This just happened yesterday, so it's fresh in my mind. I'm not quite sure what to think of it, because it was just so bizarre and unbelievable. Maybe I was just sleep deprived. So last night at maybe 2300, I was walking around my block. My town is relatively safe, so I didn't feel in danger. Plus, it was a pretty night. I had been walking for around five minutes when a pale woman with blonde hair and a white dress caught my eye from across the street. She was about my height and looked to be around my age, too. I didn't actually pay attention to her after I first noticed her. While I circled the block again, she was on the same street, a couple of feet in front of me. She was standing on the curb, staring at the cars passing by. It was a main road, so even that late, people were still driving on it. I said hello to her and she turned her gaze toward me. I couldn't see her face super well, but from what I think I saw, she had no pupils, no color in her eyes. She just stared at me. After a while, I asked if she was okay. She didn't respond and simply pointed at the road. I was really confused and I didn't understand. Right then, a red car started coming down the road. She stepped into the road and the car slammed into her. It was a bloody mess. The driver immediately stopped and jumped out. It was a man in his mid-twenties. We both spoke about it, freaking out. He called the police and I went around the car to see the state of the girl. But once I circled around the car, she was gone. Not as in dead, gone, as in she wasn't there at all. The blood on the road was gone too, but not gone from his car. After the police arrived, they concluded that it was some kind of big hoax. A hoax by some kid who didn't know what they were talking about and some guy who just went along with it. The blood on the truck was brought into investigation, only to be found as paint. Nothing else was put up about it. I'm still not sure if what happened was real. It felt so real, but I don't believe in the paranormal. I don't know what it was. Was it some kind of waking dream? I remember it like it was a real event. I feel like I can't leave the house now. I don't understand anything, and I kind of feel like I'm going crazy. Has anyone else experienced anything like this? This just might be one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me. My family and I had just moved into a little house, nothing too fancy. We'd only been living there for a few weeks when paranormal things started happening as soon as we entered the attic. It was like we disturbed the demon or spirit when we went in there. Everyone who went up there had a bad feeling about it. At first, I was the only one who realized what was happening. I remember me laying in bed everything a silent stone. I was peacefully watching TV, and then I heard whispering in my closet, which was right in front of me. As I laid there, paralyzed, I remember thinking to myself that I could get up and slowly check. Keep in mind, I was only seven or eight. As I sat there negotiating with myself, I finally was persuaded to go and check. It sounded like at least five people whispering. But as soon as I opened the closet door, nobody was there. The only thing there was all my clothes, but they were swaying back and forth. And it couldn't have been the wind or anything like that, because I checked if the closet doors had made a little wind and the clothes didn't move. This went on every night for about two weeks. Then my family started to catch on. My grandma had been staying at the house visiting and had to sleep in my room with the dog. The next morning, my grandma tells me that my dog was growling at the closet all night and that something evil was in there. After that, the whispers stopped, but the weird noises, things being out of place, and things like that didn't quit. After a while, we got used to it, but that's when things just got worse. 
This one night, I had to take a shower, and I went to bed as usual. No whispers or anything, I just went straight to sleep. The next morning, I woke up with three scratches down my stomach. I thought it was the dog at first, but this is the weird part. My mom and grandma both described it as if it looked like something went inside me and scratched me from the inside out. At seven or eight years old, I got a little freaked out by that. After that occurred, we blessed the house, but things just didn't stop. My mom and I rode our bikes to the store, and when we got back, we saw a little girl standing in our backyard. So we searched for her, thinking she was lost or something, but we found nothing. Our yard was fenced in, too, so I'm not sure how a little girl would have gotten there. Then after that, things stopped. I mean, we would occasionally get a few things here or there, but nothing too serious. A few years passed, and we eventually moved out. I don't know what it was. A demon? A lost spirit? I'm just glad I don't have to deal with it anymore. My first ever encounter was when I was around seven and my family was all around the table. I will never forget the order we sat in, nor what happened. My mother sat in front of me while my sister was beside me. Father was next to mom and my back was turned to the kitchen. My brother sat next to my mom in front of my sister, a family of five. We were eating and then the window straight across from my dad at the right of my direction shone with a very bright light. Everyone seemed frozen, but my mom and I. My mom told me to run, run and hide. My mind was blanked out and I didn't think at all. I just got up and ran to my mother's room where I felt my mind was telling me would be the safest place. Once I entered my mom's room, I went straight to her king size bed with a huge light underneath. There was nothing under my mom's bed because she kept everything in bins at the foot of her bed and closet. The foot of my mother's bed was facing the door while the head was against a wall next to two big windows. Then it was her closet across from where you were laying so you could see it. Then the bathroom was right next to that. Once I got under the bed, I saw that the light was still on. I looked through the cracks and it was quiet. And then I saw about six sets of feet that were not human. Then I felt them start to surround me. One almost touched me by getting on the bed and reaching down through the crack. There were two through the crack, three in front, not showing their faces, but trying to reach further under. One was at the foot of the bed. Then I looked near me and saw a face that was gray and had huge eyes. I felt like I couldn't move, but when I looked closer, I saw a whole galaxy in its eyes. It was so pretty how the colors merged like a sunset, and for a second I almost forgot it was an eye. Then it moved or flinched and I came to my senses. I looked around and they were still moving to get me, while the one that I looked at was staying still and looking at the closet. Then I heard the closet door opened, and I saw Nega. Nega was my childhood imaginary friend that taught me the greater lessons than what is now being slowly forgotten. After seeing her, I relaxed and I saw them try to fight. And then the tall, gray-like humanoids were gone. I looked at Nega and then I looked at the bathroom to see another creature that had orange eyes that I know commonly stays in my mother's bathroom. Nega hushed me and then I seemed to have forgotten what had happened until I turned 14. After this, I just carried on with life. I never saw my imaginary friend again, but old friend still lingers from time to time in my memories. We were on our trip to Yellowstone from California. We were a group of seven adults. We took a flight to fly to Salt Lake City, Utah, and then we drove up to Henry Lake, Idaho, where we had booked a cabin. 
We reached the cabin at about 5 p.m. on the first day. This was a huge cabin with a living room, kitchen, one master bedroom, and a dining room downstairs, with a set of stairs on either side to go upstairs. Also, there was an entrance into the kitchen as well as the landing outside the master bedroom from outside, apart from the main entrance that ended up in the living room. There were about four bedrooms and three bathrooms upstairs, a very old and rustic looking cabin. We didn't feel anything bad during that entire evening. However, the nighttime did feel very eerie. My husband and I slept in one of the bedrooms. One of the couples used the master bedroom downstairs and another took the master bedroom upstairs that was farther down the hallway from our room. The only single guy in the group took the bedroom next to us. So on our first night there, we all went to our respective rooms at about 11 p.m. since we had plans to leave early for Yellowstone the next day. My husband and I both fell asleep as soon as we hit the bed. I don't know what time it was, but I suddenly woke up with a scream. At the same time, my husband woke up with a scream too. While I do have nightmares and have in the past where I would cry in my sleep, it was the first time that I had ever screamed, and I don't remember having any dreams or nightmares that night. My husband has never had nightmares, so it was unusual for him to wake up that night too. The guy in the next room was on the phone talking to somebody. He heard our screams and came in to check on us. We assured him we were okay. Again, we all went to bed, but I kept having weird feelings throughout the night, and I was completely unable to sleep until I saw the sunlight coming through the window. We all woke up at around 9 a.m., and we were discussing the incident. The other two couples were unaware of it, but they did mention hearing random footsteps throughout the night, thinking that we were up walking around. We were there for five days, and we didn't experience any other events for the rest of the stay. But the cabin gave out significant negative energy, and not a single one of us wants to stay there again. We would leave as early in the morning as we could, and come back late at night, just to sleep. We haven't had any other experiences like that ever again. A few friends of mine were into exploring abandoned places and checking locations out. Whether it's a rundown shack in the middle of nowhere or an abandoned building, we were always eager to take a look around. To be clear, we don't vandalize or destroy property, we just go take a look. One day, I find out that one of the cemeteries in my area is apparently haunted. It borders on an old abandoned mental hospital, and the cemetery was the burial ground for some of the unfortunates who died at that place. The asylum is 150 years old, and it was a horrible place for those who were housed there. All up, there were four of us. After 20 minutes of driving, we get out and search for the cemetery. After about 10 to 15 minutes of looking on maps and walking up and down the neighborhood, we finally came across the cemetery's entrance. It was around 11 p.m. when we got to the cemetery. It was very quiet, barely any cars on the street, and all I could hear was the distant dogs yapping about. All four of us start heading into the cemetery. We're taking this slow and using our eyes and ears to catch anything suspicious. As we're walking, I hear a faint laugh coming from the trees below. It sounded like a child. I first wrote it off as a dog barking in the distance or just something explainable. As we continue down the track farther, I hear the child laughter again. I turn to my friend, who turns to me, and we both just stare at each other. We both heard the same thing coming from the woods below and were just spooked. But that didn't stop us. We pushed on, going farther into the cemetery and toward the trees. We eventually ended up getting too scared and decided to turn around and walk back. I was positioned with another friend of mine, 
about two meters behind my other buddies. All of a sudden, I can hear heavy footsteps walking toward us to our right. I'm not kidding when I say this. These footsteps just started picking up pace, and we could hear these loud, thumping steps just galloping at us. We panicked like crazy because we were looking directly toward this sound and nobody was there. It was too loud to be some kind of critter, and it definitely wasn't another person. I'm older now, and I no longer explore urban places or abandoned places. It's too risky, and I don't want to get fined. But I still can't find a logical explanation for whatever it was that we experienced that night. In our next story, Redditor Starry Alpha 2099 tells the story of the children they saw in the woods. At least, that's what they appeared to be. Here's the tale. When I was around 12 years old, I was at my cousin's house for a party. I'm pretty sure that it was around Christmas time. We were hanging out in their backyard and woods. Part of their backyard is a wooded area. And we came to this tree that used to have a treehouse in it. All that's left of that treehouse is some steps leading to it and a few platforms. It's not safe to get up on there, even if you can. My cousin, who was an eight-year-old boy at the time, told us this story about how the kids who had that treehouse had died when it collapsed. I personally thought it was a bunch of BS, but I just went along with it. We eventually headed back to the house, but I decided to go back into the woods alone. As I was walking into the woods, I felt a strange sense of calm wash over me, like I was safe there, safer than anywhere else. As I'm walking, I'm looking around and I see a light blue and white checkered flag. It was up in a super thin tree that I hadn't noticed before. As I'm looking at this and trying to figure out how it got there, I started to hear kids' voices, laughing, talking, just having fun. I didn't think too much of it at the time, as my cousins were out in the treehouse, a, a new one that they had built, not the run-down one. As I'm walking closer to the old treehouse, the voices seem louder, and I look back up at the flag. It was billowing, despite there not being any wind. I shook it off as I couldn't feel wind from down there, but figured that maybe up where they were, there was a little. And that's when I saw them. Six children with white skin. Like snow white skin. Almost glowing. They all seemed to be wearing winter gear, though dull and dirty looking. They were walking toward me, but I didn't run. I wasn't afraid for some reason. I heard a branch snap and that's when I ran. As I went back toward my cousin's house, I was surprised to see that they weren't outside. I found them in the living room playing video games. When I asked them when they came in, they said, when you were walking in the woods, why? The kids I had heard weren't them. I still don't know to this day who those kids were. They weren't other neighbor kids. None of them lived close to my cousins. Were they just a figment of my imagination? Whoever it is, whatever they were, that incident is one of the reasons that I believe. Most people would be thrilled to move out of a haunted house. But for Reddit user Kate the Girl Who Dreams, moving out of her haunted house was different. Here's her story. So my boyfriend and I had been living in this house for a few years. He had gone overseas for a little while and then returned. A few months later, and we started to pack our bags for the move into a new place. When we finished packing up the boxes and clothes, 
My boyfriend did something I didn't expect him to do. He put his hands together and thanked the ghosts for helping us and then said his goodbyes before leaving the room. He said he felt sad and it would have been a lie if I had said I didn't feel the same way. For years, activity in that house had rather frightened him. It upset him as well, and a few times it was so bad that he cursed at them within the room as activity occurred, which is why his last action in that room surprised me. I felt that they had been heavily misunderstood, the spirits or whatever. Throughout the years, they had told me a lot about themselves. I had gathered a lot of EVPs and photos from the house. It was a love-hate relationship with them. At times, they would warn me of somebody around me. I don't really know if it was because I was the only tenant who was constantly there and who actually spoke to and got anything on them. One time, I was at work, and a customer said that he saw something like a little boy next to me. I started to recall the little boy entity who was in the house I lived in. I did a spirit box session later, and I asked if one of them had followed me to work. The little boy's voice actually responded and said, Yes, only me. I get that it was scary for some, but moving away from the haunted house was also something that felt rather saddening and freeing at the same time. It's nice in the new place. The first day and nothing paranormal had happened, a rather quiet night of sleep. It feels nice, and yet strange at the same time. Oddly lonely, but it's something my boyfriend and I will get used to. The only thing is, my boyfriend brought a piece of jewelry that one of the entities really liked with us, so we'll see how that turns out. But for now, it's quiet and peaceful, bittersweet, but still a nice change from everything that was going on before. Time for newer and better things. A change of scenery. I live in northeastern America, in a pretty rural place with lots of hills, not too many neighbors, and a lot of forest. Just tonight, I was headed with my mother down our backyard, which is large and relatively clear for about a hundred feet. Then it switches to woods. We got to about 30 feet before the woods and I caught sight of some eyes reflecting in my headlamp. They were a good 50 to 100 feet away and I assumed that they belonged to deer. But a few things convinced me that they might not be. Around where I live, Deer will run away if you make enough noise. And we were talking pretty loudly. But the eyes weren't moving. They kept staring directly at us, which is incredibly unlike deer in this area. On top of that, the pair of eyes on the right were very low to the ground and very wide set, too far apart to be deer considering the distance. We stood for a minute remarking on them and neither pair of eyes looked away. So, since we were spooked, we headed back up to the house, got my brother and a machete, and a bat, and a metal pole. I know, a little overkill, but our area has been a little scary lately. We headed back down. I expected the eyes to be gone by that point. I mean, that's how these things usually go, right? But no, they were still there, in slightly different spots than they had been, but not much farther from where they'd been previously. They stared just as steadily as they had before, so we retreated back inside. The logical answer is deer, but the lack of running away, intense staring, and wide set eyes feel like that option is ruled out. Another thought is wild dogs, but we don't really have those in our area. It's possible it could have been a black bear, but those are notoriously scared of people. If anyone has thoughts on what this might have been, let me know. Edit. As an update, just to provide more information. 
There were no visible signs of anything in the area as far as I could tell. The next day I looked for marks on the trees from climbing and saw none. There's a good amount of greenery covering the ground, so it's difficult to look for scat. But there were no signs of any animals having lied down on the ground. We've still been unable to find any evidence that it was something natural. When I was about 13, I was staying with a friend in the Colorado Rockies, the foothills, in January. While we were at his buddy's house, I walked to get food from a nearby gas station. On a small, windy country road, a car took a turn too fast, skidded on the ice, and rolled over in my direction. I was lucky that there were woods right to the side, and the dense trees saved me from the vehicle. As I ran away, I looked back, and I could only see his arm dangling limply out of the broken driver's side window. I was scared, and I still get shivers about it today. I think the person ended up dying just minutes later from the injuries. But for three days after that, I had strange dreams. They were very short, just small details. The feeling of grass, the moon, and a name. I only remember the last name now, Alton. On the fourth night, I had gone to bed early in an effort to get some sleep. I ended up drifting off at about 10 p.m., according to my friend's family. I heard a noise and woke up, but when I opened my eyes, I was laying right in front of a grave with the name Alton on it. It was a small village cemetery surrounded by pine trees. I would say it was less than 900 square feet. Despite it being mid-January in the mountains, there was no snow past the gate and in the cemetery. I was very cold, though, and scared. I managed to locate a fire watchtower where they drove me back to my friend's house. This was no dream. I woke up in a cemetery and got taken back home. According to them, they went to check on how I was doing at about 1 a.m. and I wasn't in bed. Their home security said that I had left their back porch at 12.40 in the morning. When the park rangers picked me up, it was almost 3 a.m. I explained my story to my friends and family, and they told me that there was no cemetery behind their house. I told them what the area looked like, and they said that they had a clearing like that, but it didn't have any graves. They offered to take a look if I would lead them, but I was too shaken. I also remember there being a small gate in this fence. But before I went back home, that gate was gone, and it was just a solid fence. I don't know what happened, but I'd really love some answers, because it's been bugging me recently, so I decided to share my story. So the other night, my boyfriend, daughter, who's three and a half, and I were walking in the cemetery a few blocks from our house. We drove because we wanted maximum walking time with the toddler. We planned to play Pokemon Go. We entered through the main entrance, and after a few steps, I started feeling nauseous and worried. Anxious. I didn't know why, so I just ignored it. We wanted to check out the huge headstones toward the middle, so we headed that way. We noticed a car parked with its lights off, no front license plate, passenger and back doors wide open, and the man is halfway in the back seat. He's parked on one side of the big headstones, which ended up being priests. We walked through and the guy noticed us. He closed the doors that were open then went around to the driver's side and got in the car. He sat there and just watched us. So we veered away from him and went down a different path. 
My daughter all of a sudden says, they're so loud. I said, who? My daughter goes, the rocks, they're talking to me. My mouth drops open. We didn't tell her anything about the cemetery or headstones or what the place even is. She has no idea what they are other than big rocks. We ended up leaving, and as soon as we drove away, my nausea eased up. I told my boyfriend about feeling sick, and he freaked out and explained EMF to me. Creepy. We went to the store and passed the cemetery on the way home again. The man's car was still there. He left after we pulled down the street that we lived on. We've had one other paranormal experience with her before. This was the second time that the afterlife, ghosts, spirits, something, showed up to say that it exists, and it's confirmed for me. Later that night, she started talking about the rocks again and said that they were watching us. I asked her what they looked like, and she said, shadows. She said they looked like this, and then proceeded to make a worried expression. She told me that they couldn't walk with us and that they had to stay by the rocks. I don't know if the spirits were warning us about that man, or maybe there's just something not so good at that cemetery. But either way, it was a really interesting experience. Just this weekend, my cousins from the city in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, visited me and my family down here in southern Pennsylvania, near Maryland. We live in the boondocks, and there are many trails for people who enjoy horseback riding and taking rides on ATVs. When my cousins got to my house, we decided to go exploring toward my neighbor's house, who lives in the middle of the woods, isolated in a log cabin. We walked a trail the whole way up there for about a mile, joking along the way. Let me give you a little backstory about the place. Back in the 1800s, there was a bar and a few small cabins for people to stay in. A group of men got drunk one night and attempted to shoot bottles off of each other's heads. People died and the wives of the men who had died burned down the bar and the cabins then were later hanged by the bar owners. This happened right below where we were exploring. Legend says that the women and the people who died in the fires still lurk around the forest. Another incident took place in the 80s or 90s. A teen was driving really fast with his friend at that exact same location as where the bar incident took place. The teen crashed into a tree, beheading his friend believing him alive. The teen was tried for manslaughter as he was driving drunk. This place is destined for bad luck. So we're exploring on this trail, approaching the house. As we approached, we heard a very distant whistle, but we thought nothing of it. As it is spring and it was warm on this day, so there were birds around. But when we stopped to take a break, we heard twigs snap. We all froze as a giant branch fell, and then the tree. It was a dead tree that was easy to push down. I looked behind and saw a human figure. As it set in with my brain, I realized that it was a man in ripped, ragged overalls that had no more color and a worn out, colorless plaid flannel. He looked no older than 40. He looked at us for a while and then ran at us with a bat-like stick while laughing like a maniac. We ran the other way until we got cut off by an electrical fence. Then we turned the other way. By this time, we were way off trail and in the middle of the woods. But I knew that all I had to do was go down to get back on trail. By the time we got the trail, we lost him. He looked real enough to us. But whether he was a spirit or a real person, we're never going back up there again. I 
I guess this story is a little boring, but it just happened to me, so here you go. I was rock climbing with two other guys in Colorado and was belaying one of them when the two of us on the ground heard something weird. The commands we use to communicate that we are safe at the top of a route are, name the guy on the ground, off belay, which prompts the belayer to unclip the rope from his belay device so the climber can pull slack out of the rope. The response to that command is, name of the guy at the top of the route, belay off. The climber was approximately 40 meters up on an about 50 meter route. I didn't know this at the time. The rope stopped moving, which isn't uncommon when someone is having a hard time with a move or is setting up an anchor, which is what we thought was going on. But then we heard it. A voice that sounded way closer to the ground, like close enough that we could have had a shouting conversation and way farther left off route of where the climber should have been, said, my name, off belay. I looked at the other guy in our climbing party who was just as confused as I was. He said to me, what the F was that? And we discussed where the climber should be at this time and that we shouldn't be able to hear him that well. The rope still wasn't moving, but I decided to keep him on belay. I figured it would be best to keep him safe and just feed slack through my belay device in the event that it wasn't him. Turns out it wasn't. A few moments later, the rope starts moving again, later followed by a faint syllable counted, my name off belay, that sounded way more like it should have. We didn't really think anything of it, but we had been traveling down the wall and hit a few routes without seeing anyone. We also had a friend just a few months ago that got burned in on a route when someone took him off belay when he wasn't safe. I remember seeing a video of a hiker or rancher or something walking down the road when he hears the voice of a woman calling him off the road. The guy stops to figure out what's going on, then just gets out of there because of how weird it was. I'm starting to wonder if there's a cryptid that can mimic the voice of a certain person. We're not entirely sure what happened, but we know two things. Number one, it's a really good idea that I didn't listen to that first voice. And second, it wasn't a person. About five years ago, my wife and I got into a pretty big argument right after our son was first born. We were all heading to the pharmacy that morning, but both of us being immature decided to go separately. I had the day off, so I brought my son with me. It was only about a quarter of a mile up the street from my house, so we planned on walking. Well, I left a little late and I didn't see my wife in the house prior to me leaving because of us avoiding each other. And when I got about a minute from there, I see my wife turn the corner, so I'm kind of not looking at her. But then when we pass, we both kind of mean mugged each other and didn't say a word. I go in, I get my script and I get home. Well, she's laying on the couch in her pajamas and not even getting ready for work. So I tapped her and I said, what the heck, you're not getting ready for work. Why did you change out of your clothes? Are you not going to work now? And she was like, what are you talking about? I've been laying here in my pajamas. I'm just gonna go get my script and a few things that I was gonna get later. I was like, you didn't go to the pharmacy earlier? I just walked past you like 10 to 15 minutes ago when you were leaving. You gave me that evil dirty look so I gave you the same one in return. She starts saying that I'm crazy and must have been hallucinating and what did I take? I totally didn't believe her. I thought she was just gaslighting me, trying to make me feel like I was losing my mind. But later that night when we were cooled down, we all went to Walmart together to get her scripts and a few of the things that she needed. I literally felt like I was in the twilight zone. I kept saying like, come on, Jill, quit messing with me. 
She swore up and down and actually started getting a little irritated that I kept pressing her about it. Ultimately, I believe her that she had never left the house. It was one of the weirdest experiences that I've ever had. After I believed her that it really wasn't her, things started sticking out to me, like the look she gave me and how things about her face just were a little off. Even when she's mad at me, the look that she gives me is never that evil. And that's exactly what this look was, just evil. Like even at resting neutrality, this face would have been full of evil and hatred. It was just like that. But still at the time, we locked eyes and I was totally convinced it was my wife. I still have no idea what happened. This is an experience I had that I can't really explain. This occurred in the summer of 2010. My stepdad has an old hunting cabin out in Pennsylvania. It's like a 10 minute drive outside of Cook's Forest. It's a small place with a common area and kitchen and a single bedroom with two bunk beds and a queen size bed. My mom, stepdad and I stayed at the cabin for a weekend to get rid of all the trash that other family members had left there and to do any repairs. There are other cabins nearby, but this weekend there was nobody else at the cabins within a half mile. There were also no street lights or even cell service. This is quite literally off the beaten path in the middle of the forest. We came up Friday, worked all day Saturday and left on Sunday. Saturday evening after dinner and a bonfire, everything is pitch black outside. No bugs chirping, dead quiet, which is relatively normal. At least most of the time, it's pretty quiet at night. We decide to head in. My stepdad and I are inside reading while my mom steps out to have a smoke and check to make sure that the fire has burned down to a safe level. I'm mid page down in my book and I hear my mom yelp pretty loudly. Now I'm used to hearing her make this yelp. She's done it when she has seen a snake or gets a bug in her hair. So I didn't really think much of it. She comes in limping though. And she says, someone threw a rock at me. Immediately, my stepdad grabs his gun and runs outside, hoping to catch whoever did it. I was in shock not sure of what to think. I'm sitting with my mom while my stepdad makes laps around the cabin. He fired a few warning shots at the backstop we have set up on the back of the property to scare off whoever was around. We never saw anybody run off or even make a noise. When we go up, we always make jokes about Bigfoot now. And to be clear, there were no cabins on the road near us that had people staying at them. So I have no idea who would have been lurking in the woods in a pitch black forest just to mess around with people. They would have had nowhere to go, nowhere to stay, no transportation. It just makes no sense. Did we run into Bigfoot? Maybe. But as of now, I don't know. My grandmother would always tell me about knocking that she would hear either a few days before or moments before somebody close to her would pass away. It would usually be around three knocks in no particular place. She said that she would sometimes hear it at the back door, behind the wall, or coming from outside. My grandmother had always kind of had this weird gift to see and experience things that were I guess paranormal for lack of a better word. She would always tell me her experiences and me being not the bravest person on earth would get so scared I wouldn't be able to sleep well for days. 
I always thought the knocks were interesting whenever she told me about them, because not long after, it usually happened. Someone would die, or she would complain for days that she wasn't sleeping. Then the knocks would happen, as well as other weird things. I was very open to the idea of these knocks, due to the fact that evidently people sometimes passed away after, and I believed that things like that could happen. Last year, the three knocks happened to me. It was a Friday morning, and that entire week, my grandmother's sister, Sari, was fighting COVID in a hospital. Sari was the second closest thing to a grandmother for me, so I had a great love for her. I wouldn't say we were close, but there was that grandmotherly love that she had always given me. When I woke up, I was still between that state of being very sleepy, but also fully aware of my surroundings, as I wasn't asleep. I know that I had my back to the door of my room when I heard three faint but audible knocks on my door. I opened my mouth to say, yes, and then it hit me like a train that I heard absolutely nobody walk to the door or open any of the doors we had in the hallway. And trust me when I say I have the loudest family, so I should have heard someone or something. My body froze and a chill went right down my back. For a good minute, I was too terrified to move. I laid in bed for a while to listen if anybody would maybe walk away or open the door to confirm that it was indeed one of my family members, but nothing, just silence after that. I even thought maybe it was my brother trying to scare me, but long story short, exactly three days later after I heard the three knocks, my grandmother's sister, sorry, passed away in the morning. The whole experience freaked me out and I still struggled to comprehend what happened, but it did. There's probably a logical explanation, but the fact that she died a while after really scared me, and it made me think about what my grandmother had always told me. Four years after my dad died, I was going through an amicable divorce, or at least it seemed so at the time. I was actually happier than I had been in a decade, and I was looking forward to the future. One morning, I woke up, grabbed my cell phone off the charger, and walked toward the kitchen. Just as I was going to swipe my phone open, a phone call was coming through, but all it said was incoming call. It didn't show a name or a number. I was already mid-swipe, so the call was answered. I put it to my ear and said, Hello? The reply, Hey girl, was my dad's voice. It sounded like my dad was far away. I was completely taken off guard, but at the same time I was cool and calm. I said, Daddy? He said, Yes, I don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to make sure you're okay. I said, I'm fine, are you okay? And he said he was. Then he said, I have to go now. I'll call again, I love you. I said, okay daddy, I love you too. I'll talk to you later. He said, bye. And then silence. I took the phone away from my ear and it had gone back to the home screen. When I looked in the call log, the call didn't appear. I couldn't figure it out, and I thought about it constantly. A week later, my soon-to-be ex came into my house and started kicking things and ranting. I tried to close my bedroom door to shut him off from us, but he shoved it open and hurt my hand. I grabbed my phone and called the police, and so he quickly left. He never came back after that night, but I was on high alert after that and finally installed an alarm just in case he ever decided to break in. The day after my ex did that, I told my mom about the call from dad the week before and about my ex coming into the house the past night. She said that my dad had never trusted my ex and always thought that he had done something on purpose years before that hurt me, even though at the time I thought it had been an accident. My dad had never said a word to me about his feelings toward my then husband, 
so this was news to me. The best we could speculate was that my dad was worried that my ex was going to hurt me, so somehow from the other side, he called to check on me. It was just weird that we never acknowledged the elephant in the room, like, hey, you're dead, or hey, I think your ex is a sneaky, dangerous person who wishes to harm you. I guess if my dad ever calls again, I'll know there may be something he wants me to know. So I plan on asking more questions instead of being so dumbfounded by a phone call from a dead person. Reddit user Jerry111165 moved into a house 20 years ago. Little did he know, it had one extra occupant. Here's his story. 20 or so years ago, when our three girls were three little girls, two, four, and six, we lived in a house in Massachusetts. We shared a driveway into the woods with a neighbor, a good guy. He told us that before we moved in, a little girl that had lived in her wheelchair had somewhat recently died from leukemia. I couldn't even imagine. Those poor parents. We lived there for seven years. After we had been there a year or two, we started having occurrences late at night, between midnight and 2.30 in the morning. The two older girls shared a bedroom and slept in a bunk bed that I had made. My oldest was in the top bunk. My youngest had her own room. So late at night when the house was dead quiet, the girls' toys would start playing by themselves. Some would light up. Some would make whatever noises the kids' toys do. This started happening a lot, and man, it freaked my wife and me out. We'd be sleeping, and suddenly the kids' toys would start moving around and playing sounds by themselves. We just knew that it was the little girl who had died from leukemia. She just wanted to play, and she did come back and play. Our house was way off the road. Very long, dark driveway. No one came out there, and especially not at night. One night, I was home alone, and somebody knocked at the front door. I didn't think anything of it, and I ran to answer the door. When I got to the top of the stairs, just a few feet from the door, I stopped. I just knew that there was nobody there. My hair stood up. It really scared me. The toys playing by themselves went on for several months. One night, we woke up to my oldest daughter shrieking. Her bunk bed was tall, so when she was sleeping on her back, it was kind of close to the ceiling. I mean, kind of. You know what I mean. She was screaming bloody murder. I think she was probably around six years old. She had woken up and said that a little girl was floating inches above her head, right up against the ceiling, looking down on her. She just wanted to play. This is a story that happened to me 18 years ago. When I was seven years old, I lived in a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. Both of my parents worked in the mornings and the school year had just ended, so I was home alone. From the kitchen window, I saw something strange in the trees, a creature of sorts. Two things I know for sure. Number one, this wasn't a little kid's hallucination. And number two, I know exactly what it looked like. This creature was about the size of a smart car and sitting about 15 feet up in the tree. It had proportions similar to a gargoyle, both in shape and posture. You know, how gargoyles sit hunched over with their back legs wider and their front arms or legs close together or touching, just without the wings. No skin was shown. The creature had short bear-like fur 
mixed with owl-like feathers. The head was massive, the shape of a bear head, and possibly a large beak. The only features I'm not totally clear on are some of the features of the face, because I was so fixated on the eyes of this beast. They were huge, like the size of basketballs, and the odd thing was that they were blurry looking, like a dripping oil painting. It was early summer morning, early enough to still be cool out, but late enough to be clearly lit everywhere. I saw the creature out the kitchen window, ran onto the porch, got a better look at it, and I wasn't about to go and check it out just yet. I was still about 50 yards out. I went in to grab my father's binoculars. When I got back to the front porch, the creature was gone, nowhere to be seen. So me, being a brave seven-year-old boy, went out to inspect the area that I'd seen it in. Upon arrival, I saw nothing. No broken branches or markings or anything. The one thing I do remember about the area that was different was that it was dead silent in a forest that's normally bursting with noise. There was not a single thing to be heard. The forest where I used to live was super loud too, with all sorts of animals making sounds at all times of the day and night. But it was dead silent. Super weird. I've never heard of any sort of cryptid that matches what I saw that day, and for 18 years I've been insanely curious. I'm not sure if anybody has anything that could lead me in the right direction, but if you do, I'd be grateful. Tonight, August 4th of 2019, at around 10.15, my aunt and I were on the porch when my aunt saw something in the sky. It was like an outline of a circle, and part of it was gone, kind of like how an eclipsed moon would look at first. We noted that this was not where the moon usually is. Usually it's behind our house. So eclipse and moon were ruled out. The thing was bright yellow, and had an orange-red tint to it. It almost looked like a fireball. It's night, and the sun is on the other side of the planet at this minute, so wasn't that either. We thought it was a shooting star at first, but it wasn't moving anywhere. It started, like, flattening out, like spreading. Then it started to shrink into a smaller form, and kind of looked like a star. Then all of a sudden, it disappeared. A few minutes later, it suddenly reappeared and got bigger and bigger. It looked as if the moon would have been over the sun and coming off of it, moving toward the way it came in the first time. The light around it kind of spread out again. Then suddenly, it started getting smaller, like the dark part of the eclipse was going back over. Then it split into two and completely disappeared. We waited to see if it would come back but it didn't come back for the third time. I started doing some research and found nothing for solar or lunar eclipses that described what we saw. No meteor showers, no eclipses even happened in our area, no comets, nothing of the sort for that night. After doing some more searching, two other people saw almost the same thing three days ago around the same time. My aunt stepped back outside and called me over, fast. There was what looked to be a pretty low plane flying with two large wings. My aunt says it looked like it had four wings, two on either side, and I'm telling you this thing was big. One side was bright red and the other was bright green. Planes in our area normally have a small light that flickers on both sides. It wasn't like this at all. This plane was coming from the same area that we had seen these mystery light things in. And when the plane got behind our house, I ran to look at it and I couldn't see it at all. It was big, like I said. It shouldn't have been out of view already. My aunt and I have been trying to come up with a logical explanation, but nothing makes any sense. 
I don't want to claim aliens, but I don't know what else it could have been. Even though this happened a long time ago, my memory of this event is very crisp. I remember it extremely vividly, just because of how odd and traumatic it was. A couple of years ago, my family, which consisted of my dad, my mom, my little brother, my uncle and aunt, and their two children, as well as my other uncle and his wife, were at church on a Sunday afternoon. It was just a regular Sunday mass, not anything special. What I remember happening was that all of a sudden we left in the middle of the service. We were walking out and going to the parking lot, and I remember that my aunt was hysterical. She was crying and hugging my dad. My dad was almost in tears as well. I was around seven at the time, so I was really just puzzled and confused. But eventually I forgot about it and went on with my day. Years pass and the topic comes up at a family gathering. What really happened that day still creeps me out, and how my family just talks about it now, as if it wasn't such a weird thing to have experienced, is totally beyond me. Anyway, on that Sunday, my family was leaning on one of the walls of the building, facing the priest who was giving a lecture. It was really busy that day, and there weren't any seats left. About 30 minutes into Mass, my aunt notices a guy who looks almost identical to my deceased uncle in the crowd. She is stunned, and elbows my dad to show him what she's looking at. The man she was pointing at was fortunate enough to have gotten a seat, and he was in one of the rows on a bench, just sitting there. As my dad is staring at this guy, he's puzzled and in complete shock. The guy looks up at my dad, makes eye contact, and smiles, and then he just looks back at the priest who's giving the lecture. My dad freaks out, and so does my aunt, who noticed that the guy was an exact copy of my deceased uncle. The guy all of a sudden gets up, excuses himself from the people that he has to cross in front of in order to get out, and walks out and exit. As soon as he does, my other uncle walks on after him, in an attempt to catch up and apologize for creeping him out. My uncle claims he followed him up to the exit where he turned a corner and completely lost him, out of sight. Now, that's already weird, but my uncle also claims that he noticed a scar on the man's left forearm that he knew for a fact my deceased uncle had. It happened in a firework accident when he was little. Ever since then, they never saw the guy again. Some family members of ours have claimed that they've seen somebody who looks exactly like my dead uncle but who knows if it's the same guy they saw that day. Maybe it was just some random dude, or maybe it was my uncle's last attempt at saying goodbye to his siblings. Who really knows? Either way, it's a story I'll never forget. This is the first time I think I've encountered something related to the paranormal. If anybody can help me understand what this might have been, please tell me. Before I start my unexplained encounter, I would like to say that I live in a duplex with my roommate and friend who goes to college with me. The duplex isn't that big, and neither is the attic. It's small enough to where an average-sized person would have trouble even crawling through it. I also have one camera on the front window, and one on the back. So on January 24th, I had suddenly been awoken, at about 4.30 in the morning. I checked my phone. I usually wake up about 7 or 8 a.m. so I can get to work on time. At first I didn't really understand why I was awake, so I decided to just try and fall asleep again. But after a few seconds, I heard what sounded like very loud footsteps walking above me. I was too afraid to get out of bed, so I just laid there. My first thought was that it must have been an illusion, but now I know this isn't true. 
When I suddenly woke up a few hours later, I went out to eat breakfast with my roommate. We asked how each other's sleep was and I decided to bring up the fact that I had heard something at about 4.30. He responded by saying he had heard something at exactly 4.34 in the morning. At this point, we were a little bit freaked out, so we decided to open the hatch into the attic. Like I said before, there was really no way anybody could fit up there because it's just too small. We decided to look at the camera footage but there were no signs of any motion or anything out of the ordinary, other than just leaves blowing around. Our only thought was that somebody had come from one of the sides of the house and climbed onto the roof for some reason. I asked my neighbors if they had seen anything, and they said no, so that kind of eliminated one side. But I also knew that it wasn't the other side, due to the fact that we sleep on that side and would most likely wake up easily if there was a disturbance. Now we're stuck, believing that it's something paranormal. Since then, we haven't heard a noise, but it's only been a few days as I'm writing the story. And before anybody says anything, it is not an animal. We know what those sound like. These are footsteps. But like I said, it's pretty much impossible that somebody with footsteps, physical anyway, could be walking around up there. Anyway. If you have any ideas as to what it might be, let me know. I've been reading a lot of people's posts and missing the spirit world a bit, so I thought I'd tell you my ghostly experience from my childhood home. When I was 10, my parents moved the family into a house that was about 80 to 90 years old. The house was built in the 1920s. As a teenager, when I was home alone, I would hear footsteps walking around downstairs at night. I would always hear the faint sound of that 1920s to 1930s party music. Honestly, it was kind of calming to me. I would see people out of the corner of my eyes when walking around, and I always felt like somebody else was there. However, it wasn't a malicious feeling. Except one time, but that's another story for another day. My parents ended up living in this house for about 20 years. I moved out about six years ago. This story, though, happened in 2015. I was in the attic with my boyfriend, now husband, it was a big walk-in attic. It's the shape of a square, with the chimney going right through the middle. The stairs are broken up by a landing. I was on the west side of the attic with my husband behind the chimney, meaning there was no way that the shadow was caused by either of us. We were looking for some wrapping paper for the Mother's Day presents we had gotten our moms. All of a sudden, I hear something walking up the stairs I thought it was the dog since we left the door open. So I look over and I see the full shadow of a human being on the wall of the stair landing. I'm just standing in awe that whoever this is just showed themselves to me. And I tapped my husband to see if he saw it too. He did, and right after he did, it disappeared. I never saw it again, but I always felt and knew that it was there. I'm thinking that this ghost might have decided to show themselves to us since we were moving out right after this happened. Maybe as a little goodbye. I haven't experienced much paranormal activity since I moved across the country, and honestly I really miss ghosts and the comfort that they brought me. Anyway, I hope you enjoy your day, and you can make of this story what you want. I live alone, unless you want to include my cat, and then I live with a cat. I have a house with an attic conversion, but since it's just me, it's basically an empty room. I think the previous tenant had used it as a bedroom. Obviously, when I first moved in, I did go up there just to have a snoop around. 
there are two light switches for the room, one at the bottom of the stairs and one that is a long string that you pull which is right in the middle of the room. There's a door at the top of the stairs that I always keep shut. I close every door behind me. An open door really bugs me. After living in this house for about three months, I noticed that the door was open and the light was on. I could see the light on the wall opposite the door. No big deal. I obviously forgot to shut the door and turn off the light, so I go and do that. About two weeks on, I arrive home from work. It's early January and it's dark out. I can see the window to the room from outside, and I can see that the light is on. My first thought is, ugh, I've been robbed. I barge into my home, quickly sweep the first two floors expecting to find someone, but there's no one there. Ah, they must still be up there, I thought. So I fly up the stairs, and the door is shut, but the light is still on. I swing the door open, and nothing. I will say that I'm very skeptical about stories when I hear feeling of dread or felt I was being watched, but I had both of those. I had this horrific feeling that I really wasn't alone up there, but it's a simple empty box of a room. I try my best to shrug it off, I turn the light off and I shut the door. I've been living there nearly seven months now, and since that day, I get the same feeling when I walk past the stairs to the attic. Day or night, the light is on at least twice a week, but now it switches itself off after a while. Recently, I've started hearing very loud bumps coming from the attic, which is right above my bedroom. The first time I heard it, I naturally assumed that somebody was trying to get in through the attic window, so I ran up there, but nothing. Lastly, my cat, who is very tiny and during the night stays downstairs, refuses to go up there and has actually done the whole arched back hissing thing at the door. It could be because he's just out of sorts, but given the situation and the fact that he never hisses at anything ever, it really freaks me out. So I'm stargazing with my wife, and we're both in an extreme state of unease. We both look at each other and we say, something isn't right here. I'm looking into the pines, looking for the reason of our fear, and I see this orange cat sitting on a stump. The way it looked at me scared me, but I didn't really focus much on the cat. Suddenly through the trees, we hear this screaming. Help me, please, anyone out here? It sounded like a little girl at first, but then it sounded like a grown woman. Somebody effing help me. It cut through my body. I have never been that fearful in my entire life. I was completely terrified. My wife yells out, Where are you? You're not alone. No reply. We get into our pathfinder, roll the windows down, and we have spotlights out each side searching for this woman. A couple more screams let out into the still night. She sounds like she's within 10 feet but there's nobody around. We yell out to try to let her know that we're there, but we never get a reply. A scream so loud then happens and it leaves my eardrums ringing. Somebody please help me. It's like she's screaming directly into the car, but no one is anywhere. This scream was different because it sounded fearful, but also angry and it really genuinely hurt my ears. That was the last one. We kept searching, but not another peep. Her voice was just not natural. I don't even know how to explain it. I am haunted by this experience, and honestly, I'm just looking for answers on what that was. I get chills when I talk about it. It almost makes me teary-eyed. This is probably completely unrelated, but in the same stretch of woods the day before, I was hiking and I came across an owl. 
I thought it was a decoy, like a prop or something, until it turned its head around and gazed deep into my eyes. I froze. I wasn't exactly fearful, but it had a strange effect on me. Its eyes were orange, bright, almost glowing. We locked eyes for what seemed like minutes, and then it flew off without a sound. In fall of 2019, I started babysitting for a new family. They live in a house that was built in the 1920s. I've always believed in angels and demons, not necessarily just ghosts. One of the first times I was babysitting the three-year-old and the one-year-old, I was putting them to bed, and I thought I heard somebody knocking on their front door downstairs. I looked out the window to see if the parents were home, but nobody was there. I decided to just ignore it. Another time, again, I was putting them to bed, and I heard what sounded like a man and a woman having a conversation in the kitchen. So, assuming the parents had gotten home, I walked down to greet them, but nobody was there. Yet another time, I was watching them during the day, when the mom was out of town and the dad was at work. I expected him home at about 3.30 p.m. The girls were napping upstairs, and I heard the kitchen door open and footsteps. I was surprised that the dad was back so early. As I turned the corner to go greet him in the kitchen, I saw what I thought was him, black suit and all, walk past the door frame. As I entered the kitchen, I started to say, didn't expect you back so early, but there was no one there. The last time I ever babysat them, I was playing in the backyard with the girls. Let me remind you that the oldest one is three. She's constantly scared to be alone in the dark, which I thought was strange because usually at such a young age, kids haven't really had any experiences to make them this afraid of a particular thing. That day, she said, I saw a slender man in my bathroom mirror and he waved back at me. I was terrified. I asked her to repeat what she had just said several times. Slender man. She is three. There's no reason for her to already know what that means. At that moment, I realized that I always closed her bathroom door just because it felt creepy. And whenever I would come back into the room later, the door was always open. I have never babysat for them again. This happened when I was 16. My mother used to take my phone at night and then give it back to me when she woke me up for school the following morning. Every morning started the same. She would wake me up, I would go to the bathroom to take a shower and get ready, I'd come out and put on my uniform, she'd give me breakfast, and then I would run out of the house to catch the public bus. This is the important part. I would always take my phone into the bathroom with me. I'm the type of person who plans my day by the minutes. I knew I had to take my shower for X amount of minutes, get out of the bathroom by X, leave the house at X, etc. So the same routine. I was in the bathroom and I remember it so clearly. My shower took way longer than usual. And instead of it being 7.15 when I got out, the phone said 7.23. I remember rushing out of the bathroom as I was supposed to leave the house by 7.25 on most days. I rushed and put on my uniform, and my mom followed me half out of the house with my breakfast. I distinctly remember checking the clock before I left, too, trying to figure out if I had time to catch the bus or if I would have to take a car to school. The clock was at 7.28, so I did have time to catch the bus. It was a snowy day in January. I also remember that vividly. The sky was gray and dark, but that's how it was every day. The streets were eerily empty. 
I stood at my bus stop, which was on the side of a pretty busy street. Not today. No one was on the street. Maybe one car passed by every few minutes. I started to get worried that I would be late for school, and that's when I looked down at my phone to call my dad to see if he could drop me off. It was 4.03 in the morning. I was shocked. It couldn't be. I walked back home, and my mom was still up getting my other sister ready for school. She was surprised to see me. I told her to check the time, and to her surprise too, it was 4 o'clock in the morning. She started saying how she had sworn that her alarm woke her up at seven, like it does every single morning. We both looked at each other and just swore that we'd seen the time. A 4 a.m. snowy day and a 7 a.m. snowy day looked almost identical outside, but I know that I checked the clock enough times to confirm that it was in the seven o'clock hour. Regardless, we all went back to sleep and again I woke up at seven. This time I made my dad take me to school and the whole day I had my eyes on the clock. This incident never happened to me again, but I still have no explanation for it. On May 3rd, 2017, my life was pretty similar to how it is now. I'm a bartender in a smallish beach town in Florida, so I know most people who frequent the bars in our downtown area, either as other service industry workers or patrons. I also have always lived within walking distance to work and the strip of bars and restaurants. That being said, I was 23 at the time and constantly hung out with a pretty large group of friends and coworkers and going out almost daily after work. Although this absolutely made no sense from the beginning, I thought for a while that there might be an explanation to what I experienced. If there is, I never got one. And I'm 100% sure that I do not know the person who this mystery item belonged to, but let me back up. I was going through my trunk before a camping trip one day with a guy I was dating, who lived in the apartments across the street from mine. As we're clearing things out, we find a large black duffel bag stuffed in the very back of the trunk. Upon opening it, I discovered it was full of various soccer gear. Cleats, socks, safety pads, and a jersey with a name I didn't recognize on it. I had zero recollection of anyone putting anything in my trunk. I don't have any friends who play soccer, and I never have. The name on the jersey is one that I've literally never heard of, even now and searching on social media didn't yield any results. The guy who I was dating at the time thought that I was lying and thought that it was from another guy I was hanging out with or had hung out with and dated in the past. He didn't believe me that I had no idea how it got there, who the person whose name was on the jersey was, and didn't hang out with anyone who played soccer. That drove me even more insane because I literally didn't even discover the bag in the trunk on my own previously. This was the first time I had ever seen it. I asked every person that I was around regularly as well, as well as pretty much anyone I'd seen in the past month. No one had any clue what I was talking about or recognized the name on the jersey. Please note that there are no spare keys for my car and I never let anyone drive my car. I always keep it obsessively locked and my car has never been broken into. I ended up throwing the bag away a couple of years afterwards I kept it in my trunk forever, hoping that the mystery would solve itself eventually, but no. This will forever drive me nuts. To this day, I have no idea who that person is or how that stuff got into my trunk. I live in a super rural area and walk my dog outside in the dark every night. Tonight, I was walking her later than usual and things felt very off. First, we went outside and I walked no more than two feet away from the door and felt something wet under my foot. I checked my shoes and there was a slug in the middle of my shoe. It didn't look like a normal slug, but I don't know what else to call it. 
I have no clue how it got there, because I know it wasn't there when I put them on. As I'm trying to figure out what the hell is in my shoes, my dog starts freaking out and growling at the house across the street. She does this somewhat commonly because they have dogs that attacked her once. So I didn't think much of it and went inside to get another pair of shoes. I walked back outside and was immediately struck with the feeling that something was wrong. The first time I was out, I heard weird, quiet music, but just thought that the neighbors were playing something. This time, the music was gone, but there was this incessant, high-pitched shriek periodically. My dog and I literally stopped, just stopped, and stood for like a minute, listening. There was this periodic shriek, and then another sound, like a high-pitched bark. Definitely not a fox, I know that sound, and none of the dogs in the area bark like that. The sound would happen every now and again. The worst part was that everything else was dead silent. If you live in the country, you know that it's never silent, not even in the winter. I took a recording on my phone of the noises, but they weren't super loud and it didn't pick them up very well. So I'm feeling a little weird, but I get scared easily, so I try to brush it off and let my dog go to the bathroom. As soon as I stop the recording, my dog starts flipping out, hackles raised, growling, barking, and jumping at something behind us in the yard. She didn't have to tell me twice, so we ran to the door and inside the house. I shut the door behind us and immediately felt relief. I felt like I was being chased, trying to get to the door. My dog ran around the house and did a check out of the windows to make sure everything was clear, I guess, and then went to bed. I don't know what happened, but it scared the crap out of me. I'm hoping that I'm just being paranoid. About two days ago, I had a craving for McDonald's. It was around 10.30 or 11 at night, so I went out and got my food and was headed back home. I usually go through a back alley to get to the front of my house faster. This night was no different. But to give you a picture, it's a back alleyway with houses on one side and a field on the other. Anyway, I'm heading home and I take the back alley going about 30 kilometers an hour. Everything is good, when suddenly a person steps in front of my view, coming from the field side. He was maybe five or ten feet away, so I slammed on my brakes so as not to hit the guy, and I didn't. I was sure of it, but the guy wasn't in my view anymore, so I panicked a little, put the car in park, and got out to see and apologize for not seeing him earlier. Like I said, he wasn't there. I walked out to the front of the car. No dents. I looked under the vehicle and there was nothing there. I moved back a couple of steps to see if there was anyone in the field. I called out, but I got no answer. So I brushed it off as much as one could and I turned around to head back to my car. And that's when I saw myself. Granted, it was a shadow because he was standing right next to my door and I had the headlight aiming at me. I was in front of my vehicle. I asked, are you all right? I'm so sorry. I got no answer. The figure was just standing there. I said hello and still no answer. So I waved my hand and said, yoo-hoo. And he did the same. He waved his hand, but said nothing. It was freaky because it was a mirror image of my hand motion. It really caught me off guard, so I stepped back, and so did the shadow. It was so weird. So I walked toward him, and he did the same. And as soon as he was in range of the light, he was gone. No puff of smoke, no blur, just there one minute, and in the blink of an eye, gone. 
I was not about to look around anymore. I opened my door and got in, and I drove back home. I still get goosebumps just thinking about it. This isn't exactly a horrifying story, so don't get too disappointed if you're not terrified. For background, I'm a 15-year-old Irish fella called Ross. I go to school in Ireland, and I'm now in third year. At the start of the second year, I knew a fella that joined the school. I was in charge of showing him around, and we've been good friends ever since. He is Portuguese, and his name is Tiago. I'll call him Tig for the story. His school bag is a fairly small, bright red bag. He's a little bit shorter than me, and his hair is quite short and brown in color. One day, I was upstairs in my school. It was break time, and I was going to my group's usual spot. I turned a corner, and I saw Tig walking along the hallway. This was weird, because at the distance I was from him, I would have seen him come up the stairs. I didn't think much of it at the time, but I sped up to catch up to him. There was another corner coming up. He rounded it, and I followed suit. Except he wasn't there. There was a staircase going back down and two bathrooms, one for lads and one for lassies, but no Tig. Considering how close behind him I was, he would have had to have sprinted towards and then jumped down the stairs or jogged into one of the bathrooms. If he went for the stairs, I would have heard it, so I figured he was in the bathroom. I sat at the bench and waited. Tig was the first other person in our group to arrive. He rounded the corner and sat his bag down. The realization hit me hard. He wasn't in the bathroom, and whatever or whoever I had followed was not Tig, even though it looked just like him. Same backpack and everything. I asked him if he had already been up there, to which he replied he hadn't. He had no reason to lie. Now, I know what you're thinking. It was someone else. First of all, the person that I saw looked the exact same as my friend from the back. Second of all, no one else in the school has that bag. At least I've never seen anyone else with it. And third, the only place the person could have gone without sprinting down the stairs, which I probably would have caught a glimpse of anyway, would be the bathroom. No one ever came out of the bathroom. At least nobody that I didn't watch go into it. Finally, my friend is a fairly distinct character. Not many people have the same body build as he does. Like I said at the start, it's not exactly terrifying, but I do believe it to be a glitch in the Matrix. I'm from Indonesia, and it's 1 a.m. here. My country is an archipelago, almost as big as Europe, with thousands of islands, if you count the small ones. There are many cultures here, and probably as many types of supernatural entities. One of them, though, specifically, is called Akuntilana. Basically, there are three kinds of entities, man-made, ghosts, or ex-man, and non-human. Ghosts vary from your average haunting spirit to something more sinister, like a Pontiana or a Kuntilana. Non-humans are different species from the beginning. Man-made are entities created by people having certain supernatural abilities. These can range from non-sentient drones to shape-shifting humans, or humans that have mutated into something else, usually as part of a ritual to gain power. Phenomena happen so often here that it's rarer to find someone who doesn't believe in the supernatural than who does. I mean, many would claim that they don't, but true faith is tested while walking alone at night, right? If you go to a school, there's an 80% chance that it's haunted. My junior high, my high school, my undergraduate and graduate school were all haunted. Grad school was the most vivid, 
as many people stayed up late for assignments. It's common to spend the night at the hotel and hear the occupants of the next room drag their furniture all night long. I've had it happen to me four or five times. Then you'll ask and nobody was in that room. I've heard footsteps walking up and down the stairs next to my bedroom almost every night without an explanation for months. Other people have heard it too. I've had many friends who can see things as well. One even had a boyfriend who over time gained the ability to sense things. I myself could see silhouettes, even in areas of the room where my eyes couldn't see. Like behind me, I could still see them. It's hard to explain. It's gone or mostly diminished now anyway. All that to say, it is really haunted here. When I was a kid, I lived in a one-story house that had a very small space that you could consider an attic. We didn't keep anything up there because it was just so small. I don't even know where the entrance to it was, if there was one. But, and this started right as we moved in. After we would go to bed, I'd start hearing footsteps up there. I knew they were footsteps because they would move in a rhythm and move from one end of the house to the other. I lived in that house with my grandparents from when I was eight to 12 years old and this happened every night. I repeatedly tried telling my grandparents about this, but they always said that it was just the house settling. I was never able to sleep well as a kid, so while my grandparents would be asleep as soon as 8 p.m. struck, I would be laying awake in bed, staring at the ceiling. It was always the most terrifying when the footsteps stopped right above me like right over my bed. And then within a few seconds to minutes, they'd walk back to some other location up there. Nobody ever believed me that this was happening. My granddad had even found holes that had apparently been drilled in several of the walls, one in the bathroom, and he wrote it off as a previous owner running cables. I lived in that house for four years and I was convinced that somebody was living in the ceiling above us and would become active when they thought we had gone to bed. I will never forget that. It always happened at the same time of night too, right after we all went to bed. This was back in the late 90s and early 2000s, so I don't know if there could have been cameras or something that they could have been watching us on, but they definitely knew when we went to sleep. To this day, I'm still convinced that somebody was living up there. Is it paranormal? I don't know. One of the previous owner's kids did die in the house, and they had a wolf-dog hybrid as a pet that had mauled him in the living room. So, who knows? Maybe it was paranormal. But I know footsteps from houses settling. And I know that someone, whether living or dead, was up in that crawl space. This is a story about my little sister's experiences with the entity that haunted our Florida home. I myself have never experienced anything in that house, but I think you'll find her encounters very creepy. For my sister's privacy, I will refer to her as Liz. This all took place in Florida when I was 15 and Liz was 11. Liz shared a room with me and our youngest sister. She slept on the top bunk while I slept across the room in my own bed. I liked to entertain my sisters by telling scary stories or reciting the whole script to one of our favorite movies. Liz always had a habit of calling me out whenever I told a scary story. She didn't believe in ghosts, which makes this whole thing 10 times weirder. 
The first incident was probably around July, as I remember it was pretty hot. I had been asleep maybe three hours when I was shaken awake. It was Liz. She asked me why I was standing by her bed and staring at her. Having just been woken up, I was confused. I no longer sleepwalked, so I had no idea why she would think that I was staring at her all creepy-like. I got her back to bed and sat with her until she fell back asleep. The second incident was maybe four weeks later. While eating breakfast, Liz asked mom who the man in the hat was. Mom brushed her off, but I questioned her further. She told me that late last night, she woke up to find somebody standing next to her bed, peering at her through the safety bars. She described the figure as a man wearing a fedora type hat and wearing all black. He was very shadowy and disappeared when Liz blinked. The third and most terrifying incident happened a few days after. I remember waking up after a particularly terrifying nightmare. I looked over to my sister's bed and I noticed that Liz was sitting bolt upright, staring at me. I asked her what was wrong. She answered with fear apparent in her voice, the man in the hat was watching you sleep. That was the last and most terrifying incident I can remember. I don't believe he appeared again. We had our house blessed twice, so that may have deterred him. What do you think it was? I know we don't have any dead relatives that wore hats like that, so I'm very confused as to what she saw. All during my childhood, up until recently, I had thought that ghouls were just spooky, imaginative, scary monsters that would come out on Halloween night. But now, I know differently. I now believe they are synonymous with the creatures we know as crawlers. In Arabic folklore, the ghoul is said to dwell in cemeteries and other uninhabited places. Some say that a ghoul is a desert-dwelling, shape-shifting demon that can assume the guise of an animal. It lures unwary people into the desert or into abandoned places to slay and devour them. The creature also preys on young children, drinks blood, steals coins, and eats the dead. It can also take the form of a human. It is a particularly monstrous character believed to inhabit the wilderness of Afghanistan and Iran. The Galu demons were known to be part of the underworld and were thought to carry their victims off to the land of the dead to devour them. People who traveled near cemeteries and abandoned buildings or through desert wastelands were warned to be especially vigilant against these creatures. They were thought to be bipedal though with a hunched form, and were known to crawl, and sometimes run, on all four limbs like an animal. I knew there was a reason why I kept warning people to stay away from the forests and surrounding areas. Since we have fewer deserts in the United States, these creatures are frequently encountered in wooded areas in addition to cemeteries. After years of research, I've come to the conclusion that crawlers are actually demons interdimensional demons. The late great father Malachi Martin, in his book Hostage to the Devil, stated, quote, there is a dimension that is devoid of love and compassion, all the qualities that make us human, end quote. I believe it is from that dimension which these demon crawlers come. People from the Middle East are far more familiar with the ghouls. They are able to shapeshift and spend time in cemeteries as they feed off the flesh of the dead. Like I said, I used to think these were just stories meant for Halloween and scaring kids. But the more research I do, the more I believe they're real. And I think we all ought to be vigilant.
About 13 years ago, my sister lived in a house in a not-so-great neighborhood. You'd come through the kitchen and then the dining room and turn left into the living room. Behind the living room was a hall to the main bathroom and all the bedrooms. The couch was positioned with its back to the hallway. At the end of the hall was a bedroom that always creeped us out. We didn't ever go in there or in the half bath that was inside of it. She mostly has boxes in there. Well, my niece's nursery was right beside that room, and we always had weird stuff happen in there. One time, my sister was asleep and heard a voice scream one of my niece's names in her ear. She got up and ran into the nursery and saw a dark figure over the crib. My niece had gotten tangled in the crib bumpers. The figure looked at her and disappeared. Now, that was the least creepy thing. Whenever I was over, I used to have nightmares about the main bathroom being covered in blood. I have a lot of nightmares though, so I never thought anything of it. Until one night, I was supposed to be babysitting while she went out on a date night. I was laying on her couch, and she was in the bathroom taking a shower. I'm just hanging out, and I hear her call my name. I called back, What? And she yelled back, Nothing. I just shook it off as her being annoyed, and it happened three more times. Finally, I got up and stormed to the bathroom door and knocked as loud as I could. I said, You're gonna wake up the girls, why do you keep calling me? She was quiet for a second and said, I'm not calling you. I was pretty creeped out, but I went to sit back on the couch to wait for her to be done showering. Then I heard the door of the back bedroom creak. I turned around, looked down the hall, and saw the door open by itself. And then, in my sister's voice, I heard something say, Hey, come here. Nope. She moved out soon after. All kinds of crazy things happened there. We later found out that a man killed his mother in her bathroom and then killed himself, just a few years before my sister lived there. We couldn't remember the address when we found the news story, but it was on the same street and it looked like the house. It would also explain the nightmares I had, so I'm pretty sure that it was definitely that house. This is my dad's experience. My dad grew up in Indonesia, and he told me about this time that he and a friend were traveling to another province for work. It took a day or so to get there, and after driving their van all day, they needed to spend the night somewhere. They stopped at some kind of local inn and asked how much it would be for the night. The owner said that it was much cheaper that day of the week and asked if they were sure that they wanted to stay there that night. This was because previous guests had said that on that day of the week, they would hear banging on the doors and loud footsteps walking toward the bed they were sleeping in. Well, my dad and his friend didn't believe in ghosts or anything, so they decided to stay the night because it was cheap and better than spending a night in the van. As they started to go to sleep, it was all quiet for a couple of hours until they heard banging on the door, which woke them up. My dad and his friend immediately thought that the staff were playing a prank, so they checked the door, but nobody was there. They were a little bit spooked, but they tried going back to sleep. After about 20 minutes or so, they heard the door handle rattle, and then they heard the locked door open. Both of them were frozen and hid their faces under their sheets. They then heard heavy footsteps, like somebody was wearing boots, walking closer to the bed. Neither of them wanted to look but my dad decided to rip the sheet off and see what it was. He told me that when he ripped the sheets off, he glanced what was there. It was a figure of a man, maybe in his early 40s, wearing extremely dirty clothing and boots. The man's face was extremely pale, 
and he just stared at my dad. My dad tried to scream, but he couldn't, and eventually his friend had a look at the figure. They were both just speechless. After a few moments, all they could really do was cover their faces. They went back under their sheets, and when they did, they heard the door slam, but no footsteps leading up to it. After a couple of minutes, they checked to see if it was still there, but it was gone. They immediately grabbed their backpacks and left the place and just kept driving. After that incident, my dad is a very strong believer in ghosts. Last night, I went to pick up my dog from my dad's house, and something really weird happened. It was around 10 p.m., and I picked up my dog. I've driven from my dad's house at night a thousand times, and I know the road back like the back of my hand. He lives on a ranch, and to get back to the freeway, you have to turn left when the road forks. So I'm driving to the end of this road, but the fork never comes. I keep driving on and on and on, but the road isn't ending. After a good 10 minutes, and note that this road is rather short and should have only taken me about 2 minutes, the road finally forks. I make a left, and on the side of the road I see glowing eyes, like cat eyes. Then the road just ends into a big ditch. This road should have led to the freeway. I turned around and started driving back, when all of a sudden, a dog jumps on the side of my car. This thing is growling and snarling at the window. This is gonna sound lame, but it's the truth. I got chills and a really bad feeling of dread, and I'm like 90% sure that that was not a dog. I slowed down, panicking, because I thought I was going to accidentally hit this dog. I love dogs, even demonic ones, but then it just disappears. I looked around the car with my flashlight, and this thing was just gone. I floored it out of there and turned back onto what I thought was the main road, and kept driving. I got the GPS to navigate back to my house, and it said that I was a little less than 10 miles away from the freeway. This is literally impossible, because the road that my dad lives on is not that long nor does it lead to any other road that long. I was so panicked that I floored it home, and I forgot to expand the map to see where the heck I was. Once I got home and calmed down, I went on Google Earth to try to see where I went, and it doesn't exist. There's not a single road that long, nor anything that resembles what I saw anywhere in that area. I have no clue what happened and my friend and I are convinced that I traveled into an alternate universe for a little bit last night, that the cat that turned into the dog was a skinwalker. Whatever else, we don't really know. This is a story that happened to me years ago, that I never really talk about much. I thought it might be interesting to tell this story. When I was a teenager, I made money by babysitting. On this particular night, I was working at a house a few minutes from my home, so I had been able to work later than usual. The family had two little girls that I was watching, around four to seven years old. First, to give a bit of background on what the home looked like, which will be important later. The house had two floors and two staircases that led to the upstairs. One set was off the kitchen, and the other was in the foyer. This home had an alarm system that would beep three times when any door was opened, although it would not say which door it was. I was sitting in the kitchen at around 11 p.m. and coloring to pass the time at the kids' table. The parents had said they would be home between 11.30 and midnight, 
and I was starting to get antsy to go home. I heard the alarm for the door and got up, expecting to see the parents coming in. When they didn't, I went back to what I was doing. About 15 minutes later, it went off again. This time I felt a little creeped out, so I went around checking all the doors, which I all found to be shut tight and locked. I sat back down, figuring that there must be some kind of glitch in the system. Within about a minute, the door alarm went off twice, as if two doors had been opened in quick succession, and as I stood up, I heard a little girl screaming bloody murder. I raced up the stairs into the girl's shared room, and I found them both sleeping soundly. I checked all the nooks and crannies of their room, and I remember feeling that the only thing that seemed different was that the book that I had read to them was on the floor instead of on the bookshelf. I ended up checking the stairs and the other rooms as I felt pretty unsure of the girl's safety, but I found nothing and all the doors were still locked. I ended up sitting back down in the kitchen feeling stupid and not long after, the alarm beeped once, really loudly, which I had never heard before, and the panel didn't seem to give an explanation for what this meant. After that, everything stopped, and the parents came home not long after. I managed to convince myself at the time that I was just imagining things, but after all this time, I can still remember the fearful scream very clearly. Nothing too exciting, but something that I've never been able to forget. This happened probably about two years ago, except my memory of when it happened is really hazy and I struggled to place it on my timeline. I would say I was about 15 years old, and it was the middle of the night. I live in a two-story house, and the second story is quite high, so I sleep with the curtains wide open as I like to look at the stars. For reference, the window that's in this room takes up almost the whole wall. I woke up one night, and my room was completely bright, my bed is in the corner opposite the window, and all I could see out my window was a blinding light taking up the entire window. My bedroom was completely lit up, and I could barely look out the window because it was like looking into the sun. I sat there for probably about two minutes, absolutely paralyzed with fear, before I decided to grab my phone and film it. The second I grabbed my phone, the light went out and my room went back to dark. I couldn't make out anything through the window, as my eyes had to adjust since it had been so bright. And once I could see, after about maybe a minute, there was nothing out of the ordinary. I wrote myself a note to look at in the morning, because I needed evidence that it hadn't been a dream. I eventually got back into bed and tried to sleep but the adrenaline and fear kept me up for hours. I managed to fall asleep eventually, and when I woke up, the note was exactly where I left it. I spoke to my family, but they were all adamant that they hadn't seen or heard anything. I have explored every logical possibility, including sleep paralysis and night terrors, and even the possibility that I was hallucinating. But I've never hallucinated before, and I haven't since. I have no history of mental illness other than depression, which I wasn't struggling with at the time. And the same with night terrors and sleep paralysis. The note I left myself has proved to me that I wasn't asleep when it happened. This was during a time when I had some weird experiences happening while I was asleep. I would wake up with strange bruises and scratches all over my body almost every day. My memories from around that time are very hazy and I can only remember bits and pieces. That time of my life is almost blurry to me, and I usually have an excellent memory. Any possible explanations?
I was 10 years old. My brother and I were the last ones off the bus from school every day. We were nearing my house, which is in the Midwest countryside. Lots of cows and trees and fields, stuff like that. Anyway, about a mile away from my house, I look out the window and I see an orange blimp in the sky. Standard American football shaped blimp. Surprisingly, I didn't think anything of it. Because a day or so before that, a bunch of kids and I at recess saw a blue blimp in the sky. I watched it, thought it was cool to see a blimp this far outside of town, especially near my house, and wasn't about to think another thing of it. After a few seconds, the blimp shifted from a football shape to a star, literally just shrunk before my eyes into a tiny, shiny dot that resembled a star in the night sky. Except it wasn't a star. It was just a blimp a second ago. Not even two seconds after it shifted, it launched even farther into the sky, shot down to its original height, and then shot completely off into space. It was the most bizarre thing I had ever experienced. I was a quiet kid, but being the last kid on the bus besides my brother, I shouted about it. When I got off the bus, I ran to my mother to tell her, like a crazy old man yelling about the end times. My mother said that I was crazy, naturally, and I never told my dad, because my mom shut me down pretty hard and it killed my mood. Fast forward years later, shortly after I turned 22, my dad and I took a short road trip to go pick up a car he bought halfway across the state. We talked about a lot and somehow got on the topic of UFOs. He told me that when he was 12 or 13, he and his brothers were playing down by a creek near their house, which by the way, was only a few miles away from our house. They saw an orange football shaped object in the sky. I was absolutely blown away when he said that. My father's skeptical and doesn't believe in this kind of stuff, ever. But when I shared my story, he paused and said that it was very odd to have seen the exact same thing behave the exact same way more than 30 years apart. A few months ago, I read a terrifying post about something that happened in the backwoods in Canyon Lake, Texas. I had commented that I nearly threw my phone because I used to live there for a few years. I truly don't know where to begin this story. I moved there my junior year of high school. My family's house was built from the ground up on the south side of the lake. My parents didn't know that this was the side of the lake that most people avoided. I don't mean to be offensive, it's just most of the people that I knew lived on the north side. I never really understood why, until the event started happening. The house was finished the summer going into my junior year. When we officially moved in, things were great. A few months into me beginning school is when things turned incredibly dark. It all began when my dad put his guitar in our family room by the fireplace. I would come home and something would string the guitar strings so violently it sounded as if somebody had knocked it over. I began waking up to my dad being completely weirded out because all of our cabinet doors and the doors on the first floor would be open. It escalated dramatically from here. We would hear something in the woods just outside of the porch lights continually. First, we thought it was an injured animal, but dead deer and other wildlife would appear on our property every few weeks. Then we began to see inhuman things. Guests would see something walking in the hallways, opening drawers, and would see a girl in our guest house. My dad constantly hosted events and parties, including his ex-military friends. They would ask us why we were coming to their rooms at night and opening the drawers and closets and then walking out. 
My dad didn't believe me until his friends began commenting on figures and people in the house. The worst night was when all the doors began opening and slamming, and it sounded as if somebody was walking up and down the stairs, going into every room, opening and closing the doors. I could go on and on about the things I saw in that house. It was one of the scariest times of my life. All in all, don't go to Canyon Lake. It's been well over a year since I last saw a gnome. I have epilepsy, so I'm never sure if it's just my brain fabricating things, but I've never hallucinated due to seizures that I know of. That all being said, I once went to a psychic who did Akashic record readings. She told me that I was closely connected to earth spirits. I made no mention to her about seeing gnomes because, well, that makes you sound absolutely bonkers. For a short period of time, my ex and I lived at his late grandfather's house. The property was teeming with Japanese maples and native plants. He also kept an orchid room. One day, while taking a shower, I heard the bathroom door move and I saw a little drably dressed old man, about one and a half feet tall, run through the bathroom and climb out the open window. It scared the crap out of me. I let out a yelp. My ex came running in, and so as not to be taken for even more medical testing than I'd already been through, when he asked me what happened, I just told him I'd slipped. Another thing I once saw may have been a troll, but I'm not sure. I have no idea what it was. Maybe one of you can enlighten me. I had been doing a lot of meditating, three hours or so, and I headed into my bedroom to change for the gym. I opened my closet, and there was this three and a half to four foot naked, wrinkly, elf type troll thing. I gasped and backed up, and it disappeared. Since both sightings mentioned here, I've had more than one CT scan, MRIs, etc. My seizures were a result of head trauma that happened well after what I'll refer to as the troll incident. There are other times that I have seen them as well. Once in childhood, I had an encounter with my late Noni, and a few encounters with my grandfather who died when I was four. Again, my brain has been scanned a lot in multiple ways, and nothing has ever been found other than some white spots from chronic migraines, and those popped up super recently. I've also been evaluated by a neuropsychologist, and nothing other than my seizures, due to the head trauma, has ever been wrong with me. Like I said, the head trauma happened way after I saw the troll or gnome or whatever it was. I don't know what these things are, but what do you think? I remember when I was a kid that every school was built over a cemetery. It was cliche. But my elementary school actually was built over one. Ever since I was a little girl, I was heavily interested in the paranormal, and I always thought my school had something weird going on. For some reason, I was invested in proving to myself that I was right. In the fourth grade, my experiments began. I purposefully stayed later in my classroom, hoping something would happen. I was always alone for like 10 minutes every day in the classroom, and I waited for like five minutes in silence to hear something. I was slowly getting frustrated and decided to drop my experiments. But one day, it happened. I was alone in my classroom, putting some things away in my locker space as quickly as possible so I could join my friends on the patio. My classroom was at the end of the hallway on the second floor, so I was rushing to catch up. I could hear the muffled voices of the other kids outside. In one instant, it was like a crowd of people talking out loud just hit me in the ears. I couldn't understand a bit of what they were saying, but it was loud, louder than a bunch of kids playing outside. 
I grabbed my backpack and ran outside. When I was just by the stairs, I closed my backpack and walked to meet my friends. I was freaked out, but I didn't say anything to anybody. I didn't want a bunch of other kids to stay late in the classroom with me, and if someone told a teacher, they would think I was doing it for attention. Some weeks passed and I wasn't staying late anymore, because I didn't want to hear those voices again. One day, I thought it would be interesting to leave a piece of paper with a message for the ghosts hidden behind my books. I made sure nobody was there and that nobody could see it in plain sight. Sure enough, I received answers written on the paper. They were simple sentences, yes or no answers. Since my mom was a teacher at my school, I was the first kid to arrive at the classroom before anybody else would come in. I would open my message and I would see the answer. Eventually I stopped doing that because something about it just felt wrong and I could tell that the ghosts or whatever they were were getting a bit annoyed. It wasn't much, but it was enough that it made me believe in ghosts and made me think that I was as awesome as the ghost hunters on TV. The summer after my second year in high school, I went up to Pike National Forest in Colorado for a summer field biology camp. It was pretty cool because I'd never been camping prior. I had a small two-man tent that I shared with my buddy from school. We had met this kid at camp and instantly became really good friends. His parents were loaded and his tent, which was about 10 feet from us, was huge, like a 10-person tent. The night before this incident, a huge windstorm blew through the valley and absolutely annihilated his huge tent. Mine was fine because it was low to the ground. Anyway, for the rest of the time, he slept in our already packed tent. I slept closest to the door of the tent because I always had to pee in the middle of the night and I didn't want to have to climb over people. So the night this all went down, I woke up, no idea what time it was, went outside to the forest, peed, and crawled back into the tent. I was laying there for a bit, and there happened to be a lightning storm overhead, cloud to cloud. As I was watching the light illuminate my tent, I started hearing whispering. It was female whispering, back and forth. I tried to hear what it was saying, but it was unintelligible. The whispering started to get closer and closer until it was right next to the tent by my right ear. It just stopped. I didn't hear anyone walking or anything like that. Then all of a sudden, lightning lit up the tent and there were shadows of people cast onto the side of the tent. That's when the chanting began. It sounded like a different language, all female voices and a bunch of them. I just closed my eyes and slipped under my sleeping bag, terrified, and put my hands over my ears. The next day after breakfast, we all went back to the tent to get changed, and the new guy who was now staying with us says, pretty wild last night, right? To which I responded, you mean the lightning? He said, no, the frickin' scary chanting. I think this place is cursed or something. So it wasn't just me. But it did help that someone else had heard it and we could talk about it. Now, every time I go camping, I stop drinking anything two hours before I plan to sleep so that I don't have to wake up in the middle of the night to pee because I am not going out there. I'm not a believer in the paranormal, and to be honest, I'm still very skeptical, but I'll share my experience anyway, because maybe it could provide some answers. I visited the Castle Museum in York, England. I specifically went there for a birthday trip, and me, being somebody who's obsessed with history, it was a no-brainer going there. The museum was fantastic and I had a great time going through all the different floors and rooms it contained. 
About an hour in, we came across the prison section of the museum. Now this wasn't a huge prison, more like a dungeon than anything else. There were maybe about four cells on either side, all open for the public to wander inside and look around. Each cell was brightly lit enough to see where you were going, except for one. On the very far left side was a cell that had no lights, no furniture, no bed or tables or windows, nothing. It was pitch black and empty. So I decided that as a challenge, I would go inside and stay there for about 10 seconds. About five seconds in, I felt somebody go right up to my ear and whisper something. Unfortunately, I never made out what it said because I instantly panicked and ran out of the cell. Now my first thought afterward was maybe there was a speaker hidden inside the room, playing sounds to scare people. But unless the speaker was really just right next to my ear, I don't see how that was possible. My second thought was maybe a mischievous staff member or tourist decided to hide and scare us. But again, I would have had to have felt somebody leaning against me for how close it was in there. Sadly, I didn't ask a receptionist or anyone who worked there about that cell, or if there were any other reported experiences. I really wish I had. But I did do some research, and I found many stories and even some photographic evidence of paranormal encounters inside that prison section. So, either the darkness got to my head and I imagined it, or I am in fact another person to make contact with one of the restless souls who still wanders the museum. So I'm on staff duty and finishing up. It's 5.05 a.m. The gym opens at five o'clock sharp. I'm supposed to bring the master key over and unlock the gym and sit down here while people PT, since we had a few incidents of misconduct. So I get the key and my things and come down to the basement where the gym is. There are no windows and the lights are on a sensor with a switch. When flipped on, they come on and stay on until the motion sensors go to sleep. Then you have to walk into the center of the room and wave to get them back on. When flipped off, they're off, and that's that. So I open the door and hit the switch, and nothing. It clicks, but no lights come on. So having just watched scary videos all night at staff duty, I prop the door open with some plates by the entrance and get out my phone and turn on the flashlight. I flip the switch in the other direction since they aren't labeled, and in the army, up and down might as well be the same thing. It clicks and no light. Now I'm noticing that I can hear the other light on the far side of the room click all on its own. Well, that's not creepy, and it may realistically be a short in the shitty wiring. I flip the switch up again and hear the far switch click a half a second later. So, light in hand, I decide to find my balls and walk out there and wave at the sensor. I start walking and I'm pretty sure I should be tripping the sensor, but the only light is from the emergency sign. And now across the room by a weight machine is a reflection off the metal, like someone's down there with me. I walk back and flip the switch down. This time I don't hear the other switch click and the lights come on. Bad feelings banished. Victory. Only, I decide to walk back out, carefully watching the sensor. By the time it picks me up, I'm significantly closer to that one weight machine than I was the first time, which means I wasn't in sensor range, which means someone, or something else, set off the grid for me. Or, Maybe it's all just a bug in the wiring.
About five years ago, I was in the Air Cadets, a UK organization affiliated with the RAF. My squadron was, and is, based in the Sergeant's Mess at IWM Duxford, a former RAF station, now a vast air museum. On this particular occasion, it was a summer evening and dusk was settling in. I was in charge of a camouflage exercise, which involved the cadets using camouflage to hide and me trying to spot them. I was walking past several World War II era buildings when I saw two figures in the distance walking toward me. As I got closer, I saw that the two figures were US Air Force officers, not an uncommon sight, were not far from RAF Lakenheath, a US Air Force base. Maybe they're visiting. As I got closer, I realized that they were wearing very outdated uniforms and had flying equipment that was extremely old. Still not thinking much of it, I saluted them as I walked past, as is customary. They didn't acknowledge the salute, nor did they say anything. I walked off, feeling a little uneasy. Later that night, as the exercise wrapped up, I remembered the incident, and I asked my commanding officer who the two officers were. I got a very odd look. He said, Corporal, we haven't had any visitors tonight. Concerned that somebody may have broken in, security made a site-wide search, but could find nothing. They then quizzed me, and when I described the airmen I had seen, a grim look came over their faces. They proceeded to let me know that this wasn't the first time they'd been seen. Back in 1944, a B-17 flying fortress visited the airfield and took some personnel on a joyride. The aircraft collided with a navigation mast at low altitude and smashed into an accommodation building, exploding on impact and killing all aboard, plus one man in the barracks block. The building was located right next to where I had been walking. Furthermore, the men I described, they were the pilot and the navigator. They have been seen a few times over the years, often by security making patrols at night. I've always felt like I'm being watched when passing that spot. And sometimes I wonder if others feel the same way. I was out walking the woods at an ungodly hour of the morning. I believe it was around one to two in the morning. Last year, I was working at a church youth camp in Wisconsin. The camp was on two sides of a highway and a tunnel under the highway connected the two sides of the camp so that the campers could more readily access the other side. My then girlfriend and our friend liked to walk the woods at night after we were done with work. The first time we had done this, we were scared shitless by a fox barking. The deer in the woods were fairly docile and didn't spook easily. We soon learned to identify the sound of the fox, and we saw it several times. One night, it was just me and my ex-girlfriend walking through the woods. As we rounded a corner in the trail, I noticed movement in the field by the tunnel. Gray shapes. I assumed they were deer, and I pointed them out to my girlfriend. We continued our walk past the tunnel. Just as we passed the entrance to the tunnel, maybe about 20 yards, we heard the most horrendous screeching. It sounded as if somebody was being strangled. It did not sound at all like the fox, but we shrugged it off. We continued up the road. All of a sudden, I had this weird feeling, and I turned around to see a tall figure standing in the road. It was dressed in white and it was all hazy. I wondered if I was a little too tired and was seeing things, so I poked my girlfriend and asked her to take a look behind us. She immediately noticed it too. Something we both noted was that our eyes kept sliding off the figure. It was like we couldn't keep our vision centered on it. I was thinking this and she voiced it without me saying anything to her. I pulled my hunting knife from its sheath, but I somehow knew that it wouldn't do anything. Without looking away from the thing, I said, let's go, now. We backed away and then started running. 
and we didn't stop until we were back to the cabins. When I got back inside the cabin, the guy in the bunk next to me was still up texting his girlfriend. I quickly told him what I had seen. He looked at me and said, that's why I don't go out at night. I never went back out into those woods at night again. And when I talk about this, I still get chills and a nervous feeling. We had no drugs or alcohol. We were both under 21 and we were working at a church camp with strict policies. So I have no idea what we saw. I lived in Germany for many years while my father was stationed there in the U.S. Army. We lived off base in private housing and I loved it. That country is amazing. The vast forests, the mountains, the countryside, the farmlands, the little towns, everything. I quickly became really good friends with some local boys whose parents owned the town's dairy farm. We were always in the forests running around and exploring fishing, playing army, stuff like that. I was around eight or nine years old at that time, and I'm over 40 now. One night, I stayed late at the farm hanging out with the guys. I left at about nine or 10-ish. It was dark, but the moonlight gave pretty good vision. I lived just across the soccer field and then across a small cornfield from the farm. As I'm walking through the soccer field, I see a bit of movement just really quickly, out of the corner of my eye along the tree line at the edge of the field. I quickly stepped up my pace. As I turn to take my usual path through the cornfield to my house, I see at least a half a dozen silhouettes emerge from each side of the rows of corn on the sides of the path. I froze. They just stood there. And then all of a sudden, there's one standing behind me. Before I can snap around and get out of there, he asks in German where I'm going. I turned around and what I see surprises, but also relieves me. I answered in English and told him I was headed home. He was then curious about my English. Turns out it was a team of special forces operators. I mean, these guys were decked out so much in tactical gear, I couldn't comprehend how they were able to move so stealthily. Night vision goggles, packs, bags, weapons. There was even a dog. They looked like total badasses. Apparently they were using these small towns to do some off base training. I just happened upon them this particular night. I will never understand why they chose to break cover and show themselves. They could have easily just stayed put and I would have walked right by them none the wiser, but they all walked me home as it was on their way back. It started off super creepy, but it was actually pretty cool. And it's an experience that I will never forget. I've lived in the same house for a decade now. The old lady who used to live here died and her best friend still lives next door. I'm not sure how long she has left, but this house has always been spooky. It's always cold, it's really old, and I have had a lot of weird experiences for years. It's very common for me to hear footsteps, doors opening and closing, and my cat staring at random corners. My front door once opened and slammed closed by itself, and my mother saw an apparition of a Victorian lady in the front hallway in the middle of the night. I was also once home alone showering downstairs, and I heard somebody aggressively pacing back and forth in my room, opening and slamming my drawers closed. After a while, you get used to it, and you just accept the flow of things. For a while, the activity died down, and things seemed less scary. Plus, I moved away for university, so I got a huge break from the spooky stuff. But now I'm back, and the activity has spiked. A few nights ago, I was having a particularly hard mental health day. 
I was up at about 4 a.m., facing the wall, trying to sleep with my back to the door. My radio is always on at a low volume, and the music was playing. But I suddenly hear the voice of a woman behind me, almost groaning. It sounded like she was letting all the air out of her lungs, almost like wheezing. I freaked out, and when I looked, there was no one there. Yesterday, I was FaceTiming my boyfriend, and I heard footsteps in my house again, which I haven't heard in months. Distinct paces up the stairs, shuffling on the floorboards. I was genuinely scared, and even thought it was an actual intruder, but nobody was there. I'm scared that perhaps I'm manifesting something. I've never heard a woman before in this house, and the wheezing was so clear. I don't want to sound dramatic, but I'm scared of losing my sanity, and maybe I am. But my house has always been spooky, and this sudden spike has no real explanation. I'm going to try to smudge the house with some herbs that I gathered to feel a little bit safer. Hopefully, it works. It was Christmas Eve, 2019. I had gotten into a drunken argument and I had to spend 24 hours, Christmas Day, in an empty, silent cell. I was hungover at the time and had been beaten by police for exercising in my cell. Well, after staring at the blank walls for so long, in my state of utter misery, I saw fairies. I don't believe in fairies or anything else paranormal, and yet there they were, flying around my cell. Little female figures with dragonfly wings. They never spoke, as far as I can remember. They just flew around the room and I played with them. They were semi-transparent, colorfully dressed, and I could not touch them. They were about the length of a hand, around 10 inches roughly. They had come to keep me company and keep me sane, I decided. I saw them only for a minute or so, and then they were gone. After this, I decided that they had merely been figments of a traumatized and understimulated mind, as jail cells are designed to be unpleasant, and the mind can create things in those lonely situations. I never saw them again, until this morning, exactly two years later. I awoke this Christmas morning to the exact same fairies flying around my room. I saw one clearly. She smiled and flew around me, and I remembered her like an old friend. My mother entered my room, and in a haze, I told her that the fairies had come to visit again. She assumed that I was dreaming, but I was very much awake. Where I live in southwest England, fairies are something that many people believe in, and have done for centuries. After the first event, I recently visited a nearby haunted jail, and I learned that one old woman escaped her cell with no plausible explanation. For the rest of her days, she swore up and down that the fairies had helped her. But to me, they are nothing more than fiction, something I never even think about. I suppose it could be some sort of trauma, as every Christmas Eve since then, I've had nightmares of running from the police like I did that night. I like to consider more rational explanations, but then I'm starting to think that I do believe in fairies, and I hope they will visit me again, maybe next Christmas. Our next story is about a woman who experienced a wild glitch in the Matrix, and she wasn't the only witness. Here's her story. If you don't believe in magic or the supernatural, just go to Africa. The stuff you see there is going to change the whole trajectory of your life and everything you thought you knew. I was born and raised in Australia, but when I was 15, I moved to Kenya for four years with my siblings. I just recently came back. 
I'm 19 now. I have a lot of glitch in the Matrix stories in Kenya, but this one is the most interesting to me. My older brother and sister and I decided to go to the grocery store after school because my grandma, who we were staying with, wanted eggs. We found this outside marketplace type thing where all the food is on tables on the side of the street. We were picking some eggs until everyone near me started screaming. I got scared and I looked where everyone else was looking. They were looking and screaming at an old lady. She was just standing still. She looked so normal. Nothing was creepy or scary about her. There were a lot of Muslims in the area of Kenya that I lived in, and they were all shouting Islamic phrases at her, some reading the Quran. It was such a scene. Then, as I was watching her, she disappeared. I can swear on all the heavens and gods above that I am not lying. This woman disappeared on the spot. Just gone. The moment she vanished, everyone started screaming even more. My brother tells me this is all very normal in Kenya, and people believe that women like her are demons, and that's why they were yelling at her to leave. I don't care what it was, but she vanished on the spot. No walking away, nothing to block my view of her, just vanished. My brother and sister saw, the cashier lady at the food place saw, a lot of people saw this. We ran home and told my grandma, and she goes, oh yeah, that's normal here. What? I said. She said that it was people who use black magic to get around and to never interfere with them. I'll never forget what that woman looked like or how my body reacted when I saw her vanish. But along with my other experiences, I know for a fact that the supernatural, magic, and other things exist in our world. So I always thought this was strange. I even told people about it, but chalked it up to people working overnight or something. But now, I'm not so sure. I worked for one of the biggest tech companies for about 10 years. I traveled a lot and sometimes taught workshops. I remember visiting Puerto Rico to deliver a workshop. I was really impressed with the people in the office. They were serving lunch on silver dishes and had a really classy atmosphere. It was a company location, so there were no customers in the office. One strange thing that happened, but not necessarily weird, was after eating lunch with the students, I'd started teaching again, and little by little, the office people would just casually walk in, right past the projector, and me lecturing, and grab lunch. I wasn't mad, I actually found it kind of funny. Besides, the staff had some good-looking and generally nice people, so there's that too. The strange part was that I remember after one class cleaning up for the night and visiting the bathroom before leaving, and I noticed that it was a bit aged. Maybe leaking faucets and water stains, nothing gross, but it was definitely an old bathroom. There were several stalls and urinals. Now, I left likely at around five o'clock and the office was closing down. The next day when I visited that bathroom, it was completely different and looked brand spanking new. I'm talking marble, tile, everything looked like it had literally been done overnight. I remember mentioning this and really getting no response from anybody. That night was when the oil refinery blew up. I booked my flight a day early and got out. I was afraid that it was either an attack or the smoke would force the airport to be closed down, which would cause havoc with me trying to get home. I never did figure out what was going on there with that bathroom or with the people. Looking back on it, maybe they weren't real either. Or maybe it was some kind of glitch. I've mentioned this a few times to people over the years as a funny story, thinking that they had actually remodeled this bathroom overnight. But now that I think of it, there's no possible way that they did that. I was leaving when the office was getting ready to close. 
There were no signs, no workers coming in, and no recollection of the employees the next day. Plus, this work wasn't just a makeover. Like I said, it was granite counters, tile walls, the works. It was just very strange. This happened when I was about nine or 10 years old and I was really into soft stuffed animals. My step-grandma was rich and pretty close with my sisters and I and lived close to us. So we would see her and my grandpa quite often and she spoiled us. We went to a store, not a secondhand store or anything, but I don't remember what store it was. There was a shelf of lambs with cute outfits covered in plastic flowers with what I think was actual wool covering them. They were very cute and soft, and I immediately knew that I had to have one. I asked my grandma and she gave it to me. I was delighted and I brought the lamb everywhere I went for a while. After a few days, I sat the lamb on top of a little toy chest at the foot of my bed. One morning, I was asleep, but I woke up to the sun streaming in on my face. I looked around my room and my lamb was pacing around next to my bed. It looked like it didn't have much control over its limbs, so it was kind of stumbling. It circled around and eventually it was facing me. It looked me in the face and I don't remember anything after that. I woke up later and the lamb was where I had left it, sitting on the toy chest at the foot of my bed. I was so afraid that I buried the lamb under all of my other stuffed animals inside the toy chest, and I tried my very best to never look at it. A few years later, my grandma died of leukemia, and I felt extra guilty about the lamb, since it was a gift from her. But I told my mom about what happened, and she said I should just get rid of it. I donated the lamb to Goodwill, so hopefully it's not actually possessed because then I just made it someone else's problem. Probably everyone reading this is convinced that it was just a dream. And you're probably right. But if it was, it was one of the most vivid dreams I have ever had. It took place in my bed where I was lying down. My messy room had all the same things sitting on the floor as in real life. And every time I saw the lamb after it happened, I got a weird feeling and just got really uneasy and sick. It could have been a dream, but it was so creepy that it still freaks me out to this day. I live on the west coast of British Columbia in Canada, about midway up the coast. I was driving my girlfriend back to her granddad's house, two towns over from mine. It's about a two and a half hour drive on the highways. I had driven her home and spent the day visiting her family. The town she is from is right on the coast. It's a port city. Not super important, but the point is that I spent the day there and was now getting ready to drive back home. About 25 to 30 minutes into the drive, I'm on the highway that runs parallel to the mouth of the river on one side, and the CN tracks on the other. So it goes rail on my left, the road I'm on, and then sort of a mini channel where the river ends. I'm driving and it's getting dark, but I'm not tired or drowsy at all. There's a few rest stops along the road on my right, on the riverbank. I had to pee, so I started slowing down at the first one, and that's when some thing scurries across the road. And that's almost all that happened. It was four-legged, at least from what I saw, and it was the blackest of black, like unnaturally dark. No texture or anything to it. It almost looked like a void of light or color in the shape of this thing. It ran out of the bush, over the rails, 
and I was going slow enough that the wind and highway noise was gone, and I heard it. It sounded like metal tapping as it ran over the ballast and the rail. And then there was the sound like if you took a rod of rebar or something and stabbed it into the ground. Then metal again as it ran right in front of me across the road. Its body was shaped like how some people describe a UFO, almost flat and disc-like, like an oval stretched out with the legs protruding from the front and the back. It had no features. No eyes, no face, no mouth, nothing that I could see. It ran across the road, limbs outstretched as it ran, and then it ran into the rest area and over the bank and I'm guessing into the river. This thing was huge. I'm talking like the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. Very big and very fast. I've tried searching this online, but I haven't had any luck. If anyone can help me figure out what I saw, please let me know. In the early 90s, my parents sent me to a YMCA summer camp in the New Jersey Pine Barrens. It was called something like Matalonike, and it was located on the shores of a series of man-made lakes and Medford Lakes, so not exactly backwoods. We all knew the stories of the Jersey Devil, but the camp had a few of its own ghost stories. The White Lady, said to have jumped off a bridge on her wedding day, and Hatchet Harry, an axe-wielding maniac who got kids that wandered into the woods. I assumed both of these stories were developed to keep kids from wandering off. What I encountered was neither of those. I woke up in the middle of the night in my bunk, hearing some rustling in the bushes. The cabins were basically a half wall with screened windows all around, save for the back wall, with eight bunk beds, four on each side. You could lay in your bunk and look right out the windows. It really sucked, though, when it rained, because there were no shutters to close. I had heard this rustling, so I grabbed my flashlight, and I shined it into the bushes from across the front of the cabin, sweeping from bottom to top. There was nothing else in that direction, save for woods, as our cabin group was right on the edge of the camp. I didn't see anything out there, so I put my flashlight back, but kept it next to me and got ready to settle back in. But then this light reappeared. It was this bluish white light and flickered slightly, kind of like a firefly. The light slowly followed the same path that my flashlight had traced from bottom to top, and then it disappeared. It scared the hell out of me, but I didn't bother to wake my grouchy counselor she wouldn't have believed me anyway, since she already thought that I was just a troublemaker. So I just smushed down into my sleeping bag and tried to get back to sleep. I never saw it again after that point. My best guess is some sort of firefly that thought my flashlight was a prospective mate, although the fireflies in that area usually had a greenish hue. I've shared this story before, but I've never really gotten a satisfactory response. Maybe I'll never know what that was, and maybe it was something totally natural. But I still thought it was really freaky. So, 30 years ago, I'm about 13 to 14. An older friend and I are babysitting for a six-year-old girl and her younger brother. We had been told that sometimes the girl complains about seeing a ghost man in her bedroom and upstairs at night, and that he comes out through the attic door. Now, I didn't believe a word of it. Kids are weird, and they say weird things. We get the kids ready for bed, but they would not settle. The girl said that she felt scared and her little brother started crying. She asked if she could sleep in her mom's bed until she got home, and the little brother wanted to go with her. 
So I tucked them in and I told them some silly stories and I laughed until they were both tired. Both kids were virtually asleep when we left. Door ajar, hall light on. An hour later, we're sitting downstairs watching the equalizer and all was good. The kids were definitely asleep as I had to sneak past their room to use the bathroom. I even had a quick peek on my way back. The little brother got a bit of a mini shoot snore going on, but everything else was quiet. Back downstairs, we watched TV a bit more. About 20 minutes go by, and out of nowhere, we hear banging. Heavy, heavy banging. The kids start screaming immediately. I run up the stairs and meet the kids as they're running out of the room. Now before, I thought it was the kids, but this time I have my eyes on the kids, so I know that they're not making the sound. And we hear it again. Bang. Bang. The kids fly at me, I grab the little brother, and we rush down the stairs into the front room, shut all the doors, and all crash onto the sofa. Everything is silent, apart from the TV, which I turn off. We sat in silence for about five minutes, just kind of holding each other. After a few minutes, the little girl, with tears in her eyes, just says in a very matter-of-fact way, The man was angry because I wasn't in my room, so he tried to push over the wardrobe and then started thumping the wall. This event has stayed with me all these years. A few years ago, I temporarily lived in a cabin out in the woods with my friend due to some unexpected life circumstances. One night, we had another friend over and all three of us had a smoke session in the backyard at about 3 a.m. That was when we started to hear a strange noise in the woods. It kind of sounded like a humming engine coming closer to us. Suddenly, my friend shouts in confusion as he explains that he briefly got blinded by a distant light. A few seconds later, my other friend notices a flying object near the treetops, about 40 meters away. When he points out that the object is see-through and that you can actually see the outlines of the treetops behind it, we are all just stunned and we just look in awe, in complete silence, until the object spirals away super fast up toward the sky in a manner that is certainly not possible with any known technology we have. Then it disappeared. We rushed inside and my friend had the brilliant idea to have everybody draw what they had seen simultaneously without looking at each other's to confirm what we saw. We all showed our pictures at the same time and we all drew the exact same thing. We kicked ourselves over not recording the event for proof but later realized that all of us had left our phones inside while going out to smoke. We joked about the light scanning us to see if we had any recording devices on us. We all went to bed, with both of them sleeping upstairs, and with myself being downstairs, alone. As I lay down, pondering over the experience and feeling a bit uneasy, I suddenly see two orbs floating around the room. One was red, and one was blue. I get a bit freaked out and pretend to be asleep while I watch these orbs float around for about five minutes, then they disappeared. Eventually, I fell asleep and when I woke up the next day, I was eager to share my experience. They informed me that when they woke up and went outside, the door handle crumbled in their hands, like all of the components of the door handle had been dismantled. It was a very surreal experience overall. Aliens, advanced technology not known to the public, I don't know, but it certainly gives me this childlike hope that there's more to this life than the dull reality we live in.
So I used to live near an infamous road. It's a thin road with no street lines, has only a few houses at the end, and is lined with thick woods. There were no street lights. We heard stories like ghosts being spotted in the woods, weird beasts, creepy vibes, and a penny thrown off a small bridge coming back to you. Things like that. Urban legends, really. My boyfriend and I decided to drive down it one night in his car. It was a small stick shift car. The road had several pull-offs where you could park and sit. We pulled off at the first one and took some footage of the woods. Nothing happened. So we continued driving to the next pull-off. We parked and shut off the car. We heard some rustling, but we both assumed that it's an animal moving away from the sound of the car parking. We sat there for a few seconds in the dark of the woods. We heard something hit the car like a rock or something. Then we heard several pounds on the truck and the roof. At this point, we decided to drive off. He attempted to start the car to no avail. He tried this several times before it eventually did start. He then put it in gear and stepped on the gas, but the car stood still. I was freaking out and told him to stop messing around. He said he wasn't. Then the car, while in first gear and the gas was depressed, began to be pulled backwards. Against all logic, the car was fighting to go forward against something that wasn't visible. The taillights lit up the forest behind us and there was absolutely nothing there. Out of nowhere, the car miraculously just jumps forward and we drove away from the pull-off. Blown away by this experience, we decided to find another pull-off. This was stupid. The one we found was before the bridge where pennies are thrown. We go over to the bridge and throw a penny. We hear it hit the small stream. We look back at the car and we swear that we see somebody walk behind it. So we rush back to the car, but there's no sign of anyone. This was the last straw, so we decided to get off that road ASAP. We get in the car and we speed off. As we're driving, something small hits and chips our windshield. It did not sound like a rock. It sounded like a penny. Whatever was on that road wanted us gone, and we haven't gone back since. I'm a bus driver for TransLink, bus 169. It goes through the Riverview Hospital complex in Coquitlam, BC. It's an abandoned mental asylum and hospital complex with most of its buildings run down and just a couple still in operation. It's actually the site of a lot of filming due to how eerie some of the buildings look. I was on my last shift of the night, always on edge, of course, because it's super eerie late at night there. Luckily, I had a couple at the back of the bus, so I wasn't exactly alone while driving through this place. As I was driving through, I saw a man sitting at the bus stop. Immediately, I was filled with dread because it was after midnight, and I doubted that somebody would randomly be waiting for a bus at this hour, especially since this complex was closed off to the public at 9 p.m. every day. So I had to do what I had to do, and I pulled over to let the man in. But the strange thing is, when I opened the door, there was no one there on the seat, and I was pretty sure I saw a person. So I just closed the door and gunned it. I was not going outside to check. That would be a rookie mistake. Anyway, I make it the rest of the route okay, and I pull up to the last stop at the bus loop. I disengaged the locking mechanism for the back door for the couple to get out. Then I heard a guy at the back say, what the? And I turned around and I saw the back door was open, but the couple was still making their way toward the door. Our buses are equipped with a pressure sensitive push bar that activates the door to open when pushed against it. I had disengaged the lock to allow the doors to be pushed open I asked the couple what the problem was. 
but I already knew what it was before they said it. The door had opened by itself. I don't know if it was just a malfunction or what, and maybe it was a coincidence that it was the same night that I stopped the bus for a man who wasn't there. But maybe we had a ghost passenger that night. I'm not sure what to do about driving that route. I really don't want to anymore. Not too long ago, my brother was telling my mom about something that my dad had said to him quite a few years ago that always puzzled him. My dad passed away over 10 years ago, so I can't ask him about it and it really bugs me that I can't get more information. My dad loved being in the woods. They were like a second home to him. Whenever we would take a family trip into the woods, I could ask him what any animal sound was that I heard from the area and he could tell me exactly what animal was making it and any other details I asked. He grew up on a farm, spent time as a forest ranger working in the fire towers, and he enjoyed hunting, so he knew nature pretty well. The woods that we would take family trips to, he was also very familiar with, as some of the fire towers that he worked in were still standing in the area. I think nowadays only one does. My brother said that there was a weekend that my dad decided to take a trip to the woods by himself to do some small game hunting. Not unusual at all for him. The strange part was that my dad came home early. From where we lived at the time, it took two and a half hours and sometimes longer depending on traffic to get to the woods that he liked. He didn't spend the night, even though he had brought everything he needed to camp for two nights. Both my mom and my brother remember him coming home early. Only my dad never mentioned why to my mom and only let it slip to my brother once. My dad told my brother that he heard something making a sound in the woods, a sound that he had never heard before in all his life. He knew it wasn't from any of the animals in those woods. The sound made him pack up and head home during the night. My brother tried to press him for more details, but he quickly changed the subject and never wanted to discuss it again. He never described what type of sound it was. He just said that it wasn't from any of the animals that inhabited those woods. None of the natural ones, anyway. My dad was never easily spooked, especially by nature. Whatever he heard, we have no idea, but it sure got to him good. It eats at me that I can't ask him about it. I really want more details. My brothers still take trips to those woods, and they've never heard anything out of the ordinary while out there. So maybe we'll never know. It was somewhere in the middle of the White Mountains in the summer when I walked into what looked like a scene from a horror movie. A person with zero hiking, camping, or other experience had gotten themselves into trouble. Big trouble. It was around 7 a.m. when I found the campsite. The first thing that hit me was the eerie stillness until I noticed the shredded tent under a tree and the desperate-looking human figure covered in blood, whimpering quietly. I put my bag down, grabbed my kit, and went over to the person. They looked like they had just lost a knife fight with a four-armed man. Deep slashes from one shoulder to the hip, single punctures up and down his back, and hands and forearms full of what looked to be defensive cuts. I patched him up the best I could, gave him water, checked my map, and hightailed it to the closest road. This was before cell phones were super prevalent and barely worked in the mountains. Thankfully, the road was very close by, less than two miles, and I was able to flag somebody down. They took off and I waited for assistance to arrive. It took about an hour until rescue got there. I led them to the still unidentified individual, 
He wasn't very conversive when I first found him. I was sure he'd be dead before we got there, but I was wrong. I assisted rescue bringing him out and took them up on their offer to head into town and get cleaned up. After cleaning up and getting myself situated at their station, I went on my way, leaving them my number to call to let me know what was up with the person that we had helped. I got home three days later and there was a message on my machine. Story goes that the guy I found decided to go camping one day and heard that he had to keep food hung from a tree to keep bears away. Well, he did that, but he put it almost directly over his tent, and not high enough. The night before I happened upon the site, a bear had used the tent, and its occupant, in an attempt to climb the tree to get the food. The guy had woken up to four black bear paws sinking into his body, shifting to reach up. The guy survived and swore to the hospital staff that he was moving to the city and never going into the woods again. Every summer, my family takes a trip to Minnesota to camp out and fish for a week. This includes my aunts, uncles, and cousins. The experience I'm about to share with you took place on Blanche Lake on a dirt road. It's an unlit dirt road surrounded by wetland and forest on each side. One night, my cousins and I stayed up extra late at the campfire and decided to walk down to the road to the highway, which we often do, but never this late. It was about two o'clock in the morning and four of the six of us decided to take the walk down the road, while myself and my cousin Nick decided to stay back and chill by the fire. After about 10 minutes, we both got this creepy feeling, like something was watching us at the fire. We decided to take the walk ourselves and meet up with our other cousins at the end of the road or on their way back. It was a clear night and we could see every star in the sky but it was very dark since the moon was but a sliver. We only made it about a thousand feet down the road when something white became visible in the middle of the road up ahead. We began to jog toward it while hollering, hey guys, wait up, thinking it was our other cousins. We got within about 10 feet when we both came to a screeching halt. It was so dark we still couldn't fully make out what we were looking at, but it appeared to be a woman with long white hair, wearing a white nightgown. She was just standing there, not moving or saying anything. My cousin and I both said, hello, are you okay? But got no response. Neither of us wanted to get any closer and we slowly backed away down the road from where we'd come until the woman was no longer visible. We got back to the campfire and waited for our four cousins to return. Once they got back, we asked them if they had seen anything strange or seen anybody on the road on the way back down. They said that they hadn't. We told them what we had encountered, and the remaining time that we spent by the fire that night just felt like something was still watching us. My family has experienced paranormal activity for a while. We were living abroad in Southeast Asia, where spirituality is an integral part of life. We moved into a building on a hill overlooking the jungle when I was three. It was an affluent neighborhood of the country's capital city. The building had many apartments and one big house at the bottom of the hill, which is where we lived. When I was five, we were hosting a dinner party when all of a sudden we hear a bang. A guest bathroom with doors on opposite sides of the room had shut and locked itself on both sides. My dad uses a screwdriver to open the lock, but there was nobody and nothing to be found inside. Creepy, right? But it gets worse. My auntie came to visit shortly after and she claimed to see an old woman every night wandering the top floor of the house, 
an entity that my mom told me a few weeks ago she would often see when we lived there. The spirits were not malevolent, but they seemed disturbed, and I would often see many black cats roaming around the outside. They didn't seem to belong to anybody. Before we left, we got a monk to come and check the place out. He said that the building had been constructed on top of an old Buddhist burial site, something that is typically not allowed, and that the spirits were not able to rest peacefully. Furthermore, he indicated that the banana tree outside of our kitchen was a hub for spirits to hang out. My parents confronted the landlord, who confirmed that the place was haunted. I'm not very spiritual, but some odd stuff has happened in my life, including that. My parents now always practice feng shui in our house, and for what it's worth, they've had really good luck since then. We moved back to said country a few years later, and we went to visit the place. I was 12 at the time. Sure enough, the building was completely abandoned. The landlord had put it up for sale, and to my knowledge, it never did sell. Back in 2014 to 2015, I was in high school and living with my parents. My parents were heavy on Christianity growing up, so I was raised going to church two times a week. My mom is extremely spiritual as well. Anyway, for years, my mom kept telling everybody that there was a lot of spiritual warfare that was going on in our house. Everybody in my family just thought she was crazy, but I strongly believe that it was true. My sister started going down the wrong path. My dad was apparently cheating on my mom for years, things like that. My parents started noticing some weird type of feces in our basement window wells. So one night, my mom asked me to help her find out what it was by going into the basement with the lights off and only using a flashlight. We went down there and were quietly waiting to see if we could figure out what it was, when all of a sudden we heard a whisper that was so loud, it almost felt like it was coming from a surround sound speaker. It was almost as if somebody came right up into both of our ears and whispered. It immediately sent chills down my whole body, and my mom too. We both froze for a second, and my mom said, What was that? Was that you? And I said, No, what was that? We both bolted up the stairs screaming, and we refused to go back down that night. My dad tried to say that we were just crazy and hearing things. I've never felt so uncomfortable and violated in my entire life. Something definitely whispered into our ears, but we couldn't make out what it had said. Still to this day, thinking about it freaks me out. Since then, my parents divorced and sold the house. Growing up, I had experienced a few strange things in that house, and my sisters did as well. Sometimes we would hear what almost sounded like a phone vibrating in the basement, but we couldn't ever figure out where it was coming from. It happened multiple times in the span of five years. I truly believe that there was a demonic entity messing with my family. I just got back from a visit to Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. I stayed at the Best Western next to Cemetery Ridge. My room actually looked out onto the ridge. On the first night, I woke up at about five in the morning and I looked out the window at the hill. It was a clear night without a moon, so the hill was completely dark. All I could see was the outline of the ridge. I stared at the ridge and tree line for about two minutes not really knowing what I was looking for, and just thinking about the battle there. For some reason, I started thinking about, what if I saw a ghost or an orb? And at that very moment, 
A bright, round, white ball of light came in the tree line at the ridge of the hill. It didn't look like a flashlight, since it didn't have a beam or variate in any way as it moved. It was about the size of a softball, I imagine, since it was about 150 yards away. It started moving right to left along the tree line, and then sped off across the hill toward the angle. If you know that location on Cemetery Ridge, then you'll know what I mean. The whole thing lasted about 30 to 45 seconds, and as it was happening, I wanted to run over and grab my phone to take a picture or a video, but I didn't want to miss anything. I was also trying to figure out what it was. Once it was gone, there was nothing and nobody on the ridge from what I could see. So I got my phone and recorded for about 10 minutes while watching to see if it came back. Unfortunately, nothing appeared, and daylight was starting to break. So, I could actually start making out the trees and a few statues and monuments on the ridge. Needless to say, I couldn't get back to sleep. I feel like I should also add that the movement of light from right to left was erratic, and when it sped off, it was extremely fast, leaving a trace of light behind it. In my opinion, nobody could have run that fast, and there was no indication of a motorcycle or a bike or a car anywhere nearby. So, I don't know, but it was cool nonetheless. This year, my partner needed to be admitted to hospital for an infection with complications. The condition was called Ludwig's angina, and I was allowed to stay with him. We were there a total of three nights. Our hospital is quite old. Think that nasty greenish linoleum and the ceiling panels with the dots. I'm not sure the exact year that it was established, but I imagine it would be over a hundred years old at this point. On the first night that we stayed, I was trying to fall asleep on a couple of chairs that I had pushed together, which was not very comfortable. I tossed and turned for a bit, and then decided that I needed to get up and use the bathroom. Just before I actually got up, my head was rested on the wall beside me. Through the wall, I heard somebody softly calling out my name. Let me tell you, it scared the pee right back up there. I didn't fall asleep that night. I rather just passed out from exhaustion at a certain point. The next morning, my partner and I went for a walk to go and have a smoke, and the hospital is smoke-free, so we had to walk a bit. Just around the corner from our room in the ward, there were two elevators. As we approached the loft, the doors popped open. We both kind of looked at each other with confusion. The light on the button had not been on, so I know that nobody called it. The doors remained open for a while, before we hesitantly stepped in. I felt a presence with us, next to the buttons, as I pressed the G button. When I reached over to press it, there was a cooling sensation. I suppose it just could have been a draft, but either way, we went and had our smoke and came back to find the same elevator still open and waiting for us. We both half-joked about the kind ghost orderly who was helping us get around. Unrelated to the above stay, our hospital has always had weird stuff happening, with all the lifts. For example, it will stop on floors that aren't requested, or it will go too fast or too slow. I suppose it could be easily explained away as mechanical stuff, but nobody's ever been able to find a problem, so I'm not so sure. When I was 13, I babysat a little girl named Emma, one of the sweetest kids you could think of. I was a regular babysitter for her, so much so that when I couldn't babysit for a few months, she called all her other babysitters by my name. This happened after I came back to being a regular babysitter for her. It was about 10.30 at night. I had already put Emma to bed, 
and had been channel surfing. The house was set up so that the front half was open concept. The living room, dining room, and kitchen were side by side. In between the living room and dining room was an open doorway to the back half of the house. At one end was Emma's room, and the other end had her parents, with the bathroom connected to the parents' room. While I was sitting on the couch, I heard something run down the hall to the bathroom. Assuming it was just Emma going to the bathroom, I let it be. A few minutes went by, and I heard the feet heading back down the hall. I turned to tell her to go back and make sure she flushed, because I hadn't heard it, but I only saw the tips of black hair that ran past the open doorway. Here's the problem. Emma is blonde. I quickly jumped up and rushed to Emma's bedroom, throwing open the door. Her nightlight was bright enough to make her out as she sat up and looked at me, rubbing her eyes in confusion. I asked her if she had just gone to the bathroom. When she shook her head, I did a once-over of her room, checking under her bed and a quick peek in her closet. I didn't see anything, so I told Emma I was just double-checking for monsters. I tucked Emma back in, saying goodnight, and as I headed out of her room, leaving the door slightly open, I stopped when I heard her speak. I thought she was going to call me back in and ask me something. But instead, I hear her say, You should have said something. Don't scare her. I really like her. I didn't say anything to the mom about it, and I continued to babysit Emma. Or I did until they moved away. I always made an effort after that to include the second child I didn't know I was babysitting. If Emma was drawing, an extra spot was set up. If she was eating, another chair and table setting was set up. It seemed to make Emma happy, and nothing ever startled me again. Still, weirds me out. For some background, Whenever I took the bus for school, I was pretty much alone on bus rides. I was always on one of those small buses. We didn't have any other kids on there, but the highest amount of kids on the bus was probably around five, including me. I was the only one from my school on that bus. All of the other kids went to the same school. And it wasn't mine. Plus, I've had about four different bus drivers in my time. The one I'm going to talk about lost her husband about a year before, and she was out for a long time. She had just gotten back when this took place. This happened about four or five years ago, and I was still pretty young. For morning rides, we dropped off the other kids, and we were heading to my school. We were the only ones on the road when the bus suddenly stops on the side of the road. I was really confused. I thought maybe the bus had broken down, but being the shy kid that I was, I didn't say anything. I just waited. Then the bus driver opened the door. I started to feel a bit uneasy. We weren't at my school yet, and there was nobody there, so why was she opening it? She stared out the door for like two minutes when I finally said, are you okay? I asked. Without looking away from the door, she said in such a low voice that it gave me chills, there's a man there. There was no man there. No person at all. She kept staring for a couple of seconds when she finally closed the door and continued driving down the road. She wasn't my bus driver after that year and I do miss her. She was a very sweet lady. But that moment still freaks me out. I sometimes think that maybe the man she saw was her husband. I don't know who else she would open a school bus door to. I don't know why she would stop the bus in the first place, especially for a stranger. Maybe she saw her husband and it wasn't until after the door was open that she realized he was dead and that's why she stared. I don't really know what happened that day, but... I'll never forget it. The 
This all started after my dad died last October. We quickly moved in with my grandparents. We lived in California, but now we're in Arizona. Anyway, a few months after that, I went swimming there in the pool. My mom was out there talking to me, and then she went inside to get me a towel. While she was still inside, maybe five minutes later, I went underwater. But before my head went under, I saw the glimpse of a black silhouette. I came back up thinking that it was my mom, but I looked around and she wasn't there. She came back outside about ten minutes after that, and I told her all about it. She said that she had been seeing it too, but didn't tell me the specifics. The second and last time I saw it was the middle of last month. My mom and sister went back to California to get some of our stuff from the storage we have there. They've been gone two nights by this time. It was around 2.30 to 3.30 in the morning. I have insomnia, so I'm usually always up at this time. I was starting to get tired and I dozed off at probably about 2.50. I was only asleep for about two minutes before I heard three loud-ass bangs on my door. I usually get jump-scared in my dreams by a fast movement, but never a loud noise, so I was pretty freaked out. I jumped up and looked around, but I didn't see anything. A few minutes later, I finally got the courage to get out of bed. I walked out of my room and I went down to the restroom across the hall. Before I got into the doorway, out of the corner of my eye, I saw the silhouette again. I looked back, but nothing was there. I don't usually get scared, but that night, holy crap, I was terrified. I talked to my mom and sister about it, and my sister said that she hadn't seen it. But like I said, my mom has seen it. My mom thinks it's my dad, but it doesn't even look like him, and why would he be trying to scare us? Why would he show up as a shadow instead of just himself? No one else that I know has seen it, though. If anyone knows what this is or has heard something like it, please tell me. For reference, I live in Sweden, and my family is very anti-religious. The house we live in is fairly old, dating back around a hundred years. My dad is a very productive person, always getting new hobbies on the fly. One day, he decided to start a bee farm in our backyard. When you take care of bees, you need room that is very clean, too, to keep out the bacteria from the honey. He decided to use our shed in the backyard, which is extremely small. The room can only fit about two people. In the room, we have one desk, which has a couple of drawers in it. In those drawers, we keep all of the necessary equipment when making the jars of honey. My dad had to put labels on each jar of honey, which is a very tedious process. The labels are on a huge scroll about the size of an average adult's small arm in diameter. My dad and I were putting labels on the jars for about 30 minutes before he goes outside for about 10 seconds to get some air. I can see him the entire time. When he goes out, he puts the scroll on the top of the desk. During this time, I was watching and I took out my phone. When he comes back in, we proceed to start again, but out of nowhere, he asks me where I put the scroll. I told him that he put the scroll on the top of the desk, but it's not there. Without the scroll of labels, we couldn't continue working. We start looking all over the room, but nothing. As I described earlier, the room was tiny, which is why it's so odd for something to disappear. We searched everywhere, behind the desk, in each drawer, outside, but still nothing. This happened about a year ago and it's still freaking me out. Usually when my family and I experience something paranormal, we just blame it on something logical and ignore it. But this incident cannot be explained. There is seriously nowhere for that thing to have disappeared to, and that's why it's freaking me out. Even in the unlikely event of it rolling outside, my dad and I would have easily spotted it, 
or just heard it. Moral of the story is, gnomes might still exist in Sweden. This happened at a school camp when I was about 11 years old. Our school camp was scheduled to be at a campground about two and a half to three hours away. I remember talking to people about the camp and where I was going, and one of my friends who was a year older told me that they saw something like a pair of eyes when they were down at the creek one night. Skip ahead, I can't exactly remember what night this was of the five-day camp, but I remember exactly what happened and I always will. We were sitting with the other students and we had just finished eating, meaning it was time to play games and to calm all the kids down. My friend Savannah told me that she needed to go down to our tent and change clothes and asked if I would come with her. I said that I would and one of the teachers said that I could go with her. Keep in mind the tents were way away from the rest of camp and it was actually a walk to get to them as it was a huge campground. So we got a torch and walked down to the tents. We got in and left our tent window open for light as it would have been awkward to have the torch on. Stupid, I know, but we were young. We turned around and I started changing too. Then something very bright caught my attention. I looked at the window and there were flashing bright lights everywhere and I swear there was no way it could have been a camera because there were tons at the window moving so fast. I quickly spun around and in like one second, they were at the door, then vanished. I quickly said to my friend, what was that? And we totally freaked out. We quickly finished getting changed and hurried back to our class and teachers where the teacher had just talked to the class we had to explain what happened to the teachers. It seems like just a sicko taking photos when you hear the story, but I promise that I know it wasn't a camera. You can take my word for that. There was no way, and I've been around cameras modeling and stuff, so I know what all the camera flashes are like. I don't know what I saw that night, and I don't think I ever will, but I know that I will remember that night for the rest of my life. I was off-roading with some buddies back home in eastern New Brunswick, on the Bay of Fundy. There's this trail we go on that ends on the water, and it's at the site of an old ammunition depot from World War II. We've been here many times during the day, and sometimes at night. You can drive into and through this massive old structure, and up the hill is the admin building for this site. It's pretty far into the woods. At the very top of that hill are some grave markers from hundreds of years ago. We were told that they were old private graves. We live on the coast, not at all something that I would doubt being a real thing. We were in there one night in the big building having a fire and we all saw and heard something quite large scramble up the side of the building and then start running on top of it. Now, there are a dozen of us there, so it's clearly not just one person seeing something crazy. There is nothing in the woods of Eastern Canada that should be able to climb as quickly as what we saw. A black bear, maybe. But this thing basically ran up the side of a four-story tall structure and then ran across the top of it in moments. Needless to say, we got in our trucks and hightailed it out of there. On another occasion, we were exploring the admin building, which is three stories tall. It's concrete and it's been abandoned since World War II. We go all the way to the top. Nothing weird happens. But as we're coming back, we notice something weird on the second floor. An entire room is filled with lit candles, 
but there's nobody around whatsoever. We ran out of there so fast. This one, I will admit, could have been an elaborate prank, since lots of people would go and mess around there since it was a fun off-road trail with some history. But the thing that climbed up the building, to this day, that still mystifies me. The year was 1976. We were living in the Middle East. My father was in the secret police called Sabak. It was common that a helicopter would land in our backyard and pick my dad up for a mission or something like that. One night, I saw a bright light and it got my attention. I thought it was my dad returning home on the helicopter landing in the backyard, but I guess it wasn't. But I don't remember anything after the light got really close. I woke up in bed the next day. Well, I thought it was the next day, but I found out that a few days had actually passed. My father was standing next to my bed with two well-dressed men. One was American, I think, and the other was a translator. He introduced one of them as Mr. John and told me they wanted to talk to me. I was confused and they asked a lot of weird questions. Soon after my dad took me, my brother and sister moved us to the UK. We lived there for three years until my next strange encounter. Once again, one of the original two men, Mr. John, with a new guy, questioned me once more. A few months later, on the 4th of July, 1979, we moved to the US and we have lived here ever since. As time went by, I asked my dad questions about the moving and the men questioning me but he would never talk about it until recently when he was diagnosed with dementia. The things he said were incredible, too incredible to be true. I thought it was the drugs or the disease. I thought that's pretty cool if it was true, but there's no way. Well, he's in a nursing home here in Laguna Hills, California, and I went to go visit him. When I walked into his room, to my surprise, he had a visitor. A man, not just any man, but the one that had met with me twice before, a face that I'll always remember. The only problem was that the last time I saw him was 35 to 40 years prior, and he hadn't aged a day. I was older than him. He saw me, pulled his cap down to cover his face, and left without a word. I asked my dad who he was, and he said to me, that's Mr. John. And remember, by Safe Moon. I can't make heads or tails of it to this day. In this story, a Redditor going by the handle Jupsy Danger tells the short but terrifying tale of something that definitely wasn't Nana. Here's the story. So this past Thanksgiving was hard for my family. It was the first Thanksgiving without my biological grandmother, who I call Nana. Her life partner, who is my other grandmother, we call Nain. So on Thanksgiving, Nain and I and my half-brother were sitting in the living room, just reminiscing on the past Thanksgivings that we had spent with Nana. That was when we heard something fall in the master bedroom. Nain had closed the door to keep the dogs out of there, so nobody and nothing was in there. We brushed it off and decided to put on a movie. We were watching it when we heard voices coming from the room. We paused the movie to listen but we couldn't quite make out what they were saying. We assumed it was just the neighbors and weird acoustics, and we were about to continue the movie when we heard a voice call out for Nain in my Nana's voice. Only it wasn't her. We all knew it. Again, she called out, this time for me. 
This time, the tone in her voice was urgent, like she was hurting. Help me, we heard her cry. My older brother, who's never really encountered for nor cared for the supernatural, was shaking. He started to get up, when suddenly, Nain shouted, something that she's never done. Don't open that door, she shouted. Again, we heard my Nana crying while pounding at the door. It was nearing midnight. When it was 11.52, all went quiet. And that was the time that she had died at the previous year. To this day, we haven't spoken of what happened. Nain made me sage the entire house the next day. And nothing's really happened since. But I doubt any of us will forget that Thanksgiving anytime soon. So, I live in a basement in my parents-in-law's house. My wife never goes down to my room in the basement. I'm almost always in there alone. Since I've lived in there, a few things have been happening that I dismissed as ventilation or something else, such as my door slowly creeping open. Frankly, I wouldn't even have noticed it opening if it weren't for the green indicator light of something that I have plugged into the wall outside of my room. At night, if I have to leave my room, I exit and make an immediate left, and I dip into the bathroom for restroom use. I can almost always sense an entity in the living area or bar area of the basement. This feeling is compounded when I exit the bathroom and my reflection appears on the wall out sliding doors. Sometimes I don't have a face in my reflection. I quickly re-enter my bedroom and shut and lock the door. Some nights there's a knocking from within the mattress that wakes me up, usually between 3 and 3.15 in the morning. I have no way of dealing with this other than risking it and fleeing upstairs to my son's room. My son is three, has autism, and frequently says, that's scary, over and over in the basement, looking toward the bathroom and living areas. The light switches that I have access to when leaving the room frequently cease to function right when I need them, or will flicker out almost violently as I'm on the staircase halfway up and out of the basement. I can hear rustling in the middle of the night sometimes as well, and I usually convince myself that it's a mouse. Lately, this has graduated to the sound of footsteps in the ceiling in the middle of the night. Most recently, when I heard those footsteps, no one was home but me, and I searched the house, wielding a knife for an intruder, to find no one. I think this entity is aware that I know it exists. I once interacted with it via the mirror, and it contorted my face. I have no idea what this is, or if I should be concerned. So my family and I moved into a new house, which is a 2 by 4 house. It used to have an attic, but it's been sealed off. After a couple of months into living in this house, sometimes I would be watching TV and hear scratching from the roof. I just played it off, as birds are very common where I live. After about three weeks, the scratching got worse and more frequent. It's like something's trying to scratch its way out of the roof. The attic entrance thing is above the outside of my sister's room. One day, my sister tells my dad that the seal is open. My dad gets confused because it was supposed to be sealed off. My dad goes to close it and realizes that it's really hard to open and close, so whatever opened it had to be strong, and that's when I started to get skeptical. The same night, I went to get some snacks from the fridge. I opened it to find out that they were gone. I figured that my siblings must have eaten them. 
In the morning, my parents are going on and on about a missing cake. That cake was supposed to be for my niece's birthday. They asked if I had anything to do with it, and I said no, along with my siblings. I was getting really suspicious about the attic. So one day, I built up the courage to go check it out. Note that I am probably the most paranoid person in the world, so I was scared for my life, but my curiosity got the best of me. I get the ladder, a torch, and a knife just in case. I open the thing up and I shine my torch to see nothing. But as I search more, I see the cake, empty snack packets, dirty clothes, and a short, dark silhouette that freezes in its spot. Immediately I bold and scream for my parents and I tell them everything. They tell me to stay in my room. They go up and check, but he was gone. I am still shaken up about that moment and I get nightmares from it to this day. We've since moved from that house and haven't had any more issues like that and we live a normal, non-scary life, but I think that day will live with me forever. My wife and I love staying at the Kehoe house. It's lovely, and it's also where we got married. It's also haunted by ghost children. It never fails. Every time we stay there, someone at breakfast is complaining about getting very little sleep due to all the children shaking the bed and pulling on the sheets. We have a friend who was one of the managers there, and while she never saw anything herself, she would often hear odd noises at night. One visit, I decided to leave a digital recorder going in the room while we were gone for the night. I caught a couple of odd sounds here or there, but later on in the recording, I got what was unmistakably the cries of a baby. At breakfast, we noted that no babies or children were guests in the house this visit. Odder still is what we discovered about our room. It seems the bathroom of our room and the neighboring room were once the day nursery for the house. Also, we did an overnight investigation at Moon River Brewery and caught some awesome EVPs. One member of the group had quite the scare in the basement. We heard his scream from upstairs and rushed down to check out the noise. He'd been checking out the back staircase used by the staff and he noticed the dark shadow of someone halfway up. He screamed when it turned and rushed at him. I had my shirt tugged down in the basement. My wife and I were taking a break in one of the rooms on the third floor when we were startled by a loud boom in the room across the hall. It sounded like somebody had thrown a brick across the room. We went in but found nothing out of place. Luckily I had my recorder going and I caught the thunderous sound. Savannah is a place where there is much death due to war or disease. Many people here believe in ghosts. And if you live here long enough, you have plenty of stories to tell, either from your neighbors and friends or your own experiences. Most old places downtown have a tale or two. Heck, these are just a couple for me and I have a ton more. I've lived in Savannah for almost 25 years and I'll probably die here too. Maybe I'll join the ghostly residents and continue the city's paranormal history. As a really small child, I used to be terrified of a doll that my grandmother had that had been handmade for my mother when she was younger. I had repetitive nightmares where this thing would come to visit me for most of my childhood and even occasionally as a teenager and adult. The last time that I was around it physically was shortly after my grandmother died and I still felt uneasy looking directly at it even at 25 years old. My mom sold it during an estate sale to a woman in the town where my grandmother died, and it's lost as far as I know. 
I had always written off this phobia as some weird, irrational childhood fear, because Raggedy Ann dolls are creepy as hell looking, especially when they're homemade, and I just assumed that it was normal. But the hold this doll had on me that made me feel as if it was staring into the depths of my soul constantly, I just couldn't shake. Then something crazy happened. And after doing some research, I discovered that the real life version of the Annabelle doll matched the Raggedy Ann version my grandmother had almost perfectly. I know most of this is just a coincidence, but I have always felt that something was off about this doll. It harbored bad energy. Oddly enough, after all of this, I have inquired about the doll to my mother because I feel like I have this weird connection to it. She told me that she never kept it in the house around me when I was younger because I always cried and became hysterical at night when it was around, so she gave it to my grandmother. I'm just imagining me finding this thing and then driving it home in the middle of the night and crazy things start happening. For the record, I do not believe in ghosts or spirits, but I will go to my grave saying that I picked up on something evil from this doll as a kid. I really wish I had a picture to share, but I honestly avoided this thing as much as possible and always felt that it was looking at me from around the corner at night. I don't know if anybody else has experienced something like this as a kid, where you just knew something wasn't right. It probably sounds dumb, but I honestly believe that something was going on, and my younger self picked up on it. For reference, I live in Sweden. My family is very anti-religious, tends to always look to science and logic, and the house that we live in is fairly old, dating back around a hundred years. My dad is a very productive person and is always getting new hobbies on the fly. One day he decided to start a bee farm in our backyard. When you take care of bees, you need a room that is very clean to keep out the bacteria from the honey. He decided to use our shed in the backyard, which is extremely small. The room can fit about two people. In the room, we have one desk, which has a couple of drawers in it. In those drawers, we keep all of the necessary equipment whenever we make the jars of honey. My dad had put labels on each jar of honey, which is a very tedious process. The labels are on a huge scroll about the size of an average adult's small arm in diameter. My dad and I were putting labels on the jars for about 30 minutes before he went outside for about 10 seconds just to grab some air. I could see him this entire time. When he goes out, he puts the scroll on the top of the desk. During this time that I was watching, I took out my phone. When he came back in, we proceeded to begin again. But from out of nowhere, he asked me what I'd done with the scroll. I told him that he put the scroll on the top of the desk, but it wasn't there. Without the scroll of labels, we couldn't continue working. We start to look all over the room, but nothing. As I described earlier, the room was pretty tiny, which is why it was so odd for it to just disappear. We searched everywhere, behind the desk, in each drawer, outside, but still, nothing. This happened about a year ago, and it still freaks me out. Usually, whenever my family and I experience something paranormal, we blame it on something logical and ignore it. But this incident cannot be explained, and it still leaves a creepy feel. There is seriously nowhere for it to have disappeared to, and that's what still really freaks me out. Even in the highly unlikely event of it rolling outside, my dad and I would have easily spotted it or heard it. Moral of the story... Maybe gnomes still exist in Sweden. This happened over 30 years ago, so I'll explain the incident as best as I can remember. 
When I was three, my grandma on my maternal side died of a heart attack. While at the funeral, the adults were outside talking, smoking cigarettes, etc. Myself, my older brother, and another family member close to our age were told to stay inside to keep us out of conversations that we didn't need to hear, according to my parents. While the other family member convinced my brother that locking me in the viewing room with those red lights over the coffin on was a good idea. Once they locked me in, the other family member called through the door that grandma needed to take me with her because I was her favorite. I screamed and cried as loud as my little self could and some adults took me outside to my parents. I was told that they were just playing and that even though grandma loved me, she was never going to take me away. They were doing their best to soothe a very upset three-year-old. Later that year, we moved two states away from there. One night in the new house, four years later, I woke up in the middle of the night. According to my mom, this was very unusual. I heard a song that only my grandma sang to me. I sat up looking around and I see the lid on my old toy box opening by itself. Once it was fully open, I saw what looked like my grandma standing slowly from inside that box. She turned slowly and creepily around to look at me. I was frozen in place. I couldn't cry. I couldn't scream. I couldn't even move. Then she started walking toward me. She stepped close to the bed and said, I came to get you. You were always my favorite, and now I want you to be with me. Somehow I found my voice and screamed. My mom came running in, and just before she got to my room, my grandma said, I'll come back for you again, and vanished. My mother came in, asking who I was talking to. I told her everything. My mom let me sleep in the living room for a few nights while she got rid of my toy box. The toy box was the last thing my grandma had ever given me before she died. To this day, I have no idea what happened. All I know is that wasn't grandma. When I still lived at my mom's place, I used to share the same bedroom with my younger sister. As a child, she used to sleepwalk almost every night. Nothing creepy, just usually walking to my mom's bedroom or looking for the bathroom and then coming back to bed with the help of my mom. This stopped when she was around 10 years old and for around the next five years, nothing happened. I've always been super sensitive for sensing energies around me. For a long time, I'd felt a deeply bad energy at my mom's home and felt like someone was with me, looking at me all the time. I just felt purely unsafe. One night, I woke up to my sister sitting on her bed across the room, staring at nothing and talking quietly with her eyes fully open. I remember low-key laughing at first, before asking what on earth she was talking about. She didn't say anything to me, but stopped mumbling, while sitting up and staring at that same spot of nothing. I remember frowning and asking who she was talking to, and she turns to me and goes, to that man standing right there. The second she said that, I turned to face the space that she'd been staring at, and I didn't see anything, but I felt an overwhelming dark presence of something in the room. I started crying and literally ran into my mom's bedroom to tell her what had happened. Almost the scariest part about this was that my mom has never believed in anything supernatural or evil. She's Christian, but she only believes in God, angels, and the devil himself, and therefore she never believed our stories. But the second I told her this one, I could see the deep worry and fear in her face. It almost seemed like she had seen or experienced something too. My sister didn't remember any of this in the morning. For around a year, nothing happened. 
But then it all started again. Although that time, it was even scarier. But that's a story for another day. In 2004, I went to Ireland on the super cheap during this one magical week where there were insanely low fares. That's not the glitch, I'm just nostalgic for that time. While visiting family there, I picked up a Ross O'Carroll Kelly book, not realizing that it was a popular series, and read The Orange Mocha Frappuccino Years in about a day. The first person narrator uses a Brett Easton Ellis-like voice, where everything is his impressions in real time. I found it hilarious. At one point, we were walking down Grafton Street in Dublin. We walked past a busker and he was playing Don't Look Back in Anger, and he was right on the So Sally Can Wait etc part as we walked by. Something about how he was singing his heart out, even though it's sort of a cheesy song, impressed me. And I turned to my partner and said, you know, I don't care what anyone else says, I love this song. And she said, yeah, too bad the buskers have ruined it. And I was like, what? And she said, yeah, I heard another one doing it earlier. I had been with her, but I hadn't noticed. Later, in a train station news agents, we were selecting supper. It was either a triangle sandwich each or a candy bar each. And another book in the Ross O'Carroll Kelly series, The Teenage Dirtbag Years, to read on the next train. We chose candy and the book. She'd read two pages, then I'd read two, passing it back and forth, perfect for a late evening train where half the people were sleeping and the rest were quiet. She handed me the book with an odd expression at one point, and I looked down to read. It said, So I'm walking down Grafton Street with Sorsha, and we walk past this busker, and he's doing Don't Look Back in Anger, giving it all, so Sally can wait. And I turn to Sorsha, and I say, I don't care what anyone says, that's a great song. And she says, yeah, too bad the buskers have ruined it. My own skepticism says, okay, common street, common buskers, and if you google the title of the song and busker and Grafton, there's a YouTube video of a guy playing that song in 2014. So it is a cliche. And our conversation wasn't at all original, filled with phrases that are really just filler in a way but it still felt really eerie. And honestly, it kind of still does. So something just happened in the basement and I thought I'd tell you about it. Here's a little house layout to help a bit. Our living room has two ways to enter, one from the kitchen and one from the front door. The staircase leads right down to the front door. The way to the living room from the front door has you pass a hallway that has closets and the door to the basement. So it's 1.39 in the morning and I'm done scrolling through social media and decide to sleep. However, I want to cuddle with my kitty while I rest. I have a kitty sleeping on the headboard, but she's so peaceful I don't want to interrupt her. So I decide to head down to the main floor to find one of my other two cats. Down the stairs, I see my fluffy Newfoundland dog sleeping by the front door as usual. I decide to take the way through the kitchen to grab a snack. Then I come into the living room and I see my other cat sleeping in their cat tree. They look so peaceful, I decide it would be rude if I let one sleep and took the other one to cuddle with. So I let them sleep and started my way back into my room through the hallway. As I come to the archway from the living room to that hallway, the basement door slams all the way open, hitting a table that we have behind it. I'm scared out of my mind and immediately turn around to go the way through the kitchen. As I approach the front door, I pet my dog, and I remember thinking, maybe I'll see a ghost down the hallway. I can take a peek. 
My biggest fear is ghosts and demons, so I have no idea why I did this. I don't even walk to the hallway. I just peek around the wall. The basement door is swaying back and forth gently. I get even more scared and run to the top of the stairs, into my room, shut the door, pull up Reddit, and basically now dreading the fact that I have to pee because I don't want to leave my room. I want to say that it's the air conditioning, but down that hall, there are no vents. The only vent is in the laundry room, which is past a weirdly long hallway, and it has a door. I have no idea what could have made that door do that. So this happened a few years ago, when I was around the age of 18. A group of friends and I were staying at this friend's late grandparents' house in a ghost town in the mountains of Italy. The house is built on two floors, with a small courtyard on the front and stairs connecting the two floors on the outside of the house, accessible from the courtyard. When this happened, we were chilling out in the courtyard. Some other people and I were facing the entrance of the house, and we were able to see the inside of the second floor, specifically the one central corridor with the door to the different rooms. Two people got inside the house and went into the bathroom, which is at the end of the corridor, on the right. A few minutes later, they got out and called for us, asking if somebody had opened the trap door leading to the attic, which is located at the very end of the corridor, right outside the bathroom. That's where things got weird. There was no way for someone to open the trap door, as you would have needed a ladder to get there. The ceilings are quite high, and the only ladder could be found at the ground floor, locked behind the front doors. Also, all of us who were facing the front of the house and looking directly to the inside should have noticed if someone or something was moving. And similarly, the two people in the bathroom should have noticed something as well, as the bathroom has one of those opaque glass doors. As soon as we all realized that there was no way someone in the group could have done it, we all got inside the house, but nobody really had the courage to look into the attic. So we just closed the door and tried to go on with our day. But everybody kept feeling quite uneasy for the whole time, seeing weird shadows or hearing steps coming from the attic. I suppose it could have easily been power of suggestion. I don't know how we did it, but somehow we all fell asleep. In the morning, after some friends finally decided to go check the attic, the room was completely bare. The only thing that they found there was a hammer, standing on its head in the middle of the room. It's fair to say that only creeped us all out more, and it really didn't make us want to look into the attic or whatever had happened more than we needed to. So again, we all just got out of the attic, closed the door, and we were very glad to go back to the city later that day. For our next tale, Reddit user ThatGothWitch1 recounts the story of a Ouija board session gone wrong. Here's what happened. Roughly eight years ago, during spooky season, I was staying with my boyfriend's mom and her baby daddy at the baby daddy's house. My boyfriend was away in another town, visiting his grandmother and friends. My boyfriend's mom and his two sisters and I were watching a scary movie when we somehow ended up in a conversation about how the house that we were in had a history of being haunted. 15-year-old me absolutely loved the occult and witchcraft, especially Ouija boards at the time. You see where this is going, right? I proposed the idea of making and using one. Stupid idea, I know. And everybody was all up in arms for a spooky October evening. I don't remember what the session consisted of regarding questions or answers, but there's a very good reason for that. About 15 minutes into our session, we get to talking about our creepy experiences. 
A woman's blood-curdling scream erupted from the downstairs basement, echoing up the stairs to the living room where we were. The baby daddy was asleep, mind you, and even if he hadn't been, there was no way in heck that he could have produced such a terrifying noise. Not a chance. This scream was not a regular scream. It sounded like a few different things. In one way, it sounded like a woman was being brutally stabbed to death and was in excruciating pain. In another way, it almost sounded otherworldly, straight up demonic. It reminded me of what I would imagine a banshee to sound like if I'd ever heard one. We all panicked. All four of us heard it. It sounded so clearly like a physical person, so much so that we were scared that somebody was really down there, so the mom went down to make sure that there wasn't, and there wasn't. We said goodbye and ended the session. To this day, I'm still unsure if it was a lost spirit calling for help, or if it was a dark entity making its presence known. I grew up in Monroe, Washington, about 45 minutes northeast of Seattle. Small, quiet town, with mostly woods and forests around it. I grew up and my mom and cousins used to always tell me a story about a man they called the Grocery Bag Man. The name is exactly what it sounds like. A creepy man in a trench coat, always carrying around one bag in each hand. This wouldn't be scary except for the fact that all of our houses were spread pretty deep in the backwoods, miles from downtown, where you would get groceries. Every single one of my family members would see him around their respective homes, usually early in the mornings. I never believed in this guy. I thought it was a joke. When I turned 16 and I could drive, I would always spend time with friends in and around the backwoods of Monroe. One night, I was driving to my friend's house who lives about 10 miles out of town, in a deeply secluded area. It's hilly, there are no sidewalks, and you never see people out. In order to get to this house, you had to drive into town from my house, and then back up another back road. As I drove down around 11 o'clock at night, I finally see Grocery Bag Man. One bag in each hand, trench coat long and creepy, disheveled hair. When I passed him, I swear he stared straight into my soul. I speed to my buddy's house for a little party, and I'm telling my friends about what I saw and the story that my family used to tell me. Of course, I'm being made fun of because nobody believes me. I eventually say, screw it, and stop trying to prove to them that there's this creepy dude haunting the old roads. At about two o'clock in the morning, we decided to drive into town to get some jack-in-the-box food, as high school boys tend to do. We all pile into my buddy's truck and start driving out of his neighborhood development. As we hit the stop sign to turn onto the main roads, I kid you not, Grocery Bag Man slowly walks past our car and continues down into the abyss. Needless to say, they weren't making fun of me anymore. I'm not sure if this is a numerical glitch or just an uncanny coincidence. This story isn't anywhere near as interesting or eerie as some of the stuff I've seen and heard. It might be one of those guess-you-had-to-be-there stories. But this rather strange thing happened to me and I strongly feel like it was either a glitch or a synchronicity of some sort, and I've always wanted to tell this story. When I was in my early teens, I always liked the numbers 2549. They were just my favorite numbers, specifically those four, specifically in that order. I don't know why, but I always felt like they rolled off the tongue, and being a dumbass kid, I'd go around saying, 2549, 2549. If I needed a password for something, it was 2549. 
When my parents let me choose their lottery numbers, it was 2549. My brother would always tell me to shut up and that nobody cared about my favorite numbers and that they weren't cool or significant in any way. I knew that. I just liked them. Fast forward to me turning 14. I got my first cell phone. My parents were very strict. I never had a phone as a child. Anyway, I'm really bad with technology. So I asked my tech-savvy brother to help me with setting it up and with SIM activation and whatnot. A few minutes after fiddling around, he looks at me in disbelief. He goes, Lainey, have you seen your cell phone number? I hadn't even looked at it, let alone tried to memorize it. So I was like, no, why do you ask? He was like, come over here and have a look. I swear that the last four digits of my cell phone number were 2549, in that order. My favorite four numbers, in the correct order, just happened to be the last four digits of my first cell phone number, a randomly generated number that nobody had picked. My brother's the only one who understands the strangeness of it, because he had heard me harp on about those numbers our entire childhood. We both just stared at it and then laughed at how coincidental it all was. To this day, my phone number is still the same, and I always chuckle to myself when I give people my number because I still enjoy saying the numbers out loud, just as I did when I was a kid. Life is weird. My dad grew up in the 70s, in a wooded area in Maine. It was a tiny neighborhood, with woods surrounding the outer part. My dad had all sorts of unexplained activity in his mother's house, but this is the one that stuck with me. My dad was around nine or 10. He couldn't sleep. Right beside his bed was a window and he could easily look out it from his bed. He heard noises outside and he got excited because he thought it was a moose or some wild animal so he whipped open the shade. There was no moose. Looking back at my father was a little boy his age, maybe a little bit younger. He wasn't sure exactly what he was seeing. It was very foggy. But it was undeniable that he was looking at a little boy. A little redhead boy with overalls on and one of those stupid propeller hats. My dad wanted to close the shade and pretend that he had never seen him, but he just could not look away. The boy smiled and waved and began to walk away, becoming harder for my dad to see. Eventually, the boy disappeared into the fog. It was dark, and there was this thick fog. It was easy for my dad to convince himself that he imagined the whole thing, I think little kids find it easier to convince themselves that nothing has happened, that they just have an overactive imagination. I mean, that's what adults always tell children anyway. My dad was over at a friend's house a few days later. They were outside shooting BB guns, normal kids in the 70s, freedom type playing. The friend's dad was working on a car. My dad tells his friend this story thinking that they would both laugh at how silly my dad was. My dad told the friend, but he didn't laugh. His eyes got wide and all the color drained from his face. The friend books it over to his dad. My dad panics a little bit, thinking that his friend was telling his dad that he was trying to scare him and that my dad would get in trouble for it. Instead, the boy runs up to his dad and says, Dad, Dad, he saw the boy with the funny hat, too. This incident in particular happened late one night in my grandma-in-law's kitchen. Grandma had a sister-in-law who was visiting from the East Coast. She had gotten in late that night, and I went over to visit the two of them with my husband. We were all sitting around the kitchen table, 
the same one that my grandpa-in-law's mother had owned when she built the house. There were a lot of jokes going around the table, and Grandma started coughing from laughing too hard. Now, she was in poor health as it was, and she was supposed to take breathing treatments. However, with her having so much fun, a rare occasion since Grandpa had passed, she didn't want to leave the table. My husband was concerned and told her that she had to take her breathing treatment. After some convincing, she got up and started heading in that direction. But then she got sucked back into the conversation and distracted from her treatment again. She again started coughing heavily. This was the moment when my husband told her again she needed to take her treatment. He said, if grandpa saw you right now, he'd be nagging you to take your treatment. That's right, my grandma's sister-in-law said. Don't make me have him call you. Grandma gave a little, yeah, right, kind of chuckle. Right at that moment, the sister-in-law's track phone that she only uses when traveling started to ring. We all stood there spooked for a moment, and the sister-in-law went to answer it. Immediately, it disconnected, as soon as she opened it, after several rings. The weirdest part is that this was at like 11.30 p.m. East Coast time, on a phone that nobody would have the number to, outside of my immediate family. Grandma immediately took her breathing treatment after that, not wanting to argue with what could have been a message from beyond the grave. Her husband had always diligently reminded her about her treatments while he was alive, so we didn't think it would be unusual for him to do the same after. I'm not sure what exactly happened there, but I like to think that it was Grandpa. I know my grandma felt that way too, especially after other instances of footsteps in the house and sounds of him getting up in the night for water long after he passed. So, a few weeks back, my neighbor was over talking and just shooting the breeze, hanging out and whatnot. My other neighbor called me, and when I went to answer, my phone randomly died. I told my neighbor, phone's dead, I'll throw it on the charger and head out. When I put my phone on the charger, I waited for the screen to tell me what percent the battery was. It stayed black, as if the battery was completely drained. I waited about 20 seconds and it finally lit up, confirming a 5% charge. I was headed back to the living room when I thought I heard my buddy in the bathroom. I noticed that the light was off and it sounded as if he was in there trying to play a prank on me, scare me or something like that. So I tried to walk in and scare him, but it felt like I was being stopped at some sort of invisible force field. I tried my hand and it just went numb like a dead arm. The harder I tried to get into that bathroom, the more drained and the weaker I felt. I tried to force my way in. The door was completely open and it was pitch black inside. It was about 10.30 at night. I tried with some decent effort and it just felt as if something was grabbing me from the center of my chest, pulling me back and away from the bathroom. I imagined like somebody had a hold of my sternum and forcefully pulled me out of the bathroom and back into the hallway on the floor. I physically collapsed as if I had just run a marathon, absolutely drained and with no energy. I finally got my energy to stand back up and get to the door. My buddy says, that was quick. Hey, uh, what's wrong? I walked to the couch and sat down. I told him that I thought I had heard him in the bathroom and I collapsed when I tried to walk in. He told me that I had walked out of the back hallway and told him, I'm going to be right back. I forgot that I wanted to put some cologne on. I have no memory of this. Was that some spirit or entity that took over me? Did my doppelganger come and visit and take over my life for a second? I was completely sober and I was halfway through one beer when my phone died. So, I have no idea what happened. A 
A while back, the night before the last full moon, I went outside past midnight. It was pretty dead quiet outside, especially since it was during a big cold snap. I was out for fresh air when I heard the sound of chains and ice crackling in the near distance. I got a creepy vibe, but I tried to ignore it. There were no cars or people out that I could hear or see. Suddenly, I heard and saw my backyard gate creak open. I felt this intense presence as I heard footsteps quickly approach me. I ran inside and closed the door before it got to me. I couldn't see anything, but I did get a picture in my mind of a being with antlers or horns or something, not clear enough to say for sure, but it felt like it was speaking to me telepathically. I could tell that it read heavy energies, and it told me don't carry their burdens, and that my heart was lighter than I believed, to keep it pure and I'd have nothing to worry about. I asked it about how to heal or let go of these pains and frustrations that I'd been having with trying to move on and let go of an ex-toxic friend. They told me that they didn't do that kind of work and left. I got the feeling that they did heavier work. It didn't seem to have any harmful intent. There was a wisdom to it, but not something or someone that I would want to cross paths with if I were up to no good. I live in central Canada, if that helps, the prairies. I can't seem to find anything specific online about any deities or entities that match. There's Krampus, but I feel like I highly doubt that that was it. It was way past Christmas, and I don't think it's tied to Canada at all either. The words mentioning my heart being lighter than I believed made me think of Anubis but I still don't think that it was Anubis either. I'm not really sure what I encountered that night, but it was really fascinating. I was probably 10 to 12 years old, and my friend, I'll call him Bill, and I, were going over to another friend's house, I'll call him Jake, for a sleepover. I'll keep this brief, but this has always stuck with me, and I felt like sharing. We were all hanging out in the living room in the late afternoon. I wanted a drink, so I walked into Jake's kitchen. When you walked in, there was a table to your immediate right. I think it was Jake's birthday or something, so there were some balloons tied to the chairs. I looked over and I saw an old man sitting in one of the chairs. At least I thought I did. I only saw him for a split second, and I assumed I was just seeing things. Never mentioned it to my friends because it was honestly just a, oh, I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye kind of thing. An hour or so went by and Bill went to the kitchen for some food or whatever. When he came back, he told Jake and I that he saw a man sitting at the kitchen table. I got so excited because this was a damn sleepover and now we had ghosts involved. I told them that I thought I had seen the same thing earlier, and Jake said it sounded like his dead grandfather. Later that night, Jake's dad was working at the kitchen table before going to his bedroom. Once he was out of there, I went back to get some food, and I saw him still sitting at the table. I literally turned to ask, didn't you just leave? But there was nobody there. Some other things happened after that, but I kind of chalked those things up to our overactive imaginations given the first thing. I have two reasons, though, to believe that this wasn't a ghost. Number one, maybe we mistook one of the balloons for a human head. Totally possible. Number two, maybe I did tell my friends what I saw the first time, and I'm just blocking that part out of my memory. This would make what Bill said seem totally unbelievable, because he was younger than me and probably just wanted attention. But I'm 90% sure I never said anything to them, because I really didn't think anything of it when I first saw it. The balloon thing has been my main theory. I'm not a believer or a disbeliever in the paranormal, 
This is the only story I have that could have been paranormal, but it's really hard to tell what happened. A couple of months ago for my sister's birthday, she wanted us to take a trip to Savannah, Georgia. She paid for the hotel, which was a room in one of the guest houses from the historic 1790 Inn. The guest house itself was located directly across from the old Thomas House and slave quarters, and a couple blocks behind us was the Colonial Park Cemetery. I had looked the place up, looking for ghost experiences, but nothing came of it really. Lots of people had said that they had no ghost experiences, but that it was a nice day. So while I was excited to stay, I wasn't really expecting anything paranormal to happen. Now there were a few small things that could easily be explained away perhaps. Like a few times we thought we had left our parlor door open, only to come back to find it closed. Or we left the TV in our room off and we came back to find it on. But maybe we were just really forgetful. While at Colonial Park Cemetery, we both felt a pull on our right pockets and we felt cold spots. Again, small things that could probably be explained away. But after exploring the city all day and having some night tours, got to go by the Sorrelweed house too, we went back to the hotel exhausted. We were sharing the bed. We grew up together mostly sharing a room, so this was nothing new for us. But we were laying in bed watching TV, both on our phones, when the little trash can by the bathroom sounded like the bag inside was getting rustled very loudly. We both shot up and looked at it. It lasted for about 15 to 20 seconds. I got up, half expecting to see a rat or something pop out. The hotel was very clean. I never saw any rats or bugs, but I couldn't think of anything else it could be. I didn't find any explanation for the sound. I snapped a picture of it and we both ended up going to sleep. It should probably be noted that the vents for the AC unit were on the other side of the room and the trash never made a noise before or after this night. I know it's such a small experience and it's probably not even noteworthy, but at the time, in the moment, it definitely caught my attention. I will start by saying I was a devout skeptic before this experience. It has changed me. It was the summer of 2016, a few months after my sister was born, and my family and I had some old family friends over at our house. We'd been hanging out nearly all day, and it was getting to be around the time of sunset. My friend and I, who I'll refer to as Adam, went on a walk to the ponds in my neighborhood and stayed there for what I remember being about 30 to 45 minutes, just enough time for it to become dark enough to see the stars. At this point, we begin the short walk back to my house when I noticed a star in the sky, which appeared to be moving. I tell Adam this, and he says that he too can see it. At this point, we're standing at the end of my driveway, looking up at the sky. We watched the star for roughly five minutes when we noticed two other stars, all of which are moving toward each other at around the same speed. Now this is where it begins to get really weird. Adam pulls out his phone and attempts to record it, but it ends up being too dimly lit for his phone's camera to see, sadly. Nearly immediately after Adam had put his phone away, all of the stars had stopped in a blank patch of sky, devoid of all other lights and stars, and formed a large triangle. These lights then began moving as one unit and turning clockwise in the sky. They remained in this formation and movement for nearly five minutes before stopping, then proceeded to move at a speed which I've never seen before, away from each other, and disappeared into the night. 
Based on the reactions of people back at the house, both Adam and I were visibly shaken up. When we tried to explain what had happened, they shrugged it off, as us just not knowing what we saw. I know what I saw, and so does Adam. Green Cove Springs has a history of military and government establishments and compounds, none of which are currently active. However, there is a significant amount of military infrastructure still in use as housing and places of business. It makes me wonder if this had something to do with some sort of test flight. Either way, we saw what we saw, even if we don't know what it is. I took my super skeptic boyfriend on our first camping trip up to the Mount Adams area because I'd heard of some spooky UFO action in the area. We hadn't been dating that long. We saw some UFO action that defied his skeptic explanations in a dispersed spot, but nothing I hadn't seen before. Lights appearing out of nowhere, zipping along and then disappearing, lights appearing and joining up and then disappearing, stuff like that. It was pretty satisfying to hear him say, yeah, I have no idea what that was. A few months later, we were camping with his dad and stepson, who were both longtime veterans in the Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management. We mentioned the spots where we had camped, and his stepdad, who is not a believer of anything like this, said that the area we'd been in had been his beat for years. Without any prompting from us, he said, we were supposed to be up there looking for camp thieves. We never caught any thieves, but we saw a lot of weird stuff in the sky. When I pressed him for details, he got a little cagey, but he did tell a really creepy story about how these big black logging trucks with no lights would appear and steal lumber in the middle of the night. So he and his partner staked out one night to catch them. They were backed into the bush and had to sit in complete silence to let the truck cool down so nobody could detect them with heat or night vision goggles. The back of the truck was deep in the bush, meaning that only the forest was behind them. Then after over an hour of sitting in silence, these huge bright lights appeared behind them from deep within the forest. They were so bright he could see the entire outline of the truck, the antenna, the spotlights, and their silhouettes in the shadow. This was the early 80s, so we're not talking LED lights here. He said that he'd never seen anything like it. Then the lights went out, and everything was silent. No truck noise, no rustling in the forest behind them, nothing. I love the guy, but he has the imagination and personality of a potato, so there's no way he made this up. That's why it was so creepy and believable to me. He had a few other stories, too, that I'd love to get more information on. I, for one, believe him. When my mother was a little girl, she spent her early years in a remote area of Mexico no electricity, no running water, and definitely no air conditioning. Due to so many people all living in one small house, it wasn't uncommon for her and a few of her siblings to sleep on the porch. Yes, you heard that right. They slept on pallets outside. She recalls that it was actually much cooler some nights on the porch than it was in the house. The porch had a screen that my grandfather had installed, and he also built their house with his own hands. The closest neighbor was miles away, so from my understanding, the house was pretty much in the middle of nowhere. My mom and three of her other siblings were the lucky ones, who got to sleep outside every night. They never had any problems or fears, until the night that the baker boy began to come around. He was a small child with golden curls, dressed in white baking attire, 
wearing a mask that was real pigskin. He would walk in circles around the house, reciting a certain phrase that my mom never really understood, because it wasn't in Spanish or English. At first, they were scared, but over time, they grew to appreciate his presence. It was almost as if he was walking around the house to protect them from whatever fate had maybe happened to him. They never knew who he was, or if he was even real. They just knew that they all saw him. My grandpa never believed them and assumed that they were making it up so they could come inside the house, but they swore that they weren't. It wasn't until, over time, an outline of his path began to show up around the house. Needless to say, they didn't stay in that house much longer and moved before they eventually made it into the States. The strangest part is that before my grandpa died, he told my mom that he had finally seen him. The Baker Boy was real. Redditor OK Armadillo 3754 went out on a two-week trip through Washington with his girlfriend. They decided not to plan anything and just see where the trip took them. They got a little bit more of the unplanned than they bargained for. This is their story. A couple of years ago, my girlfriend and I decided to take a two-week trip to Washington State. One of the main goals of our trip was to plan virtually nothing. We wanted to take off, let adventure guide us, stop when we saw something cool, and go back home when it was time. So that's what we did. We started out and just made it up as we went along. It was incredible. First we visited Yakima, Washington. Then we traveled over to Seattle, wandered through Olympia, explored Bremerton, and eventually made it to Forks. At this point, we decided to go to the Ho Rainforest, which is one of the largest temperate rainforests in the United States. After we'd been there for a while, wandering through in the car, we realized we'd somehow gotten lost. In fact, we were about 20 miles off track, and we ended up in what looked like a tree logging operation. Everywhere we looked, we saw these wide open sections with tree stumps as far as the eye could see. Traveling through this area, the sun began to set. I can't remember exactly what time of day it was when we saw it, but off in the distance, maybe 100 to 125 yards, I saw movement. Whatever it was, it was moving quite fast, and that intrigued me. I slowed down the car and kept my eyes on the figure, trying to see what it was. At first, I thought it was just a bear. Then, as it passed through a cleared area, I realized something that made my hair stand on end. It was running on its hind legs. I watched for about 15 seconds before this thing finally disappeared into the forest. Whatever it was, it was going at least 30 miles per hour on its hind legs, over quite a distance. I have no explanation for what we saw. But whatever it was, it was no bear. One night, Redditor Only Figs 278 took their dog for a walk. They spotted something familiar in the woods and then froze. This is their story. I was walking my dog outside before putting him to bed at around 11 p.m. It's very dark, as there's a lot of wooded areas around my apartment complex. I usually walk him about half a mile or so out from the complex to a stop sign and light post at the end of the street, which borders the woods. Usually there's nothing out of the ordinary, just woods and the normal animals like squirrels and the occasional deer. Sometimes 
there's that weird heavy feeling, like somebody is watching you intently. But I mostly ignored it, and we cut our walk short and headed home, since a brief scan of the area showed that nothing was there. Tonight, there was that heavy watched feeling again. But when I scanned the woods, there was something there. A dog with glowing yellow eyes. A dog that looked exactly like my dog, down to the heart-shaped white spot on his chest, standing just past the tree line, staring directly at us. It looked like it could have been his identical twin, but there was just something off about it that invoked that feeling of run. My dog definitely saw it too and was whining and staring hard at it. Usually my dog is reactive to other large dogs, but he seemed more scared than anything else and he wanted to get away too, which is very abnormal behavior for him. After seeing it, I fought that run feeling and I walked quickly but casually back into the gated area and home without looking back, but listening very hard for anything coming behind or to the sides of us. Instinctively, it felt like the safest thing to do, but I don't know why. It seemed like it didn't follow, but who knows. I do know that I will be skipping nighttime walks for a while, that's for sure. Any ideas on what that might have been? Google wasn't much help. We live in North Georgia, at the base of the Appalachians, but I didn't grow up here, so I don't really know about the local folklore. Whatever it was, it was definitely creepy. For this next story, Reddit user PrestigiousNeck873 recounts their mom's tale about a rather heartwarming paranormal encounter. Here's her story. My grandma unfortunately passed away around five years ago. She was living here with my grandpa, and they were both on my mom's side. Unfortunately, again yesterday, my grandfather passed. What makes this a ghost story, though, is what happened twice the night before their passing. The night after my grandma passed, my mom had a very vivid dream that she told us about. The dream started with my grandma coming out of her room. My mom was in tears asking her, Mom, are you okay? And grandma reassured her multiple times, Don't worry, don't worry, I'm fine. My mom looks down and notices that my grandma's oxygen tank wasn't plugged in. She wasn't connected to it. My mom had said, Mom, your oxygen. My grandma just looked at her endearingly and said, Oh, I don't need that thing anymore. And then my mom woke up. Fast forwarding to more recently, my grandpa has been very sick. He gave up on his health and took very poor care of himself and wouldn't accept any help. He often said that he wanted to die. My mom tried so hard to get him to change his life and go to a hospital, but he wouldn't go or take any medicine. One day, we heard nothing coming from his room. We could usually hear a TV on, him coughing once in a while, but there was just nothing. At that point, he was gone, but we didn't know that yet. That night, she had another dream, but this time with my grandpa. He walked out of his room and made his way to the restroom, and Mom asked, Oh my gosh, are you okay? We hadn't heard from you. He smiled and looked at her and said, Yes, don't worry. We're okay now. My mom described him clearly smiling with tears in his eyes. She woke up the next day, ran into the room, and found him passed away. What makes it crazier is that both dreams happened the night of the day that they passed away, even though my mom hadn't known yet that they were gone. May they rest in peace.
When I was 15, I traveled to Europe with my family. We stayed in Ital, Germany, in a small inn for a few nights. My parents had a double bed on the second floor. My sisters had the double bedroom next to theirs, and I was lucky enough to have a single room all to myself at the far end of the hall. When we went to check into our rooms, as soon as I entered the hallway, I remember almost feeling as though I had walked into a wall of sorts, of bad energy. I just felt so unnerved and uneasy in that hallway, but I passed it off as an overactive imagination. I slept the first night without any issues, other than waking up a few times. The next morning at breakfast, one of my sisters mentioned feeling really uncomfortable in the hallway, almost as if the air was crushing her. It unnerved me even more that I wasn't the only one who felt weirded out. Plus, she was an adult at the time, so it further cemented in my head that the wing of the hotel was odd at least. Later that night, I'm sleeping peacefully, when at about 2 a.m., I'm awoken by something ripping the covers off of me and being jerked about two feet toward the end of the bed by my ankles. At first, I thought somebody had broken into my room because when I turned toward what had grabbed me, a huge looming dark shape was visible. It was darker than the darkness. It was like a man was in my room. I frantically flipped on the light, only to find that absolutely nothing was there. The window was locked from the inside. There was nobody in the closet or in the bathroom, and my room was also still locked from the inside. I stayed up the rest of the night, scared, playing on my DS. The next morning, we're at breakfast, and my sister mentions that she was up half the night because she thought she saw a person silhouetted against the wall of the room. But when she turned the light on, there was nobody there. It was just such a bizarre and creepy experience. We checked out that day, so I didn't get to experience anything after that. But I think I'm all right with that, because it still freaks me out to this day. For almost 10 years, a few other people in my family and I have had very extreme paranormal experiences. Most of it is too long to get into now. A lot of it is tied to a house that's demonically possessed, and possibly a deceased family member who was quite emotionally disturbed and dabbled way too much in the wrong parts of the occult. But last night, I had a very intense dream. In it, this feminine demonic creature thing was over my grandfather in his sleep. I went to go fight it, and it screamed at me like a banshee. I backed away for a second, right before I woke up. Like I said, this thing felt very feminine, but to describe how it looked is a little bit difficult. It looked almost as though a large, roughly human-sized sheet of leather became sentient and started floating and moving and flying. It didn't have a solid, discernible form exactly either. It literally almost looked like a flying leather monster. It was so black, roughly around where its head might have been, that it was more black than black itself, if that makes any sense. But besides that, like I said, it just sort of looked like a flying leather monster. And then, of course, there was the horrible, threatening scream. I've had other encounters in my sleep with evil paranormal entities at this point, and it's pretty much all connected to that certain house, and possibly that family member. But I'm just wondering what it was. Was it actually a banshee? There's also this wolf that has been stalking around the house for a few months now. It attacked our dog, actually. The house is in Connecticut, but it's in the north, where it's very condensed forest. So it's extremely uncommon, but not unfathomable, that a rogue wolf ended up there. I personally saw a mountain lion there once, and I've seen my fair share of black bears. But I don't know what this thing could have been. 
I haven't actually lived in the house in question for about four years. Other family still does, though. I don't know what's going on, and I've never seen an entity like that thing before. I'm just trying to figure out if anybody might know what it is. A few years ago, my mom and I decided to take a road trip. We were going to different camping and hiking spots along the California coast, and we were in the Big Sur area at the time of this particular incident. It was getting to be later in the day, so we had kind of been scrambling to find a campsite to sleep at. I can't remember the exact details, but for some reason, we ended up going up this long, windy mountain road that seemed to go on forever. Eventually, at the top, we found a secluded site with camp spots and even a bathroom. We didn't see anybody around, but the sun was about to set, so we figured we could find the person in charge in the morning and pay them then. By now, it was dark, and we had been around the fire for a few hours. Our site was right at the edge of the trees. I heard some rustling coming from that direction and I looked up. Two people were walking, one in front of the other, dressed completely in white, in perfectly clean clothing. The person in front had their arm back to hold the other's hand, but they both looked straight ahead, never acknowledged my mom or I whatsoever, and then walked out of the woods, past us, and right back into the trees. What's weird is that neither of them had lights. They were barefoot. They had no belongings with them, and they weren't even dressed warmly. It was probably around 40 degrees, pitch dark and rough terrain. Not to mention the gut-wrenching, heart-dropping feeling I got when I saw them. I asked my mom if she saw that, and she said no, even though she was facing the same direction as I was. She could never see them. I was on edge the rest of the night, and I had a lot of trouble sleeping. In the morning, my mom found the camp owner, paid him, and told him what I had seen. He replied nonchalantly, Oh yeah, those are the night walkers. People see them around here sometimes. When she asked him if he thought this was paranormal, he just looked at her and said, Pretty damn sure. We got the hell out of there as soon as we could. Last summer, my family of four and I were backpacking and camping near a river. It was a remote canyon in a very wild area and it was quite blissful, until we woke up around two o'clock in the morning to a very distressing sound. We were sleeping in our hammocks very close to the river, and about 40 feet behind us was a tall canyon wall. The sound made me think of an injured animal that was very cat-like. It was coming from behind us toward the wall of the canyon. It was regular, it occurred like clockwork every 15 to 20 seconds. We thought this was unusual. We shined flashlights and spoke very loudly in hopes of frightening whatever it was away from us. There was no moon out, and we could see very little, but shining our flashlights around revealed nothing as well. Still, it sounded so very close. Our efforts did not work at all and it seemed relentless and completely unfazed by us in every way. I worried that it was rabid or hurt. At one point, I heard it near the river, on the other side of us, and I was incredibly confused as to how it was able to move around without us hearing it. I sat on the edge of my hammock until dawn, with my knife in my hand, waiting for a wild or sick animal to come out of the bushes at any moment, and having to fight for our lives. Fortunately, that didn't happen. Finally, around dawn, the sounds got less frequent, and eventually they stopped. 
After hiking out, we googled many different animal sounds. The closest we could find to what we had heard was a mountain lion mating call. There definitely were lions in that area, so I still believe that that's what we heard. I'm still really confused, though, as to why it stayed so very close to us, and why it wasn't scared away like most animals would be. I'm also confused as to how it got from one side to the other without us detecting it. We've seen black bear in this area many times, and they've always run in the other direction when seeing humans, and cats are even more elusive. So, regardless of what happened, it was very strange behavior. And it still gives me the creeps to this day. When I was about 10 years old, I went with my dad to his farm. I spent my vacations there as a child. I don't have a very good memory of my childhood. I hated school. Everything was so bad that I think I erased almost everything from my mind. But that day is like a video of 24 hours that I have never been able to erase. I got there at night, and as soon as we got there, my mom called. I knew it was because I got some bad grades and almost failed at school. My dad was talking to her, and then he told me to go close the main door. As soon as I got there, I saw a humanoid figure, totally translucent. Only its borders were visible. And behind it, six floating light balls, alternating between blue and red. It was very tall but its proportions were not distorted. It was exactly humanoid, but I could see everything straight through it. The dogs at the farm were surrounding it and barking at it, making angry noises. I was a very scared child, but that thing didn't scare me right away. I got curious instead, so I asked, who are you? And it took a step forward. I immediately started crying and ran back inside, calling my dad, saying there was someone in there. He turned off the phone and without hesitation, went to a wardrobe and took a shotgun hidden between some clothes. When we got outside, it had vanished, but the dogs were still barking and surrounding a certain place in the front of the house, farther away this time, but there was nothing there. It's a plain space with our house in the middle of it. There's nothing surrounding us. After 30 seconds or so, the dog stopped and came back inside like nothing had happened. My dad said that I had just seen an optical illusion of the lights from the bus that brought students that arrived around that time. I don't think so. I still have no clue what that was, and I've never had anything similar happen after that. But I remember that day perfectly and it's going to be about 10 years from the day now, next month. So, I live in a small town in the southwest of Scotland. One of those towns where if you don't know someone, you will definitely know one of their friends. In 2015, I moved into a flat or apartment with my two children and my partner. The flat seemed nice and it was in a quiet part of town. Needless to say, we were all really happy with the move. At the time, my eldest son Bobby was four and my youngest Derek was three. Soon after moving in, I started noticing strange things happening. For example, the washing machine turned itself on and off at the wall doors opened on their own. But the strangest incidents were yet to come. One night, when the kids were in bed, about six months after moving in, Bobby came running to the living room and said, Daddy, please could you come and tell the hand in my room to stop trying to play with my teddy bears? So naturally, I went into his room and told this what I thought was imaginary hand off. About two weeks later, my son Bobby came to me again, 
With the complete matter-of-fact innocence of a child, he goes, Daddy, did you know there's a ghost in your attic? I didn't think much of it. Kids will be kids. The next day, I was at work, talking to a colleague about where we'd moved to. Out of nowhere, he goes, Hey, did you know that back in April of 2014, some young guy hung himself in your flat? Suddenly, Bobby talking about a ghost in the attic started to feel a lot more concerning. What blows my mind is that Bobby had never talked about ghosts before moving here. At the time, he didn't even know what an attic or a loft was. I did some digging and even spoke to a friend who's a local police officer. I asked him about the whole incident with the young guy, and he goes, Oh yeah, that's true. He hung himself in the attic up there. We still live in that house, and to this day, strange things happen from time to time. Most recently, the TV turned itself on and turned the volume up to full blast, all on its own. I was the only one home at the time. What's really strange is that my youngest son Derek has never mentioned anything ghostly. It's all very strange, but very real. The last two days have gotten crazy. For the past two years, there's been a tapping sound coming from my bedroom window. It started one Halloween night. I know, it sounds like a bad movie, but bear with me. And it's happened about a few times a month since, sometimes more often. Something taps at the window. There is nothing around to hit the window, and it sounds exactly like a finger tapping on the glass. My siblings and I are just used to it by now. A few days ago, my brother started complaining that something was communicating to him from outside the den window. Keep in mind, we live in an apartment complex, so we always have the blinds closed. He says that whatever it was just kept saying, hello, to him in a robotic, high-pitched voice. The rest of our family just shrugged it off. The day after, we go outside and there are small tracks leading up to all of our windows. I don't know what animal could have made those tracks because it's bipedal. Later that day, I was in my bedroom, laying in the bed that's next to the window, blinds closed, and I about jump out of my skin because someone is loudly banging against the glass. I ignored it. I just assumed it was one of my siblings sneaking up on me. I then found out that they were both together at that moment in the house while it happened and they hadn't been out for hours. The next night, my brother complained about the voice outside his window again, and we told him to ignore it. If it's something supernatural, we don't want to mess with it. Yesterday, while we were all preparing for dinner, my entire family and I heard the creature screaming outside. I was too shocked to move to grab my phone and record it. It kept yelling, Hello, come out! Hello, come out! Exactly how my brother had described. It was so loud we could hear it clearly from the kitchen and the dining room and really the whole house. We didn't want to look outside. This morning, more snow had fallen, but fresh prints were there. I don't know what to make of any of this, but it's impossible for this to be a prank because of the lack of human prints in the snow. I live in Northeast Ohio. If anyone has any information on what this is or has a similar experience, please let me know. Growing up in Jacksonville as a kid, I was living about a mile from a preserve and national park. Being that the area was known as a historic monument with Spanish forts and old naval bases, there were battles fought there, in which tons of Native Americans and Spanish died essentially in my backyard. Around the time of being six to eight years old, I had night terrors met with sleep paralysis events in which I would see a human-like shadow in my room. The latter only happened twice. During those two occasions, 
I remember seeing it emerge from the corner of my room. And during the first event, it just stayed in place. It had no remarkable features, with only the outlining of its body being a darker barrier that defined a human outline. Head, torso, legs, arms, and maybe hands. However, the second time this happened, I immediately had an elevated heart rate, and I started panicking out of fear. Most likely, I had woken from a nightmare. I was positioned on my left side, with the shadowy guy facing my peripheral on the right, and this time it started walking toward me, getting in my bed, and holding me with its hand on my chest. From that, I was in a total panic attack, to the point that I could hear my blood pumping in my ears. After a while, I guess I just fell asleep. Maybe I passed out, I honestly don't remember. Even with all of that, I don't think I told my mom at the time, though now I tell her about both of these experiences all the time. She kind of just says, well, maybe that did happen, or maybe it was just a vivid nightmare. Nowadays, I look back on that with a sort of mystified perspective. Growing up, our household was really stressful for a child. There was a lot of parental fighting on a daily basis, especially with my dad being an alcoholic. He didn't abuse me, not physically, but all of that torment did lead to a divorce when I was about 13. I've never spoken with a therapist about this or anything, but I do feel like those events were likely a product of the stress. As a bonus, whenever I would talk to my dad about it later, he confirmed to me that he saw a squatting human figure up in the rafters while we lived there, well before he went through DTs. Rest in peace to the man. One night, an uncle of mine was walking home. The sun was just starting to set, and in Lagos at the time, there weren't many street lights. So when it got dark out, it got dark out. My uncle had been told by my abu, my dad's mom, many times not to stay out too late and to always be home before the sun goes down. My uncle was a very stubborn person when he was younger, according to my dad, and always blew off everything that my abu would say. On this night, he definitely should have listened to her, and if I'm not mistaken, he did after these events happened. As he was out walking, he saw a man standing on a street corner. The man looked at my uncle and said, You should get home, kid. It's getting late. My uncle, being the jackass he was, said, Screw you, old man. Don't tell me what to do, and went about his leisurely walk home. After a couple of blocks, my uncle saw the same man standing on a different street corner. The man said the same thing as he did before. My uncle didn't think much of it and told him to go F himself and continued walking. After a few blocks, my uncle saw the same man yet again, but this time he had a big snarling dog with him. The old man said the same thing, this time with the dog growling and baring its teeth. My uncle was a little more bothered this time, understandably so, but still told the old man to shove it and kept walking. He was nearly home at this point, the sun was gone, the moon bright in the sky. And then he sees him again, and this time he's just laughing, maniacally. Not only is he laughing, but he has two dogs now. According to my dad, my uncle said that the dog's and man's eyes were red, and as soon as my uncle walked past them, he heard the man let the dogs go. He took off running as fast as he possibly could, the dogs barking, snarling, and giving chase. As soon as my uncle reached my abu's house, he started pounding on the door furiously, begging her to open up. Once the door was opened, he flew inside and told her to shut it fast. My abu was trying to figure out what was happening, and my uncle told her about the man and the dogs. My abu said that he was being ridiculous and that there was nothing out there. She opened the door and saw nothing. But my uncle swore that he could see the dogs pacing outside back and forth, teeth sharp, eyes red, fur black. 
and waiting for him. My boys and I were dry camping on a plateau above one of the many canyons in the Snake River wilderness in late summer. The first night at about 1 a.m., we saw several lights rise into the sky what seemed to be about 10 miles away. We immediately thought it was just drones and thought nothing of it. Then we started seeing flashing amber lights reflecting off of the canyon walls. So naturally, my curiosity compelled me to see what was going on. We got in the truck and started driving down the only road in the area, hoping that we could get close enough to see. After about 30 minutes, everything went dark, and we never saw any more lights. We never did find out what it was. On the second night, we had just gotten to sleep when I was woken up by wolves howling. At that point, I wasn't scared at all. I was just kind of fascinated by the sounds. They seemed pretty far off, and it was cool to listen to. I had drifted back to sleep, and then some time later was woken up by the sounds of running animals. I bolted upright just in time to see several animals that looked to be wolves, hard to tell by moonlight through a tent screen though, running right past our truck. They never stopped, just a dead run past us. It's the only time I have ever seen wolves in the wild, and it was intimidating to see just how big they really are. But even with all of that excitement, that wasn't the scariest part of the night. About two hours after the wolf event, I had to get up to pee. I didn't even want to get out of the tent, but my bladder kind of forced the issue. I worked up the courage to get up, slung my gun around my shoulder, and stepped outside. I was about midstream when a thud and the sound of footfalls came from the area just to my right. I spun and drew my other gun in a full panic only to realize that it was a cow rubbing against a small pine tree about 40 yards away. When I tell you I have never been so relieved to see a cow in my life. Other than the lights, the other things were explainable if not still exciting, but I don't think I'm going to forget that trip anytime soon. While on vacation in Japan last year, I stayed at an Airbnb near the Daigo Shrine in Kyoto. On my last night in town, I came back to my Airbnb at about 11.40 p.m. on a Monday night. Mind you, I had no alcohol or drugs in my system when this happened, and I was wide awake. There's a shrine that you have to walk past on a walkway that goes to and from the Airbnb to other areas of town. It was three city blocks long by two blocks going both sides. As the layout goes, there were ditches at the foot of the walls, followed by a row of plants alternating all the way down, and then there was a walkway in the middle, with a museum on the right, a whole shrine and palace at the fork. I walk into the walkway of the shrine and I ask myself this question, why are there two kids hopping a wall? As I see these two little figures hop the wall to my right, I pause and watch what's happening. As they both get down, they run across the path and run all the way to the end of the path by the fork and wait there. I was walking single file. They stand there for a few minutes. I walk a little closer because that was the way to the Airbnb, and I make eye contact with these things. They were about three to four feet tall, very slim but proportionate, with a bigger head and pointed ears as white as snow. Their eyes were as big as our eye sockets, but black. Normally you can tell if someone is wearing clothes at a small distance. I was maybe 15 to 20 yards from them, but they had no sign of clothing. After making eye contact, both of them go running around the corner that I had to turn. You could also see their shadows on the walls behind them. But I slowed down to give these things space. I was freaking out a little bit at this point. As I turned the corner, they were gone. 
I'm walking back to my Airbnb and I sense that I was being followed, but I couldn't hear or see anything. I have no idea what I saw. Aliens? Something else? I don't know. So first, a little context. My house was built in 1599 for a wealthy farming family. The house has had extensions from the Victorian era and most recently the 70s, but much of the original home remains. It was a couple of days ago, but I was in my living room, half watching the news and half on my phone. My dog, who is a very old and chilled back greyhound, suddenly jerks up from the sofa and looks directly to our window doors looking down at the garden. At the time, the curtains were closed, so I thought he maybe heard a fox or had been disturbed by a pesky fly or something. And because I know that dogs can sometimes sense ghosts, I joked, asking if Grandad had popped in to say hello. He was still staring, and then suddenly something tapped the back door quite loudly. Thinking it could be a fox after the chickens, I stood up and opened the curtains and looked out. Dark, but no fox. Then, I heard it. It was almost like breathing. At first I thought it was the dog, but as I looked at him, he was facing the other way now. Yet still, I heard breathing, quiet, but inside the room. I thought I had overreacted and it was my own breath, so I sat down. Yet, it persisted and got slightly louder, and then I felt dizzy. It was like it was getting more intense, but not louder. And it felt like that dizziness you get if you stand up too fast after sitting for a while. But that made no sense, as I had been on my feet and fine just moments ago. I don't know how to describe it, but it got worse, and I could feel myself panicking despite my best efforts to stay calm which, surprisingly to me, did not work. And soon it was too much. I went out of the room and upstairs into my own room, and I stayed there for the rest of the night. What made it even worse, though, was that while I sat there, trying to comprehend what had just happened, I heard footsteps right below me. I still can't explain it. An Aswang is a monster in Filipino mythology that preys on pregnant women. Unlike the grisly attacks usually shown in horror movies, however, these monsters apparently just prey on the life essence of the unborn baby until it dies and the mother miscarries. The scary part is that these monsters are also part human, meaning that during the day, they could literally be anyone. This happened in Metro Manila in around 2011. My cousin told me, the old man with the new neighbors asked me if he were pregnant. I was shocked. I never even told my family yet. I was 21 and worked nights in a call center. I never go outside when I'm home and I was only a few weeks along, so I know I wasn't showing yet. How did this nosy old man know? She said the neighbors were new in town, coming from one of the more popular provinces in the Philippines, where witchcraft and aswangs are still the norm. They were friendly enough though, so no one really had anything bad to say about them other than the nasty rumors that they knew about Aswan. When I was about eight months along, I was watching late night TV with my brother at around 2 a.m. Something big landed on our tin roof, strong enough to rattle the windows. My brother and I looked at each other with wide eyes as we listened to the footsteps. Yes, footsteps. Stop right above me. I was never a prayerful person, but at that moment I called on gods and saints and angels and anything to protect my baby. Then I remembered my grandmother's story about how she escaped an Aswang attack by placing a pillow between her legs to mask the baby's scent. So I did just that. We had no idea how long we waited. Seconds? Minutes? 
But then we heard another jump and silence. Until this very day, I'm glad that my brother was with me to vouch for me. I still couldn't believe that it happened and that it happened to me. Then I remembered the nosy old man. Could it have been him? Was he really an Aswang? Something weird and mysterious and unfinished, I suppose. But all's well that ends well, right? Last Thursday, in the early morning, my dog passed away. It was really hard on the family, and it was especially hard on me. I remember after the at-home euthanasia company picked her up, I sat down where she had last laid, and I just cried my eyes out. I remember wishing out loud that I could hold her one more time, to play with her, to pet her, to run around and just enjoy her company. After I felt better composed, I got up and spent the remainder of my afternoon looking at pictures of her with my girlfriend. Later that night, my mom came home and mentioned that there was a stray in the front yard. Although I was still grieving, I wanted to make sure that the dog outside got the right owner. Thankfully, it didn't take much to help out. She was timid, but a few treats sealed the deal. She came into my backyard willingly, and I started posting around to find the owner. She enjoyed my company from the get-go. She encouraged us to pet her and hug her. She latched onto me like a newborn puppy and followed me throughout the backyard. We weren't confident enough to let her in the house, so she slept outside. She slept, by choice, in the same spot that my dog would sleep. Apparently, the dog had been spotted at our neighborhood park and a family had been trying to get her for the past few days. They tried everything food, treats, snacks, but she wouldn't budge. The family asked how I managed to get her to come to me, and I just said that it didn't take much. They took her off my hands and checked her into the nearest vet. She left willingly and didn't look back. She was wagging her tail until she passed my block. I can't take her in because honestly, I'm not ready for a dog yet. However, it's crazy how a brief moment with this dog eased me in so many ways. Everyone I tell mentions that my dog probably sent over a guardian dog to ease me. That stray came to me readily and let me pet her, hold her, play with her, things no one else could get her to do. It's the last few things that I wish to do with Bay before she passed on, and I don't think that that's a coincidence. I have a weird story to tell you, but I promise that it's true. This happened about 10 years ago. It was at night. My older sister and I were on the second floor, spending the evening with our oldest brother and his wife. I can't recall what we were chatting with them about, but after a while, about 10 o'clock, my sister and I decided that it was time to go to sleep. We're heading downstairs. My brother has a switch right next to his main front door, into the stairs, that controls the light of the attic, where the stairs come to an end. We usually just put useless stuff there. It's a very small room. The rest of it is just flat, empty roof. So as we're heading down, we notice that this light was on in the attic, so I switched it off. Then, both my sister and I heard the exact voice of my mom saying, Turn on that light, I'm up here. Now, we were both certain that it was my mom and that it was coming from upstairs, so we didn't say anything and I turned it back on. We headed downstairs and that's when we both were totally shocked. As we opened the door to find my mom drinking tea with my other brother and the TV on, we froze, unable to move or speak. My mom noticed that something strange was going on, so she asked us what was wrong. After a moment of silence, we explained what happened. She didn't say anything, but told us to go to sleep. Of course, I couldn't. I kept thinking about what had happened the entire night. 
Who or what made that sound? And how did it do it? I mean, among all voices, the one of my mom is the one that I know the best, the one I grew up with, so how could it mimic it well enough to fool both my sister and I? To this day, whenever I ask my sister if she remembers what happened, she says, yes, and then immediately changes the subject. Almost every single night, I walk up to the attic to chill in there or whatever, and I've never stumbled into anything weird. Just that one instance, but who knows? This happened maybe 20 years ago, when three friends and I went camping at Kentucky Lake. Well, technically it was Lake Barkley. So we had just settled on a campsite after hiking maybe an hour from where we had parked. It was on a small inlet, maybe 300 yards long and 150 yards to the opposite shore. We had it all to ourselves and we camped near the U bend of the inlet. So we had a limited view of the lake proper. We could see it to the left, but it was mostly blocked by trees on the opposite side of the little bay. It being relatively hot and humid, we were all standing in the water after having set up our tents and things like that. The sun had gone down maybe an hour earlier, so there was still a little bit of light left. I think it was early summer or late spring. So we're standing there shooting the breeze, you know, up to our shoulders in the water. It felt great. Suddenly above us, there was a meteor-like fireball that lasted maybe two seconds at most. It appeared to be very close, but there's no way to be certain. We saw it fall behind the opposite spit of land and presumably land in the lake. Immediately afterwards, the entire lake lit up, seemingly from the bottom. Seriously, all the water visible from where we were standing, including our little inlet and the portion of the lake proper, lit up like the entire floor of the lake was made of spotlights. It flashed two or three times and went out. There was no accompanying sound whatsoever. A few seconds went by when one of the guys asks, okay, did anyone else see that? Which was followed by an evening of us all theorizing what it could have been because yes, we had all seen it. To this day, None of us have any idea what it was, but we all saw it. It may not be as weird or terrifying as some stories, but it's easily the strangest thing I've ever encountered. My friend and I worked construction, and one night we were enjoying a break, just hanging out together. We had another friend with us, we'll call her Jen. My other construction friend we'll call Maggie. So Maggie and I were talking about some of the strange things that we've seen in houses. And Jen goes, hang on, my mom has the craziest story, let me call her. So Jen calls her mom, and her mom begins to tell us this story of what keeps happening in her attic. Her mom goes, it's the darndest thing, but you know the light cord, the thing you pull to turn it on and off? It keeps tying itself into a knot with a circle hanging down from it. Never have been able to figure that out. As we're listening to the story, Maggie and I look at each other and our eyes say everything. We're both thinking about the same project that we worked on not that long ago, maybe a couple years. Hey, whereabouts is your house? Maggie asks. Jen's mom tells us, and we about freaked out. After Jen hung up the phone, she asks us what we're freaking out about. I finally got the words together to say, your mom's house was a construction site we worked on not long before you guys moved in. It needed some work after the previous owner left, I suppose. 
The thing is, she unalived herself in the attic by hanging herself from the light cord, using it as a noose. That was one of the strangest things we'd ever encountered. However, I was working on a site one time that was a full-on demo. It was this old, decrepit mansion in Maine. Well, as we're working, we found this old, dusty VHS tape in the wall. Obviously, we were curious, so we put it into a barely functioning VHS player to see what was on it. All it contained was several minutes of an old woman sitting in a chair in the middle of the basement, staring directly into the camera and breathing heavily. And then it cut off. 